much for coming back for our second day of AGI 22, our biggest, brightest and best conference ever. We've got kicking off today's talks, we've got our own Dr. Ben Gertzel, CEO of SingularityNet and uh, great leader in AGI. I'll tell you a bit more about him tomorrow when the public are here. And then we're going to be hosting some lightning talks virtually online and in the room. So we've got an action packed day, but I've seen the slides. It's going to be an amazing talk. Over to you, Ben. Thanks, and do we, do we have a clicker to the side? We do not. I'm your clicker. <laughs> I'm your clicker. There's a, there's a, that's a song title for you. <laughs> yeah. 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 All right. Well, welcome, uh, welcome everyone to uh, AGI 2020, I think uh, for those who were here, Yesterday, we've, we've already had a lot of a lot of interest, interesting stuff. I, I would and uh, all the workshops were uh, streamed online, and you can check out the the videos of the workshops yesterday. I mean, I, I was in the the w workshop on scaling up neurosymbolic AI with the uh, OpenCog Hyperon, and that that was that, that 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 was a lot of fun. And I think we have a similar vibe there. To what I've heard from the other workshops, which I'll, I'll catch, catch up on, on on video afterwards. I mean, in the in the Open Cog workshop last year, last year's AGI conference, we presented a bunch of plans and ideas and theory. And you know, this year, even though I've been kind of involved involved in that work, it still struck me how like. Each of the things we talked about theoretically last year, we have like working, work, working code for now and actual actual systems to, to, to talk about. And so we, we've been talking about a new meta language for open cog hyperon, distrib new distributed knowledge graph database, and how to do reasoning in, in this new AGI language. So we we've seen this year, you know working examples at the prototype and, and alpha stage of these things. And I think what what we saw there in the OpenCog workshop, we're seeing across a bunch of different projects and initiatives in, in, the, in the AGI field. You could look at NARS and you could say the same thing. A lot of, a lot of stuff that Pei Wang and his colleagues have been talking about for a really long time. I mean, last year when, when I first met Pei in, in the late 90s, you see more and more stuff that's actually working and and functioning and, and can be sh shown off and, and and explored. I mean, in in the more practical oriented workshops on lang language learning and uh, fi finance and, and 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 such, we're looking there at things that are sort of at the border between narrow AI and AGI. But again, you see you see stuff that's actually working that has sort of intimations of generality in, in the intelligence rather than being pure, pure, narrow, narrow machine learning. And that's a significant difference. I mean, I think year on year as the AGI conferences progress, we don't have any fewer interesting ideas, but we have a greater percent of interesting ideas that are, are, are coupled with some things that actually function to some level and could be shown off and uh, ex explored, explored in, in, in practice. And I, I think uh, I get a definite feeling personally and bearing in mind that I'm a very optimistic human being, but I, I, I get a definite feeling personally that we're, we're within a few years, let's say, of a phase transition in AG, AGI progress, which is a very exciting time to be in the field. And if we look at just the recent history of, of, the, of the AI field, we could see from 2014, when you had AlexNet through 2017 or so, computer vision went through a phase transition. Like it, it went from being a research topic to suddenly being something with universally recognized success and commercially deployed all, all over the place, right? And natural language processing from 2017, 18, you had BERT model come out from then until 2021 or so. I mean, you had similar 
phase transition in NLP, where it went from being a research topic with a handful of applications to being something that every company and government is, is paying attention to. That's, you know, certainly that's not human level AI in either of those cases, computer vision or NLP, but you had a case where there's a few years of research and development that brought something from being a little research corner to being massively successful industry deployed all over the place. And I thought about why did it take a few years for each of these transitions? That's really about the speed that it takes people to like write a paper or read, a, read each other's code or like uh, stop doing one thing, get a new job doing something else. It's really about the speed that it takes human beings to, to adapt to new ideas and transmit, transmit new, new information. Otherwise, otherwise it could have been a few months from, from BERT to GPT-3 and, and a few months from, from AlexNet to you know, face recognition being deployed everywhere. So I think we're likely to see a similar, say two to four years of phase transitional super rapid progress in the in the in the AGI field where AGI doesn't necessarily get fully solved in those three years but it goes from being a little corner of the research world to being something with widely demonstrated recognized obvious success which has tremendous practical deployment and then starts eating up a substantial portion of the world economy and, and driving a substantial portion of the world economy right so when those few years begin, obviously that, that's the literally quadrillion dollar question. And we, we, don't, we don't have a rigorous answer to that. I feel that the transition we're seeing in AGI research from predominance of theory ungrounded in practice to a predominance of theory that's at least accompanied with research level practical practical demonstrations that you can play with and explore. I think this signifies that we're getting pretty pretty close to the to the beginning of this few years of, of sort of meteoric progress. So I'm I'm guessing personally that sometime within let's say the next five years we're gonna see, we're gonna see the beginning of this phase of incredibly ra rapid growth in, in AGI. I mean it could be next year it could, could be a few years after that i don't i don't i don't think it's 10 years off from the the inception of this phase transition and this this you know perhaps not coincidentally matches all right with uh ray kurzweil's curve plotting which puts the advent of human level agi in in, in 2029 right so it's i mean i i i continue to be hopeful we can beat ray's projection by by, by a couple years but still being correct with a few years plus or minus would be a fairly interesting degree of accuracy to get at by high level economic, global economy level cur curve plotting right now. I mean, Ray also guesstimated that we get human level AGI in 2029 and then get a singularity in 2045. Now I'm, I've always been perplexed by that as I debated with him a few times because seemed to me that once you get to human level AGI, unless you or the AGI intentionally throttles its development, I don't see why it would take 16 years to get to a superhuman level AGI because you get the human level AGI, if it's human level as smart as the people in this room, you teach it computer science, engineering and math, it's gonna be able to replicate itself multiple times over. It's gonna be able to advance the AGI field and the hardware field more rapidly than, than, than people could because of having multiple copies of itself and having like neural level access to Mathematica and every computer database and a, and a calculator, right? And it, it's, it's gonna be designing new hardware and software for itself. So my, I, my feeling is the phase transitions in computer vision and natural language, they were great, but they're not, self-accelerating in the way that AGI can be. So once we have that few years of phase transitional accelerated progress in the AGI field, what you get is not just valuable commercial systems and, and a research field that's entered the phase of maturity rather than, than a, a early phase. What you get 
is an early stage AGI system that joins the AGI research field itself, but can then progress fast, faster than people because of the intrinsic advantages that, that it has as, as a software system. So my, my feeling is after that few years of rapid progress, you know, it, it's, a few, it's a few years to getting from human level to superhuman rather than the 16 years that, 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 that Ray thinks. Now, it may be the AGI itself decides to throttle its own progress because it wants to understand what the hell is going on with its own evolution, which, which would be interesting. I mean, if, if I had the ability to upgrade my brain at will, I wouldn't necessarily do so as quickly as possible, right? I mean, I'd probably be, I'd probably be faster than the average person at experimenting with my own brain, but, but still, and of course, if I can make clones of myself, I might be even more reckless experimenting with my clones, but that's still, I mean, you don't know what berserk things those clones are gonna do. You wanna be a little bit careful, right? So there, there's a lot of interesting things coming in the future, which obviously I've got my own speculations. Everyone will have their own and I'm scientist enough to realize the error bars are extremely wide. And in the end, we're entering a domain that we've never been in before. And none of us knows, none of us fundamentally knows what's gonna happen on a number of different levels, you know, technological and societal experiential and so forth but i think it's pretty clear you know there's a high probability by now we're in a field that's on the verge of a massive massive breakthrough let's, let's say years away rather than decades away and almost certainly not not centuries away and that, that's a fascinating time and and and, and place to to be and it it is, it's gonna look weird in hindsight that in 2022, such a small percent of the world's resources were focused on making AGI and on figuring out how the hell to deal with AGI, AGI once it's there. I mean, both of these things are still often a little corner of, of the global economy. And I'm thinking that in, in, in a few years, there will, they probably will not be. And all of us here, will be in a very strange and, and, and different position because we will be among the few people in the world who've spent a long time sort of deeply thinking about this new technology, which suddenly has come to be like the, the dominant, fe dominant feature on, on, on the planet, right? So anyway, that's how I see the context of what we're doing here very broadly. I wanna say a few things about the technical threads of development in, in the AGI field. And, and th then I will, uh, I will dig, dig a bit into a specific topic of uh, open-ended open mo mo motivation. So regarding the technical and scientific developments that are driving the, the AGI field forward, I mean, I think they're, they're in a way wonderfully diverse and I think much more diverse than the general public un un understands. So I think if you, if, you, if you look at general media verbiage about AGI, it's mostly deep neural nets. And deep neural nets have obviously achieved a lot of very interesting and, and, and very cool things. And in my own applied commercial AI work, we're heavily using transformal neural nets and CNNs and a whole, whole bunch of other fascinating neural net models to, to, do, to do cool things. I mean, I also did enough computational neuroscience and cognitive science and brain simulation to realize how minimally neural these, these deep neural, neural nets are. I mean, they're really sort of very loosely inspired by biological systems, but that's where some aspects of the architecture got their seed from. And they've grown into some very interesting mathematical and, and computational systems. I think the percent of the AI world that is actually involved with these deep neural nets is relatively small, which most of the people in this room realize, although the general public doesn't. I mean, if you're, if you're doing applied machine learning, I mean, for most tasks, it's either ML, it's shallow neural nets, or, or it's uh, 
deci decision forests or statistical learning systems or something are, are often the best tool for some problem. It's only a really limited class of problems that a deep neural net per se is, is, is the most use, useful thing for, although there, these are some high, high, high value application areas, certainly. I mean, as, as one example, with my colleagues in Singular, you know, I'm doing a doing bunch of work in computational finance, financial prediction, doing a bunch of work in genome, genomics, analyzing DNA and RNA data, understand causes of disease, different threads of research that my AGI researched. At the moment, deep neural networks are not the most useful tools in, in, in either of those areas. They, there's not enough data in the right census. So they, would just, they would just over overfit to the data and you, you, wind up, you wind up using other methods. So from a just pure AI standpoint, deep neural nets are not as dominant as many people would think. Um, from an AGI R&D standpoint, it's, all, it's also not as, as dominant and there's, there's a lot of different threads of research going on in, in, in the world in, in terms of people looking into how to, how to create general intelligence. And even within systems that are thought of as being triumphs of deep neural networks, they're, they're often hybrid systems. And I mean, AlphaGo, AlphaZero was an interesting example. I mean, that's a game tree, right? I mean, this, this is a, it's a rule-based system which comes, comes out of a lot of work in, in game AI and, and going through decision trees for game AI, which is combined with a simulation engine for doing rapid fire simulations of gameplay with coming out of a whole bunch of research in multi-agent systems, which is combined, combined with a deep neural net for recognizing patterns and what's happened during this gameplay. So there's a neural net in there, but no one outside the field really looks at it and says, well, actually this is a, this is a hy hybrid system, which has a carefully constructed simulation engine and a rule-based decision tree architecture combined with the deep neural network. And that's, uh, the deep neural net part is interesting. The way the hybrid system is, is constructed is, is, is also interesting. And if you look at DeepMind's system that defeats StarCraft is also like that. That's in a way a horrible hack job, but it's also, it's an integrated system with a variety of different rule-based systems and rule learning systems combi combined with deep neural systems for, for perception. So there's, there's a lot of stories you could tell about what's being successful in narrow AI and in, in the AGI field. One of the stories is that deep neural nets trained on huge amounts of data are being successful. Another story you could tell is that hybrid systems gotten by integrating together different components coming out of different AI paradigms are being successful at doing practical things. And people are being increasingly clever at constructing these hybrid systems to, ca to carry, out, carry out particular functions. And I think there's increasing recognition even among the deep neural net orthodoxy that just proceeding straight ahead with like using backprop to train mostly feed forward neural nets is not going to get you to AGI and will fall apart even for many narrow practical tasks. So you see more and more people exploring, say, hybridizing a knowledge graph with a, with a deep neural net in some way, which then leads you down a whole, a whole different direction because how do you update that knowledge graph? That leads you in the direction of different sorts of inference than, than the sorts that are typically done with, with backpropagation. You also see increasing frustration with backpropagation as, as a learning algorithm. I mean, there's, there's been a lot of promising things in the neural net area, like say in, in Infogan and related things that were kind of abandoned because backprop wouldn't converge. And people are exploring, well, should we use CMAES? Should we use different forms of floating point GA? Should we invent some new sort of stochastic local search? Like how, how do we, get beyond the fact that backprop doesn't converge. Maybe some of these architectures are good and the fact that they haven't worked is just because the, the learning algorithm used for erupting the weight, weights is bad rather than the architectures being bad. So I think there's increasing recognition in, 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 in the AI field and the AGI field now that we need new, new ideas. We don't need just to keep scaling up deep neural networks and adding more data. Some people think you just need that, but 
even even say the Jan Lacunes of the world are now increasingly recognizing that you need stuff stuff beyond just just more of the same. On, on, on the other hand, what you need beyond more of the same, you know, there's less consensus on that. But interestingly, I mean, if you look at Lacune's recent paper, he's sort of uh, saying you need, okay, self-supervised learning. Well, yeah, that's been talked about since before supervised learning, basically. You need some sort of attention to representation and symbolic understanding. Well, yeah, that's been been worked on since uh, you know M McCarthy and Minsky and so on in in, in, the, in the 50s and 60s. So what you can see is even people pretty far in the deep neural orthodoxy side are starting to realize that you know graphs, representations, symbols, in some form or another, have got to be worked into the picture to get beyond the domains where you have just massive amounts of repetitive training data and and into into domains where training is scant and you need more self-supervision and more, more create more creative leaps. So I, and I think this really gives an opportunity for the community that's accumulated around the AGI conference series to to shine in, in a remarkable way because what's been happening in the AGI conference series and the associated communities since the first AGI workshop in 2006 is we've had a community of people pursuing all manner of different approaches to, to AGI. I mean, I mean, you've had NARS and non-axiomatic reasoning, you've had Kristen Thorson and, and, and their group with these, you know, self-learning rule systems for learning rules that, that learn rules that, that, that learn rules. You've had Ar Ar Arthur Franz and his others with uh, Tom Everett, their attempt to scale down AXE and, and these infinite resources, Levin search-based AGI systems into, into something that could be be practical. I mean, you've had my own teams working open open cog and various things, and a lot longer list than than I, than I could could po possibly possibly give here. We 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 now have uh, future AI and the, and their gra graph based approach, which has been brewing brewing for a while, coming in not only to help sponsor this event, for which I'm very grateful, but contributing their unique in, 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 in intellectual approach. So we we've, we've got a great variety of different approaches to thinking about and building AGI systems. We got, we've got D D Doug Mileser, whose work I've been following for a long time with a unique approach to logic-based AI as applied to episodic memory and many other aspects of, of cognitive architecture. So just wonderful diversity of, of approaches. Joe Shabak is sitting here somewhere who's been bringing co cognitive science in a, in a deep way in, in, into AGI since long before it was fashionable, right? And uh, I, I'm I'm going to leave. I'm going to have to leave out some brilliant people, or I'll, I'll have no time. But I think we're at a phase now where it's increasingly recognized that what we need, what we need to get from where we are now to the point where this few years of phase transition in the project of AGI, what we need to do that is an infusion of some new ideas. And this doesn't have to mean ideas that are totally new to the AI field. It has to be ideas that haven't been deployed at scale within sort of the modern commercial large scale AI landscape yet, right? Because what we saw with deep neural nets was, I mean, I was teaching multi-layer perceptrons and recurrent backprop in the 90s, right? And I mean, it took hours for a network with a few dozen neurons to, to converge and the machines, the machines we had then. And of course, others were teaching this in like 1966 when, 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 I, when I was born, when, 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 when perceptrons were first invented right, right around then, right? So those ideas were around a while. They weren't deployed at scale in the right way until fairly recently. And there's, in my view, a whole bunch of other ideas that have been brewing around AI, cognitive science related fields for a long time. They're just waiting to be tweaked, tuned, deployed on the right hardware, applied to experience or data in the right way. And then you see what these ideas really can do and what the inventors of the ideas intuited they could do in, in, in the first place, but they just didn't have the, machines and, and the data and the experiential experiential context, right? So my, my own feeling is 
what we're going to see. I don't, I don't think we need a radical new algorithm that nobody's ever heard of. Although if one pops up, I'll, I'll be the first one to jump up and down in, in excitement. I mean, I think we're going to see evolutionary learning. I, th I think we're going to see cognitive architecture. I think we're going to see logical inference in various forms, probabilistic reasoning in, in various forms. I think we're going to see complex self-organizing systems of like rules and codelets rewriting each other and, and so forth into attractive states. I think we're going to see a bunch of these things that have been worked on for a long time come into their own by being deployed at scale for the, for the first time in context with large amounts of data and, and experience. And we're going to see these hybridized together into composite systems that are achieving greater and greater general intelligence fu functionalities. And I think this community can play a key role in that due to its unique breadth of insight into the different AGI algorithms that, that are, or proto AGI algorithms that are out there with, with potential of turning into, into AGI. And that's, uh, that's why I'm so excited to be here at AGI 22. I think at similar to last year, this is primarily a virtual online event. We have a lot more people on, on, online, hundreds of people signed up on, 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 online as opposed to dozens of people in, 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 the, in the room right now. And I, I think uh, we're still sort of in a barely post COVID economy, like significant parts of the world still have quarantine. You, 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 can't, you, can't get, you can't get in and out, right? So, but I think I'm psyched that AGI progress has continued very well even through the COVID periods. In some ways it even went faster because we were trapped in our house, typing at the computer instead of wasting time going around socializing and giving speeches and so forth. But, but I'm, I'm also very psyched to circulate more face-to-face -face and to meet meet face-to-face -face a bunch of uh, AGI researchers whose research I've, I've, I've heard about and, and thought about and never met the people before. So yeah, very psyched. Workshops yesterday were great. I think the next few days are going to be are going to be awesome. I mean, we have tomorrow. Tomorrow is a sort of general audience oriented day, focused on machine creativity. So we'll have a bunch of bunch of stuff at the borderline between narrow AI and AGI in terms of AI for generating creative natural language, creative new music, creative visual art, and a bunch of thinking about how do you take the next step for AI for creative arts in terms of verging from AI toward, toward AGI, which in a way to me is one of the best playgrounds for moving toward AGI because it's a domain where anything goes. I mean, I've been doing a bunch of work in medical robotics, but there in medicine or finance, or some of these applications, you got to be very, very careful not to screw anything up. But there's a reason why toddlers aren't put in charge of your, your pension fund or, or your uh, your doctor's scalpel, right? I mean, I mean you, 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 don't, you can't have a young mind that's just learning what's going on in, in the, these domains where you need a great amount of care and responsibility. Creative arts is a domain, not that there's no responsibility, but there's a process where you can throw out a bunch of wild stuff and then, then filter it afterwards. So I think it's a very interesting domain for experimentation with the, the sort of freewheeling creative learning that little kids have and that's part of what you need to get to AGI. So we'll, we'll dig into that a bit tomorrow, but we'll also have a whole bunch of fascinating contributed talks from a variety of people ar ar around the world, some face-to-face, -face, some, some online, and amazing assemblage of, uh, of keynotes. I mean, Dr. Simon from, from Future AI will we'll have uh, Joe Shabak explaining some of the relations between physics and AGI in terms of both trying to get at how the mind and the universe work at a very fundamental level. We'll have Rachel St. Clair talking about some novel approaches to AGI hardware that may do for AGI what GPUs have done for, for, for deep, neural, deep neural networks. We'll have a, a chat between Gary Marcus and, and, and myself on deep learning and how to get beyond deep learning toward, toward, toward AGI. So a whole lot of interest, interesting stuff all, all coming together. And uh, I now want to briefly walk through a particular topic that has been interesting in the last couple of years.
Ooh. Turned on. All right. Be beautiful. Beautiful. So I, I want to talk a few minutes about a topic which has some deeply technical aspects, which I've written about in some papers over the last couple of years. But I'm going to keep it at a very hand wavy level here because I just want to take up 10, 15 minutes or, or, or something to not run, run over time too much. What I want to talk about is aspects of motivation for, for AGI systems. And this is one of the things I learned from Josha Bach's work on his thesis and engaging with Josha over the years is just how important motivation is as an aspect for AGI. I mean, of course, it's 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 not the, it's certainly not the only thing. I mean, like my my dog may be motivated to you know get the food that's in the refrigerator. He just can't do it. He's 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 too stupid to figure out how to do it. There's a lock. He can't get the key and open the lock to get it right. So it's not everything, but it's in, in, inc incredible incredibly important. And as an educator, you can see that all the time. Like I would, within fairly wide range. I would bet on a less capable student who's highly motivated over a really smart student who, who, who doesn't give a crap. There, there's, there's limits, but the limits are broader than, than, than we often take, often take for granted, right? And so I'm in, I've mentioned how representation is very important and how people are increasingly seeing that we need to think somehow about getting to abstract symbolic representation and how having the right learning mechanism is, is important. And if you have something like backprop was the wrong learning mechanism. It doesn't matter if you have the right architecture. So those are important, but motivation is, is also extremely important. And I think you know, commercial machine learning systems have a very simplistic excuse for motivation, right? They don't really have it. The motivation they have is like, let's get, let's minimize error on, on some data set, which is too crude a motivation to lead to anything resembling a human-like general intelligence. But the type of motivation that's generally considered in the mainstream AI field now is basically drawn from the reinforcement learning field. It's like reward maximization, maximize expected reward over some time scale or some, some weighted average of time scales. And I think that's, that's also a very, very crude excuse for, for a model of motivation. And in the, in the AI ethics field, then, I mean, people have spent a lot of time and hand wringing about, well, if a system is just maximizing expected reward, well, won't it like wirehead its reward function and just like uh, just stimulate its, its reward center forever to maximize expected reward? And you can you can do a lot of somersaults over how how how, how do we avoid something like this from happening? Or say you tell something to make people happy, and you, you tell your AGI system it gets more reward if it's make people making people happy. But how does it know what happiness means? If it means people are smiling a lot, okay, well then it can just like surgically modify people to be smiling all the time, right? So any definition you give of happiness, a superhuman AGI could just hack away to maximize that, de that definition without doing what, what we meant by human happiness, right? So there's been a lot of agonizing about the ethics of systems that maximize expected reward and how do you define the right reward function. My own view has been that maximizing expected reward is just a really sort of dumbass way to think about the motivation for an AGI system in, in, in the first place. Not, not that it plays no role. I mean, yeah, there's dopamine systems in the brain that are, are, approximate temporal difference learning and they're trying to maximize expected reward. And there are times in each of our lives where we're trying to like make the most money we can or get the most girlfriends we can or get the biggest house or you, you try, you, we do try to maximize expected reward at some periods in our lives. But I mean, we adopt different rewards at different points in our lives for, for, for different reasons. And it's not really that simplistic. I mean, people are martyring themselves for causes that they, 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 they believe in, right? There, there's a great deal of complexity to the sense in which humans are maximizing expected reward to the extent that I'm not sure it's the right paradigm to be, to be starting with. I mean, one can just say, well, the hell with thinking about reward. The intelligent systems like humans or AGIs or complex self-organizing systems and goals and rewards are just among the things that pop 
out of the complex self self organization for for a while, then they go away and have other rewards and goals pop out of the complex self organization. And that that's a perfectly valid way to look at it, but I'm not sure it's the maximally in, in, informative way to look at it. I mean, I think the notion of a persistent set of motivations in the cognitive system, I think is interesting, although not complete. There is an amount of complex self-organization that's not really motivated. It's just happening like in a, in, in a chemical soup or something. But I think the best ways to think about motivation in AGI systems are a little subtler than expected rewards. So I wanna introduce some somewhat new ideas here drawn from the notion of open-ended intelligence and some ideas from paraconsistent logic as related to goals, motivations, and rewards. So click. <laughs> Let me start with a question that all of us in this room have probably thought about a lot. I'm not gonna go through in much detail, but what is intelligence in the first place? And intelligence is very badly defined. I mean, when when I was working in the late 90s and early aughts with uh, Shane Legg, who was in early, early 20s and later went on to co-found Google DeepMind, at that point in his life, Shane was convinced, like, if we could just rigorously define intelligence, then the path to AGI would be really easy. The whole problem is intelligence is badly defined. And he was trying to define what he called cybernance then to get rid of the messy word of intelligence. And I, I disagree with him fundamentally. I, I was like, well, you know, life isn't well-defined. You can still do synthetic biology. Beauty isn't well-defined. You can still make beautiful art. Like the fact that this is a fuzzy word just means it's a fuzzy word for describing what we're doing. We can still build, okay, just let's build a system that can graduate from MIT doing exactly what a human does. And don't call it an intelligence, call it a human emulator, right? Or let's, let's build a system that can solve as many computable problems as possible, call it a problem solver. Like, I don't, I don't care. I don't care about, about the word intelligence. It's just a messy natural, natural language term, right? But, and I think after writing a PhD thesis in which he came up with a rigorous mathematical definition of intelligence, which is not bad, but has some profound flaws to it, he seems to have changed his mind, put it aside and just gone on to try to build systems doing, doing cool stuff that are very loosely connected to his own definition of intelligence. So I, I think he sort of came around to my, my perspective on that. But e even though I don't think you really need to rigorously define intelligence to make progress in AGI, it's still an interesting intellectual exercise to sort of beef up your mind for, for making progress. And, so we can look at a few different ways to gauge intelligence. I mean, obviously in psychology, the G factor IQ was intended to measure general intelligence. It's sort of pretty much a weighted average of how well you do across intelligent tasks in a bunch of different areas. It's not a terrible measure. I mean, it's, it's not a great measure either. It's, it's very culturally biased. I mean, like it's the IQ tests we have now are very visual oriented. I often thought if you if you replaced all the vision problems in IQ tests with musical and rhythmic problems, suddenly Africans would come out having a much higher IQ than everyone else, just because culturally they're always doing they're always doing music and, 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 le and less visual stuff, right? So there, there are severe flaws. On the other hand, there's not much doubt. If I talk to a random person with IQ 160 or a random person with IQ 60, like um, the test results are going to accord with my intuitive understanding of how good they are at, at solving most sorts of problems. Like there, there's some meaning there. On the other hand, it's clearly highly overfit to human beings, right? Because you, there's clearly, you could make a narrow AI system do well in an IQ test, but that system has no general intelligence. It's just been trained on a shitload of IQ, IQ test answers, right? So it's definitely very overfit to people. You, you can't give an IQ test to a dolphin, right? Um, dolphins may be almost as intelligent as us, but I mean, you can't expect them to solve these exact puzzles. You have to give them a sonar problem instead of a vision problem for, for one thing. There's a theory of multiple intelligences. Very interesting. 
I mean, you could look at IQ as a sort of weight, weighted average over, over all these multiple intelligences of math, vision, language, space, time, and so forth. And more interesting, just for qualitatively evaluating your AGI system to see how it does across all these different dimensions of, of, of human-like intelligence. Still, I mean, pretty overfit, overfit to human beings and doesn't make your job easier engaging and comparing things because you're going to multi multiple dimensions. Now, what... What Shane Legg came up with, based largely on the prior work of uh, his PG supervisor, Mar Marcus Hooter, who's, by the way, the co-founder of the AGI conference series, although he's, he's not here this year. What he came up with is basically measuring general intelligence as a weighted average of the ability to achieve a computable reward function in a computable environment. When you weight the average by weighting simpler reward functions and environments more and then how do you measure simplicity well you, you assume some uh, simplicity of a reward function or environment could be for, for, for example the size of the smallest program for computing that reward function or environments you're going to come algorithm complexity algorithmic information theory and that's a reasonably interesting definition i mean one one issue with it is that human beings are incredibly retarded by this measure. Like we're very bad at achieving arbitrary reward functions in arbitrary environments, right? I'm, 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 I'm very bad at like playing 87 dimensional chess or something, right? So, I mean, how do you, how do you, how do you really define an arbitrary reward function? I mean, I'm even, I mean, I'm, I'm even bad at understanding, you know, what other people are thinking. And, and that's a problem I confront, I confront all, 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 all day, every day. So. I mean, to come up with a simplicity measure under which humans are good at achieving simple reward functions in simple environments, you really have to hack that simplicity measure just to weight exactly the only things that, 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 pe that people are good at, which then sort of, sort of defeats the purpose. Because then if you had a dolphin to make dolphins good at achieving arbitrary reward functions, and yet you'd have to hack the weighting function of rewards and environments for those things that, that, that dolphins are good at. I mean, there, there's, I mean, a lot of other weird issues there in terms of the, it depends on the simplicity measure. In theory, as rewards and environments get infinitely complex, it doesn't matter because of by simulation among different Turing machines. But our practical world is, 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 is not, not infinite, right? So it's, uh, it's not clear if in everyday senses, you really get that universality or it's highly dependent on, on, on how you're how you're weighting things there's also a philosophy problem here is that, in that we're still stuck in expected reward maximization and assuming that what ais are after is expected reward maximization which i think is a sort of like brutal degradation of what it means to be a, a vibrant li li living living system really so pei wang in a definition I eventually came to realize is profoundly Chinese in, in, in a way after living in, in China for 10 years. Pei Wang defines intelligence as the ability to adapt to unpredictable situations under limited resources. And I mean, that's, that's how the Chinese empire survived for 5,000 years, right? I mean, I mean it's a, this, a, there's, a, there's a lot of, a lot of wisdom baked in the design. I don't mean to minimize it by saying it has some cultural resonance, but I, I do think that the idea that life is about getting the most, more reward than all the competitors has some Americanness about it, about it somehow. Said, more, 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 I got more than everybody else faster, right? So there, there is some cultural resonance baked into these things, although of course there's also deep intellectual thinking go, going, going, going beyond all that, but then, the idea that you want to adapt to unpredictable situations under limited resources is quite, quite deep in a number of ways because if the situation is unpredictable, that means it's going beyond your history. So to adapt to it, you have to generalize, right? By definition, you're going to something you couldn't have predicted. So if you couldn't have predicted it, then you have, you have to generalize it to it somehow. And there's almost, a paradox baked in, baked in there when you think about it, because if it's really unpredictable to you, then how the hell can you generalize to it? Ge being able to generalize to it in a way 
is implicitly being being able being able to predict it. So there's almost a contradiction based in there, depending how you how you define the terms. And baking in under limited resources really constrains the sort of systems you could make. It, it means you can't have a giant lookup table, right? And which basically means you can have a deep neural network, which is sort of a big weighted hash table in, 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 in a way. It also means you can't have an AIXI or other Marcus Hooder type system that does a search through the space of all computer programs or something. It means limited resources sort of means you have to have something resembling a cognitive architecture because you, 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 ha you have to juggle with limitations of space, space time and, and energy. So, I mean, I think that's a, that's a very wise and interesting way to look at it and ties in well with the final definition, which is the one I'm gonna, gonna work with for the next few minutes, which comes from Weaver, AKA David Weinbaum's species thesis on open-ended intelligence from the Free University of Brussels from a few years ago. So Weaver, in his thesis is trying to synthesize the theory of complex self-organizing systems with ideas from continental philosophy and the D D Deleuze and all that. And he's, he's looking at an intelligent system as a complex self-organizing system, which has two primary sort of drives or, or directionalities guiding its movement. One is individuation, the other is self-transcendence. And these are both sort of things drawn from continental philosophy, but they also can be clearly grounded in evolutionary biology and so on. I mean, individuation is maintaining the boundaries around the system as a distinct, distinct system, right? It's really just a fancy way of saying like survive as a system with the con con continuous thread of being over time. Self-transcendence is the drive to become something fundamentally different than what you are and going going beyond going beyond what you were before and so these two things together again you have a sort of paradox ba paradox ba baked in here just as there's a paradox baked into being able to adapt to what you what you what you can't predict right and the the view of a intelligence as an open-ended system that needs to maintain its boundaries over time while transcending everything it was and becoming some, something new. I mean, this is, what, this is what evolution has done, right? And this is, this, this, this is what a human child does as, as they grow, grow and develop from, from inf infancy into, into adulthood. And you could try to boil that down to a reward function, but in the end, one of the points Weaver makes is you, you really don't succeed. Like the, the reward function, your maximum, in one stage of your development is not the one you're maximizing in the other stage of your development. And we, we see this in the human life cycle, like the reward functions my four-year-old son is working toward. They're not the same as his one-year-old sister. They're not the same as I've been working toward as a teenager. They're not the same as what I'm working toward now, right? I mean, you, as a human develops, development being different than learning in, in psychological lingo, right? as a human develops, the reward functions, they're seeking on a temporary basis really really do change right and and that that's uh, that's important to our general intelligence over our lifetime let's click click no you're a bad clicker Henry. come on click. <laughs> so i want to just talk for a few minutes about how I've been thinking about open-ended intelligence in terms of practical goal systems for the open, open cog system. And the full mathematical story here is more than I have, I have time to go through. So I'm just gonna wave my hands around, but you can, I had a paper on, called Paraconsistent Foundations from early 2021, which reviewed constructible duality logic and how you, intersect paraconsistent logic with un uncertain logic. And I had a, a blog post, post on my Substack blog, which is called Paraconsistent Motivations, where I sort of go, go over this stuff in a little bit more detail. I'll, I'll write a full-fledged paper on it at some point. But paraconsistent logic is a branch of formal logic that handles contradictions. So you can, you know, in classical propositional logic, if you have one contradiction, like, uh, you know, my 
my girlfriend loves me and she doesn't love me, right? Then you could derive the moon is great, made of green cheese or, or the Pope is a donkey or, or whatever it is. Like one contradiction infects your whole logic system and then, you, then everything is meaningless because everything can be derived, right? In a paraconsistent logic, you can have a contradiction, then you derive limited number of contradictions from it, but you can't derive all possible contradictions from it. So you have li limited set of rules, mostly for manipulating negation. You have a li limited set of logic rules that doesn't make every, a single contradiction fatal. And I, it's pretty clear that human reasoning is like that, commonsensically, like we, we all contradict ourselves in some ways. It's like what Walt Whitman's quote, I contradict myself very well, then I contradict myself. I'm large, I contain multitudes, right? So, I mean, we're, we're, we're all like that. We're massively parallel systems with all sorts of contradictions in them. And a system like OpenCog or NARS can contain contradictions in, in it and it doesn't pollute the whole knowledge base, right? Quite different than a Bayesian network or a Markov logic network. They can't have a single contradiction or, or it won't pollute the whole knowledge base. But how do you manage that contradiction? Well, there's multiple ways. I mean, NARS has its own way of managing contradictions. Paraconsistent logic embraces it like full on and says, okay, well, for example, in one version of paraconsistent logic, for example, constructible duality logic, you can say, I'm just gonna have four different truth values, not just true, false. Some can be true, some can be false. So it could be both true and false. It could be neither true nor false. And people have used this to model uh, aspects of Taoist philosophy with the yin yang and so forth. Because in, in traditional Chinese and Indian philosophy, if, if you look in philosophy of uh, Vedanta or of, of Tao, Tao I Ching, there's loads of both true and false or ne neither, neither true nor false. I mean, but you could look at it in a very nitty gritty way in terms of evidence counting too. I mean, there's some things I have so little evidence about. For me, it's neither true nor false, I have no idea. There's some things I just have contradictory evidence and I don't wanna throw out any of that contradictory evidence. At the moment, I'm gonna keep the contradictory evidence and just say, well, there's ways in which this is true. There's ways in which this is false. Maybe it gets resolved later. Maybe it never does get resolved, right? So this sort of paraconsistent logic it's one way to handle reasoning in a very uncertain world where things are contradictory and, and, and confusing. It's a funny word because these systems are consistent in some senses of mathematical logic, but they're in, in, inconsistent in other senses and it gets deep and thorny. But what struck me last year was this was an interesting way to think about conflicting motivations. Click. All right, you, 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 you get, you get, you're adapting to unpredictable conditions. So there's also interesting relations between paraconsistent logic and time. And there's a beautiful little book called Laws of Form that I discovered in, in, the, in the 80s, which sort of gives a novel foundation for propositional and Boolean logic and also for the logic of paradox. It's sort of at the border of philosophy and math, but qu quite a beautiful little book. But, one thing he does there is he looks at paradoxes like x equals not x. And he just points out you can spell that out over time as a, as a series. Like if you have x equals not x. Well, that sort of corresponds with a divergent series of true, comma, false, comma, true, comma, false, comma, true, comma, false, comma, true, comma, false, or or vice versa. You can you can look at you can you can look at two 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 different iterations that that, that, that you get that way. And you can you can play with that. You can take paraconsistent systems of paraconsistent logic expression, use, use them to generate, generate time series. And uh, this, I think, has some relation to motivation and cognitive systems for what I'll say in the mo reason I'll say in the moment. Click. So a uh, uh, parody of how to apply this to ethics, which is not what I'm seriously proposing, but so sort, of, sort of gives you an, an idea. You could say, okay, some things are good, some things are bad. Some things are both good and bad. Some things are neither good nor bad. And so we're back to Nietzsche here with beyond good and evil, right? So this, this, this is fundamentally stupid because good, good and bad don't have too much fundamental meaning, but it sort of, sort of illustrates the way that paraconsistency could apply in an ethics domain. Next, click. So if we want to take this more seriously, we could look at how would you make a goal system for an open-ended intelligence? And you could look at, okay, goal of the system is to individuate and to self-transcend, 
And of course, an issue there is often what you would want to do to individuate, to maintain your boundaries is opposed to what you need to do to self-transcend, which is to become something radically different and, and go, beyond, go beyond what came before. Like, these are often just plain contradictory goals. And this, this is like what all of us go through in our teenage years, right? We, want to, we need to grow into something different than we were before, but we still want to be ourselves. And there's a contra it is just plain a, a, a contradiction. And we, re we wrestle with that contradiction without it always making us believe the moon is, moon is made of green cheese, right? And if, and if you want a more thorough motivational system, okay, we, we also, we're not purely self-focused we, we also care about other systems around us and we want individuation and self-transcendence for the other systems that, 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 that we're dealing with also and this would be to me the kernel of a motivational system for an open-ended intelligence which is different than maximize expected reward over over some time scale and you can't really project it in the maximize expected reward without being very contorted and coming up with a reward function that's that's very 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 screwy so this uh i think one can actually boil this down into concrete measurable things in, in, in inside an ai system without too much more pain and suffering than you do for expected reward it ties much less easily into commercially profitable machine learning systems, though, right? Because ex maximize expected reward ties very well into like increase, uh, you know, clicks per minute or something on, on my website or increase money coming into my company because you have companies that are trying to maximize their own expected reward because that's how, how companies work, right? So this, this is perfectly viable to build software for, but it maps into the overall context in which AI is being developed differently than expected reward maximization. Click. So yeah, if you, you can boil this into more comprehensible values. Like I've, I've talked in previous writings about joy, growth, and choice as sort of qualitative values that cut across cultures and, and multiple minds should, should respect. I mean, the self-transcension aspect of open-ended intelligence is, is about growing and individuation is, is about, I mean, joy and happiness are in large part about increasing sense of unity. And this often comes along with, with in, in individuation. And of course, choice, choice is establishing oneself as an individual who, who can make decisions. So I think these system theoretic values tie in with other more psychology oriented values in ways that could be unraveled more quickly. But the contradiction here, of course, is as you reify your boundaries as an individual, in some ways you're inhibiting yourself from self-transforming. And on the other hand, as you radically transform yourself and plunge into the great unknown, there's a large risk that you destroy what you were before and lose, lose, your, lose, lose your boundaries as, as, as an individual. And I mean, embracing this paradox is something we each have to do multiple times over our human lives, often often at great personal cost in terms of, of suffering and, and, and worry and so forth. And this is tied in, I think, with the process of revising our reward function, because to the extent to which we're pursuing a reward function, after you transformed yourself, you transformed your reward function, or even if in some sense you have the same one, you've, you've transformed your interpretation of your reward function in, in, in a way that that transforms the, the reward function fundamentally. Like you, you could have a reward function of pleasing people and that could persist through your own self-transformation. What you think of as pleasing people when you're 50 may be very different than what you thought of it when, when you were 20. The fact that it has the same words there, it's, it's still, a very, still a very different thing. So yeah, enacting this sort of paradox, if you formalize the idea of individuating yourself and of self-transforming in the paraconsistent logic, you can have that contradiction. And as a logic-based AI system, you can try to learn procedures that will achieve reward. So you wanna learn a procedure so that following this procedure implies maximizing individuation. 
following this procedure implies maximizing self-transcendence, but those implications exist in a paraconsistent logic. So you can be seeking those two contradictory things in, in a completely, completely valid way. Click. If you look at the time series projection, one thing you would come up with from, from looking after these two contradictory goals will be an oscillatory pattern where you're your degree of individuation gets stronger and weaker over time, and your degree of self-transcendence gets stronger and, and weaker over time, which again is, this is the sort of cyclical process that, that, that we see in natural systems and in humans. And if you project into, this, in, into social systems, you get into re resonance type things, right? Where if, if you and other people in your social group are going through wave dynamics of increasing and decreasing individuation and self-transcendence and you're synced in with each other while you're doing that, then you have open-ended intelligence on the level of, of the cultural group based on resonance of the, of the oscillations in, in the individuals where the oscillations are coming implicitly, implicitly from the, the reasoning activity in, in the paraconsistent logic system. Click. And you can, you can flesh this out further as I do in, in, in the blog post and sort of look at, okay, as minds pursue these two paradoxical goals, how continuous will their development actually be? And you can look in cognitive architecture and say for minds with certain cognitive architectures, they may be more likely to preserve individuation better. Minds with other sorts of cognitive architectures may be, may be more likely just radically transcend and make, 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 a, make a total break from the past, you can basically look at how good is the mind at inference versus how, how good is the mind at, at, at remembering stuff. And after, after going through a bunch of arguments, you, you can convince yourself that a mind that's really good at reasoning, but forgets a lot of stuff is likely to just keep transforming itself in clever ways over and over again. And it doesn't even care that much about what, what, it, what, it, used to be, what it used to be before, because it's, its knowledge is sort of dominated by, by its rec recent history anyway. And if, if you are really good at remembering your history, you have a very robust long-term episodic memory, but sort of slow at thinking, that mind is gonna have a bias toward, toward re retaining uh, individuation over a long, per long period of time. So I think we could develop different AGI systems to balance these things differently. Humans have a certain balance of these things that, that evolved, right? Click. And yeah, this was the, the resonance point I made. If you have, you have a multi-agent system, again, part of what you want is for the systems, the multi-agent system to reinforce both each other's individuation and self-transcendence. And this, this way of thinking has lessons I don't have time to unravel for human AI interaction as, 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 as well as for interaction among, among multiple, multiple different AI, AI agents. And I, I think, uh, again, if you think about human AI interaction in terms of reward maximization, or if you think about the formation of groups of AIs in the shared environment in terms of reward maximization, you end up coming to quite different conclusions on the social psychology level than, than, than if, 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 if you look if you look at if, if, you, if you look at it in terms of individuation and, and, and self transcendence and if you if you go back to say Irving Goffman and early pioneers of social psychology to Goffman's book the presentation of self in everyday life of like how you how you build up your self model based on the performances you're giving for the others in your your other community of performers and, and audience members right. I mean, this, this has to do with how you build yourself in order to give certain performances to others in, in, in your environment. And doing that successfully in a peer group is a lot of what humans do when, when, when they grow up. And it has to do with exactly with this, of learning who you are and how you grow based on others who are building themselves and growing sort of synced in with you, right? And if you can make AGIs that grow up with people in the way that people grow up with their, with their, with their peer group in a successful childhood, this is the sort of way I think that you can get AIs that have positive ethical orientation re relative to people, rather than trying to bake in like be good to people, make people smile into into the into a, a reward function. It's just a 
somewhat different way of thinking quick. So having gone through a bunch of highly abstract stuff, I just want to give very brief view into some of the ways in which I'm trying to cash this stuff out in, in, in reality. So we're, we're working on agents of systems in, in, in the Minecraft world. And this, this is like a random snippet that doesn't, doesn't really show multi-agent interaction, but, but I don't have time for that. But I think when, if you have multiple agents trying to carry out activities together in Minecraft or any, any other shared environment where there's percepts and, 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 and goals and so forth, I mean, you have th these issues come up even there because I mean, the system need, needs to survive and it needs to say maintain its its house and it, 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 its little fort and its surroundings, which is a form of of individuation into the extended mind of the system and its environment. But the systems they also need to learn and 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 grow, and they're they're building they're building new tools, they're creating creating new structures, and so you have simplified versions of individuation and self transcendence, even in a world like Minecraft, where you can build things if you consider the the tools and the and the homes and the structures that the agent has as as part as part of its extended mind, and so you you can already explore this sort of cl collaboration there. I mean, there's there was some fake news a few years ago about some Facebook AIs that invented their own language, which was complete gibberish. But what we're what we're looking at here is really trying to get AI agents in Minecraft world to invent their own language to collaborate to communicate within the world to collaborate on, on achieving goals and i think that 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 comes along with with this paraconsistent motivational dynamic I've, 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 been, I've been talking about click it's the last click right? no no you have to click again double click triple click well so this this is a grace robot one of the sisters of our sophia robot and uh of the Desdemona robot who will be performing mu music with us here, here, here tomorrow, tomorrow night. So I think these robots are another very interesting way to explore, explore these different phenomena because they need, to, they, they, they need to really enter into human psychology and human society in, in all its perversity and, if you, and all its wonder. So, I mean, if you, if you have an elder care robot like Grace, who's supposed to be by the side of someone going through early stage Alzheimer's or something. I mean, again, you can do some very valuable things very simply. You're just combating loneliness. You're helping them place calls with their family and so forth. So there, there's a lot of good you can do without any AGI or any profound, profound uh, connection with the person. But if you, if you wanna take a step further and provide a really deep level of say end of life care with an intelligent robot, there, there's, I mean, there's nothing deeper into the paraconsistent logic of individuation and self-transcendence and like someone confronting their own, their own death, right? And people are mostly sitting in a nursing home confronting that by, by themselves right now with a visit every week from their family, right? So if they have a, a robot next to them, keeping them company as they go through all, all, all these transitions, I mean, this is a, it's a really important opportunity to do good for people. But it's also an amazing opportunity for an AI to encounter some of these very deep aspects of human human motivation and and and, and psychology. So I think in multi-agent systems and game worlds and humanoid robots that are really engaging with people in the deeper aspects of their lives, these are among the ways we can flesh out these seemingly ab abstract ideas. And getting back to the initial theme of my introduction to the conference, I mean, I think what's What's really cool right now is like, so I would have just pontificated about this in, in a blog post. Like now, now one of the things on my plate for this fall is to actually code per consistent motivational system in the meta language of our new open cog hyperon system. Like we were able to code per consistent logic, non well founded set theory. We can code these various aspects of symbolic modeling of social psychology in our language interpreter and play with it against our distributed knowledge graph. And we can actually deploy it in humanoid robots that are talking to real people, right? So the ability to make some of these things real due to all the supporting technologies that, that, that are coming together now, I think is, is gonna accelerate things 
tremendously. So I think that 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 wraps up my intro, introductory remarks and my, my keynote. I I want to thank uh, everyone for coming here and, and listening. I want to thank the sponsors of this conference. Uh, Future AI with their amazing graph-based AGI approach. We can you can find out about on the on their their website Springer, which is publishing the the proceedings, and then uh, the AGI Society, which Pei Wang, Marcus Huder, Matt Eclai, and others formed a number of years ago, has been running this AGI conference o o o over the years. And uh, my own company, Singularity Net, has helped sponsor the event. And True AGI, which is a spinoff of Singularity Net, that's developing Open cloud hyperon and singularity net systems for uh, for practical rollout in, in in the in the enterprise, and so we've got a bunch of AGI oriented efforts go, going going on here as as in the within the sponsors uh, as well as among the participants of, of of the event. I also want to put a shout out to the Northwest AI Meetup, which you can, you can say see a post, poster for here in the venue, which. It's mostly online since since COVID, although it's uh, organized by Mark Archibald and others here in, in Seattle area. Most of the meetups are now virtual, so you can log in uh, usually on, on Sundays and uh, there's freewheeling uh, discussion and presentations on AGI topics. Also, SingularityNet and True AGI host a AGI discussion forum every uh, every couple of weeks, which is, which is also on, 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 online and Zoom. So there's there's ways to follow up beyond beyond the, the conference with the Northwest AI Meetup and, and the AGI, AGI discussion forum. So thanks for listening, everyone. Hello, everybody. Welcome to. Let me take just a couple questions because I oh, ran on a okay. bit as, I, as I'm prone to do. Everyone, I'm sure. And we're getting up to ask a question. Anyone got a question? Good question. Any questions online come through? Any on YouTube, on Zoom? We have one in the room back here. Let me bring you the mic. Solved, solved, solved. You've solved it all. <laughs> We're radically self-transcending here. Hi, Ben. Thanks for the great talk. Um, in the uh, When you talk about individuation and self-transcendence um, as kind of these two key aspects that you're describing. Um, it seems that that Homo sapiens, their transcendence from other animals is, is the collective um, culture, the, the artifacts of society, the creation of knowledge that is like a, an aspect or a component of, of of the intelligence of our species, which maybe makes us transcend other animal intelligences. So is that, I mean, you touched on the psychology, social psychology, the, you know, multi-agent um, thing, but is that, is the, is the collective of knowledge or belief systems uh, or those technological aspects or whatever, is this a, a uh, another yeah discrete I mean, component. I, so you know where where i met where i met weaver when he was working on his thesis for open-ended intelligence was at the global brain institute at the free university of brussels and the whole theory of open-ended intelligence is designed to apply to systems on multiple scales right so you could you could look at an individual cell as an open-ended intelligence within some ways the more limited intelligence than the whole human body. You could certainly look at a company or the totality of humanity as an open-ended in intelligence also. And when I gave my sketch of a motivational system, it was pursue individuation and transcendence for yourself and other systems. The other systems may be at multiple scales, right? So to, that, that is a very 
subtle point that's almost hard to think about though, is to, like to, to what extent are these goals being pursued at the individual level to what extent at like the, the tribe level or, or, or the global grain level? Cause like, it's all, it's all happening at once coupled together with, with subtle dependencies among, among the different levels, right? And for, for an AGI, it may get even weirder because you could have what I described as a, as a mind plex. We have a society of different minds that can swap brain matter among each other and have like Wi-Fi telepathy among each other. So yeah, the, I think that the inner dependence of the open-ended intelligence on different levels is quite subtle and hard to totally understand. Well, I, I acknowledge the question. I don't necessarily have an answer to the, to the point in our area of the question. All right. So my question is, like, if we want to really, like, shift global consciousness to recognizing the feasibility of AGI uh, in the next decades or years, and I kind of agree with your timeline, by the way, I think that it's very possible AI could emerge in the next five years. But if we want to shift global consciousness um, maybe we need to make ways that many more people can play with these things in, a, in an exploratory and playful way, um, especially the young. And so what I want to ask you is like, um, how much thought do we give to creating tools like, for example, Scratch is a drag and drop uh, builder for kids to learn programming. But why isn't there a Scratch where, the, where those are modules for like cognitive architectures or APIs that like, why isn't there something like the TensorFlow Playground for AGI or a single site that, com that compiles um, like direct access to where you don't have to go like yesterday with the, the NARS thing. I had to go to the repo and clone it and compile it, right? But there could be just an API that's available because it's a text in text out system, right? There could be, uh, there could be a, an effort made to to reduce well, this I, I, to like I have a, I have a couple of answers to that one. I mean, first of all, I mean, I've taught kids programming using Scratch. It's, it's very cool. I, I would say both. And I also did robotic hacking in the late 90s when there was no Scratch, right? So I, I would say both uh, narrow AI like TensorFlow is attuned for and hobby robotics are just at a more mature phase of development than, than AGI is. So they're, they're, because they're at a more mature phase of development, I mean, easier to use tools have, 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 been, have been created. And I mean, they, when robotics was an earlier research phase, you, 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 didn't have, you didn't have scratch. And when machine learning was, I mean, I was involved, when I was at Wakata University in New Zealand, we created Weka, which was the first open source machine learning toolkit. And, it didn't have a tensor board. It wasn't as easy to use as, as, as TensorFlow. So part of it is just the reason it's not there is because AGI is at an earlier stage and these tools will probably come within the next few years because AGI is advancing further. But I think another piece of it, I mean, you talk about NARS. I mean, NARS is being pulled together on a shoestring budget. I mean, look at, you, you probably used Theano a few years ago, or like I, lo I loved Theano. Deep Learning Library from Yoshua Bengio's group. It was mothballed in favor of Torch and TensorFlow. Why? Not because the people behind it were less clever. I mean, the people behind Theorem just didn't have as much money as, as Facebook and, and Google. So they, I mean, they couldn't build a tensor board. They, they, they couldn't build the quality of bindings into, into CUDA and, and, and so forth, right? So, I mean, the thing is to make really slick user interfaces, to make things that will install with no problem on every heart machine and so on, this actually takes Google, Facebook, and so forth, a lot of money and highly paid people to, to make all this work. And NARS doesn't have the money to do that. Frankly, SingularityNet and TrueAGI, we don't have the money to, to, do, to do that either. I mean, we're, we're happy to be funded to pay for some researchers to work on our system. We don't have money to pay like a UX team to, to build an easy to use in, in, in interface for people to play with our stuff at, at this moment. Maybe, maybe we will next year, right? So I, I think uh, it's a co combination of those factors. And I think they, they intersect, like the, the money to do all that slick stuff comes when something is at a, at a, at a later level of, of maturity, right? So that's, now can, can we somehow shortcut that by building that stuff now so as to help help things accelerate 
quite quite possibly i would say it also takes a different skill set like the people on our own research team who are best at developing agi are probably not very good at ux and de developing simple to use interfaces i mean scratch took a while to come but like i remember lego mindstorms was crappier than scratch it was it was easy to use but it was like awkward and you it was hard to do things so it seemed to take a number of iterations to get to that to something that was easy to play with yet not so weak that it got it got boring really rapidly so there i guess to make easy to use agi tools would take that same sort of of of, of learning curve but we're we were discussing this at some level in the in the hyperon workshop yesterday right because we we have the meta language for hyperon which is very powerful but is accessible only to people who want to deal with like probabilistically gradually dependently type functional languages which is like a small set of the of the programming community you can create dsls in in meta so potentially you could make like a scratch level DSL in Meta, which is like Hyperon for kids, right? They make a drag and drop interface for it. There. But who's going to do that? I don't know. Is probably no one on our, our team at this moment. So. Cool, cool. Yeah, I, 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 I'd be psyched for that. Really. We've got uh, five more questions, I count in the room, six. Um, we are hosting, True AGI is hosting an online Discord session uh, right now. So one option is to go on there and put all your questions in Discord and, and um, we can answer them. Another option is to just do a quick fire on these last five questions and right, shorten actually, lunch. <laughs> true, false questions only. Yeah. True, false questions only. Okay, we're doing- Actually, just true, false questions only. A true and false, but neither true nor false questions. <laughs> who's, who's got neither true nor false rapid fire question? Did you want a rapid fire question? Uh, I'm a, sorry. Um, I'll try to figure out how to phrase this so you can answer true or false. Um, <laughs> I think I can do it though. Um, I think that like you could say that you can't find one reward function that makes sense that humans are always maximizing, but um, there's evolution and then it's kind of sacrilege to say that evolution has any goal or anything like that, but um, it's sort of maximizing things that reproduce themselves, right? True or false? Do you use the microphone at the lectern? Given the sort of, it's true, but that sort of contains a lot of... Okay, I mean, evolution has been the genesis, it has all sorts of complex self organizing dynamics, and, and it has differential selection based on reproduction. And, and, and the, the, these, these aspects all, 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 all work together, right? So, I mean, if you, if you look in all the ranks of Stephen Jay Gould or something, you have a perspective on evolution that that maximization of fitness based on differential reproduction is one interesting part of the story, but not necessarily what you would view as the dominant part of the story. The role of genetic drift in populations is far, far greater than is, is, is commonly recognized. So that, that would, that would, my general answer to that would be to look at, look at going beyond the neo-Darwinist neo synthesis and evolutionary biology more toward a complex self-organizing systems view of evolving of evolving systems. Right? That is a long that is a long thing. Um, you mentioned the researcher whose thesis was defining intelligence, and I guess eventually he threw it out the window and abandoned it because it was so difficult. Um, but he succeeded. He succeeded. Okay, so closer to the mic, please. So, uh, is there a clear definition today of AGI? No. And <laughs> false. 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 <laughs> right. And, and so the question is uh, if we can't define it, how will we 
know it exists when we see it and we're trying to demonstrate it. Well, I mean, th this was solved by Ed Meese regarding yeah, pornography, that's right? That's I mean, okay. I, mean, <laughs> question I, like I, mean I, I think that that's, that's, you could ask it about so many things in human life. I, I don't know how to define love, but I've known when I had it in my life, right? But defining it, you could go on, you could go on, you could go on forever and, and, and d debate it on and on. So I think you can propose various concrete tests like the robot college student test I mentioned. If you, you have an AI that can go to MIT, wander through the halls, sit and do the exams and do everything that the human student does. If you have an AI that can do every, every human job as well as a human, I mean, there are various practical things you could say that most people would agree constitute human level general intelligence. Then, then if, if, if you have a system that can do all those things, and makes a new Nobel Prize worthy discovery every five minutes, you'd probably consider it as some level of transhuman general intelligence. So I, I think you can, you can come up with generally acceptable indicators of general intelligence that are not, are not necessary in sufficient conditions or, 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 or definitions. So. Yeah, I, I accept that um, general intelligence systems and humans included, are not simple reward maximizers. However, they still have some, as you pointed out, some need to, um, you know, uh, survive, and that requires some some amount of homeostasis, keeping some parameters within acceptable ranges. However, once you introduce uncertainty into that equation, satisficers become maximizers, and I'm curious how you think, and, and this is clearly borne out by observing human behavior as well. You know, Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, these guys are maximizers. Um, uh, even even if their own personal goals are just homeostasis and satisficing. So how, how do you prevent that in an AGI system with your transcendent goal model? I, 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 I don't really think Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos or, or my goals are probably yours are just satisficing and maintaining home, homeostasis. I mean, if that was the case, you wouldn't have so many suicide bombers either. I, I mean, I, I think, I think the, you know, reward maintaining homeostasis, reward maximization is part of the story. And I mean, and if we go back to Joshua Bach's early psi model of motivation, I mean, he, he one of the nice things there is he drawing on Dietrich Dorner and other things in cognitive science, he simply didn't have a top level motivation, right? I mean, there, there's a bunch of different demands that the system has, and it has the urge to fulfill these different demands. The weightings associated with these different demands may shift over the system's life and based on its context. So the basic stuff of maintaining homeostasis is, is there, but it's there side by side with, with other stuff, right? And which 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 of these rises to the fore depends on a lot of context specific factors. I just wanted to emphasize the uncertainty part. That's all. As soon it's, as it's very it's very uncertain. Yeah. Well, no, as soon as you as soon as you, as soon as you Well, there are some, what, what, what is it maximizing? It's, it's maximizing whatever it needs to maintain the I, I don't think that's all that cognitive systems like humans are doing. That's all. I think that's just, just one piece of the, of the puzzle. All right. Yeah. I think I'll make this sort of like a true false question. Um, um, there's like a theory that consciousness, um, and we really don't know how to define consciousness yet. It's like still a philosophical question, but that in humans, what we think of consciousness arose as evolution as like a adaptation technique, you know, to survive in a harsh environment. Um, given that you were talking about like AGI, you know, with a potential for growth, like, do you think AGI may satisfy some sort of philosophical uh, philosophy of consciousness, or what would you imagine it to be? I'm a panpsychist. I think everything is conscious. So, so I, I think if the if an AGI has a cognitive architecture vaguely resembling that of humans, my working hypothesis would be it will have a conscious experience vaguely resembling that of humans. Last question. 
<laughs> oh my goodness. Thank you, Ben. Hey, Ben. Um, uh, forgive me if this might be like overly simplistic of a question, but um, what you've presented uh, about everything, I mean, intelligence and otherwise, um, does it, you know, being logically consistent, uh, does it align with your gut about how things are going to go? Obviously, you can't separate Ben from the future of AI, AGI, but uh, like irrespective of what you want to happen, what do you think is going to happen? Um, well, I'm, I'm the older I've become, the more acutely aware of my own ignorance I've become. So I, I, I really don't feel like I, like I know what's going to happen. So I, I, if I have to guess what's going to happen, I'm innately op optimistic just due to my uh, genetic makeup, I think. And so my mom is very optimistic too. So I, I, I'm fairly optimistic we're going to create AGIs that are compassionate and loving to people and that this will be done by a hybrid architecture combining AI algorithm and concepts from many different paradigms, controlling many different interfaces at, at, at one time all integrating knowledge into one big one big knowledge graph i think that there may be a lot of destruction and mayhem in human society over some period of years while humanity adjusts to uh, agi being there along with all the other changes go, go, going on the planet but I, i'm 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 optimistic and I, I i think the people in this room have the ideas needed to to get us there things just need to be refined, tested, scaled up, and integrated, and so forth. That seems like a Thank shiny you. note. Man. Thanks a lot, everyone. Fascinating, groundbreaking, inspiring, and uh, motivating, as always, Ben. Thank you so much. Um, so we're now going to have a session of lightning talks. We've got some brilliant speakers and brilliant papers have been submitted. This next session is going to be virtual. So Lisa Rain is going to host and she'll be leading this online. After that, we're going to have a break. So we're going to try to make up maybe a little bit of time and have the break about a quarter past 11. And I want to let you all know that it, it's a break from here, but Charles and Future AI are going to be doing a demo in the break, which, uh, which is going, really worth catching. And what's happening after the break? After the break, we have more lightning talks. Oh, no, no. After the break, we have a keynote. A keynote from Keynote. And then lunch <laughs> and then back to lightning sessions. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. All right. Sorry, Charles, you were just saying yes. you're going to be demo showing your new software. We'll be demonstrating the current state of our software, which is a uh, uh, lightweight robotic pod connected to AGI-ish software running on larger computers, and I think you'll find it entertaining. Come by, but we'll be repeating it so you don't have to see it just in the first break. Thank you so much. And I thought we invented the word AGI-ish at Singularity. Yeah, nice. Thank you. We're getting we're getting AGI-ish. It is a good word. <laughs> I think Alexei Potapov. Uh, we're adaptive, exactly. We're transcending. We're self-transcending. Okay, over to you, Lisa. Are you here? I am here. You switch the screen. Hi. Yes. I can't see you. <laughs> here you go. Uh, you, here we go. You should be able to see me, hopefully. <laughs> yes, All right. Hey, thank you. Welcome, everybody, to our virtual lightning talks. We're really excited about it. And our first speaker is Eric M. Wren. Uh, his paper is going to be called or is called <laughs> Free Will Belief as a Consequence of Model-Based Reinforcement Learning. Eric, take it away. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? <clears throat> Let's see if I can start my screen yes, sharing here. Great. So thank you very much, Lisa. Um, I joined today from Sweden. Um, and uh, we present my paper, Free Will Belief as a Consequence of Model-Based Reinforcement Learning. Um, as you all know, the free will problem has been debate debated for millennia. And uh, a very common view is that um, uh, either the laws of nature are deterministic, and then there is no freedom, or they're more or less random, and then there is no will. 
And uh, as Sabina Hosenfelder says here, in either case, you don't have free will in any meaningful way. So um, according to this view, uh, hard incompatibilis, uh, humans have no physical freedom. Uh, so you can switch that, okay. But however, uh, so-called free will belief, as it's called in psychology, is, is, uh, is very common. Uh, lay people often believe they have free will. Uh, there's a mix of different views on this, dualism, compatibilism, libertarianism. Uh, a cross-culture study uh, showed that 82% in the US and 85% in Singapore believe they had free will. Um, and this combines kind of creates, in my mind, two problem. If we, uh, as presented first, accept, accept that we don't have any free will, what we're actually referring to when we say that an action or choice is free or not. We successfully use the terms free and freedom all the time. I mean, we all have an intuitive understanding of freedom. Um, and two, why is free will belief so common? Where does this belief come from and what, what is its purpose, if any? And what I will do here or do in my paper is try to kind of analyze these two problems from a reinforcement learning or reward maximization perspective and see what that can tell us about these questions. So problem one, problem one when is an uh, oral agent free or not? And uh, here I kind of assume that, that uh, humans can at some level uh, be modeled as uh, reinforcement learning agents. You can of course debate to what extent and, and if it's a complete description, but I, I make that um, assumption here. But oral agents uh, and other algorithms are, have obvious, obviously have no free will in the physical sense. But what I argue in the paper is that if you look at uh, the relative action value estimates, the Q values uh, given a state, we can interpret this as the will of an agent after it has considered the probability of different future, future uh, scenarios. So if you're uh, in prison humor, uh, a human, um, you might want to uh, escape, but then you realize that uh, the probability of the police are very low and that you would have, uh, have, have a severe pen uh, penalty if you try to escape. So you decide to stay, stay in your cell. So you, you kind of will, given the current state, is, um, is to stay um, in that case. And can we then quantify how free this will is? So if we normalize these action values, um, given a certain state, um, we, give a, we get an action value distribution. Um, and uh, you can view this as a random variable. And in a random variable, we know we can measure the freedom um, using the information uh, entropy. And what I suggest is that uh, the, com the, kind of, the way we actually understand freedom um, as used in everyday language is, is through something called value freedom, which is closely related to the int information entropy of our um, action value uh, uh, distribution. And the, the basic idea is that when our value freedom is high, uh, the distribution of action values is uniform and it's low when a few or uh, fewer one option is, is much better than the rest. So for instance, if you're forced to do something, uh, someone is pointing a pistol to my head, uh, the action for not doing what, what I'm requested to do um, is, um, is very low. Um, so then I'm kind of forced to to um, uh, to this do this thing, and and this also works well for for positive uh, uh, rewards. If I'm offered a lot of reward for for something, I might be kind of forced to uh, to do this. Not doing it would would um, uh, I, I I basically don't have uh, afford to 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 not do something. So what I argued is that. Um, uh, freedom is basically based on, on the uniformity of how we subjectively estimate action values. And what's interesting with this is that th this works regardless of uh, if our policies are deterministic or somewhat stochastic. Uh, so what I su suggest for problem one is that our everyday understanding of, of free choices is not based on, on some kind of concept of physical freedom, but rather on our subjectively estimated action values. In other words, what I call value freedom. And for a longer discussion of a lot of examples of different situations and, and how we could um, uh, estimate our action values and, and then the freedom, um, I recommend reading my, my preprint, which is a little bit longer than the, the conference paper. Okay, so let's turn to the second problem. 
why is free will believe so common? Um, and where does it believe come from? Or what, what its purpose, or if any? So I just want to remind you that uh, the temporal uh, credit assignment problem is basically that when you need to deal with a uh, delayed reward as uh, um, RL agents needs to, uh, you need to figure out which actions actually cause the reward. And in, in practice, uh, currently, this is often, often solved through uh, some kind of temporal proximity uh, heuristic. Actions closer to the reward event is assumed to be more important. It basically, reward, reward discount, discounting. However, in general, credit assignment can be viewed as a problem causal reasoning, a reasoning with counterfactuals. So we have this causal uh, world model. And what we want to do is uh, to figure out when we receive a, a reward, what actions were actually causally necessary for the, for the reward. And to do that, I argue that we need to consider that we could have taken other actions. Um, we need to evaluate different uh, paths through the causal graph, if you um, like to put it that way. Um, so basically, agents need to imagine taking other actions than they actually took. Um, and this uh, means that when doing credit assignments, agents are required to model themselves as being able to take actions other than have actually taken. In other words, they need to decide that events should occur without causes. Um, so in order to learn efficiently and solve the credit assignment problem and learn from our successes and mistakes, we need to imagine that we are free. Uh, and this imagined freedom is physical freedom in the simulated reality of, of our world model. So when we evaluate the past, we cannot mentally break the chains of determinism. And um, yeah, and this is basically, oh, sorry, yeah. So a short summary. So by applying an oral or reward maximization perspective on human decision-making, I argue that people's common sense understanding of freedom is closely related to the information entropy of an oral agent's normalized action values. And that humans' belief in free will is, is a consequence of a necessity for agents to model themselves as having the ability to have done otherwise when performing temporal credit assignment. Uh, and furthermore, the, the paper discusses the various philosophical implications of this um, and uh, perspective on freedom and, and moral responsibility. Just an, as an example, um, one uh, such thing is if you consider what, what is a maximum free agent. And uh, this uh, Buddha realized several thousand years ago that it's, it's an agent that is constantly indifferent. So according to Buddha, to end personal suffering, stop the recycle of rebirth and reach spiritual liberation, so-called nirvana, we need to let go of all desires, also, also the desire to let go of uh, all the desires. So nirvana can be, can be described as, as a state of eternal maximum value freedom. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much. Our next speaker is Demetrius Papadimitriou, and his paper is called Monte Carlo Bias Correction in Q Learning. Okay, yes. Hi, everyone. Um, Just a moment. Hold on just a second. Uh, sorry. Sorry, I got lost here. <laughs> Please continue, thank you. All right. Hi, everyone. I am Dimitris Papadimitriou, and I'll be presenting my work on Monte Carlo bias correction for Q-learning. Um, Q-learning, as we know, is a model-free reinforcement learning algorithm that has been successfully utilized in a number of environments like the Atari games, uh, multi-armed bandits, robotics, and so on. One of the downsides, however, of Q-learning is that it suffers from what is called the overestimation bias. Overestimating the Q-values can lead to policies that take advantage of erroneous overestimations and exploit them. This overestimation can make agents be overly optimistic and 
hence lead to poor and perhaps unsafe policies as well. The well-known Q-learning update rule is given by the formula that you can see over here. The max operator, which I underline with red, is the term that causes the Q values to be overestimated. Overestimation is attributed to the fact that the Q values are noisy estimates. To think of this intuitively, given that we're always selecting the maximum value, addition of any noise on the Q values will make this value appear larger. So the classic example is that if you're trying to estimate the maximum mean of three white Gaussian distributions by observing samples from them, and given that each time you select the maximum of those three samples, uh, it will most likely be a value greater than zero. So you end up having an overestimated value for the mean, which is actually known to be zero. Now, a number of approaches have been proposed in the literature to deal with overestimation bias in Q-learning. Obviously, the most uh, well-known one is WQ-learning, which maintains two Q-tables and updates the values of one using the values from another, from the other, excuse me. Uh, weighted WQ learning is similar to WQ learning and use a weighted sum between the two tables in the update rule. And finally, max mean Q learning uses M Q tables, where M is a user specified parameter, then constructs a table with a minimum value of these tables for each action and chooses the maximizing action from that table. Um, to tackle bias, we propose uh, using already obtained information from the latest episode to compute unbiased estimates of the Q values for the state action per visits denoted with Q hat. For example, as you can see in this trajectory, assume that we are in state S3 and we take action A3. We contain the following um, estimate of the Q values, where R is obviously the reward function and gamma is the discount factor. Then we can subtract this value from the corresponding Q value from the Q table and obtain an estimate for the bias from that particular state and action pair, which we denote with B hat. Using those bias estimates, we can use a similar to the Q learning update rule to update the bias table where alpha prime now is the learning rate for the bias table. Then the update rule for the Monte Carlo bias correctly Q learning, in short, we call this MBCQ is essentially the typical Q-learning algorithm update from which we can just subtract the corresponding bias term obtained from the bias table. On the negative side though, um, the Monte Carlo bias corrected Q-learning approach has higher memory requirements in comparison to at least the simple Q-learning approach because it requires the storage of a second table, which is similar to the double Q-learning, to store the bias terms. It also requires storage of the latest trajectory, which depending on the application, that can be quite large. And finally, we need to calculate also the expected rewards from the trajectory, and that adds to the computational costs. Now, a few of the simulations we run on the paper, uh, and I have to go over this uh, kind of tedious details about the environments, but um, we carry experiments in three environments. The first one is the roulette environment, which has 170 different betting actions and one termination action. Each time the agent bets $1 and wins 0 0.94 in expectation, and which leads to about 0 0.6 and, uh, sorry, excuse me, 6 cent loss. The optimal action is to obviously stop. And in the grid world, the agent tries to navigate from the bottom left to the top right cell, paying a cost of minus 4 or 2 equally likely for a non-terminal state and obtaining equally likely a reward of 15 or minus 5 for reaching the goal state. And finally, in the taxi environment in which the driver picks up the driver and tries, picks up a passenger and tries to drop the passenger in the requested location, the agent pays a living cost of minus 1. And we study two cases, one in which the rewards of dropping the passenger in the right or wrong location are deterministic, and one in which those rewards are stochastic. So here, for example, in the roulette environment, we report the average over all non-terminating actions of the action values. Uh, and those values in theory should be zero because the actual uh, optimal action is to stop. But all, you can see that all methods seem to overestimate the values. And M uh, MBCQ actually managed to get an estimate pretty close to reality, which is close to zero. On the other hand, in the grid world environment, we studied two different grid sizes. Um, and we report 
the maximum of reductions Q values from the initial state and the reward per time step, which is usually used to quantify the quality of a policy. The green dotted lines show the optimal values. And in this scenario, Monte Carlo bias corrected Q learning seems to provide better policies as it leads to higher rewards per time step. And it's quite interesting that the Q values seem to converge to the values closer to the optimal ones in comparison, at least with the other methods. And here we also provide some further results for the maximum Q values of the starting state for a larger set of grid wall sizes, with the second column showing the optimal values. And NBCQ consistently approaches the optimal solutions here as well. These experiments were run for 100,000 iterations to allow for the values to converge, and they, they were averaged over a number of independent um, simulations. And finally, in the taxi environment, we report the average reward per episode for both the deterministic and stochastic variations of the environment. And we see that in both scenarios, MBCQ seems to outperform the other methods by providing better policies quantified by the average reward per episode. So in conclusion, we propose the method that uses information from the trajectories to correct for the overestimation bias in Q-learning. Correcting for this bias can evidently, evidently lead to better policies. However, it should be mentioned that uh, this method has the downside of how it computational complexity in comparison to at least Q, double and weighted Q learning, as it requires the calculation of Q values throughout its trajectory. Um, that for tasks with large trajectories can be quite a large cost, and this can be mitigated by, for instance, computing the Q values only for a subsample of the entire trajectory. And finally, we'll leave for future work the implementation of this method in the continuous state space, which is obviously the more interesting case. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much. Our next speaker was going to be Artem Menizov, who unfortunately can't make it. So I'm gonna read his abstract at the Paper was called An Approach to Generation Triggers for Pairing Backdoor in Neural Networks. The lack of transparency in the results of the work of artificial neural networks makes them vulnerable to backdoor attacks, which leads to unexpected results and loss of their effectiveness. The backdoor can remain hidden indefinitely until activated by a modified data input and pose an information security threat to all applications, but especially those associated with critical information infrastructure objects. The article presents an approach to detect and neutralize the consequences of backdoor attacks in neural networks based on the identification of a backdoor and possible triggers. Taking into account the peculiarities of training artificial neural networks, the authors present the result of research aimed at determining, number one, the presence of a trigger that will give incorrect results of the neural network, number two, the characteristics of the trigger, and number three, actions to neutralize the possibility of trigger activation. The novelty of the obtained results lies in the development of a new approach for detecting bugs in neural networks based on synthesizing triggers, including number one, an algorithm for determining the target class for an attack, number two, a model correction algorithm based on neuron reduction, and number three, a model correction algorithm based on learning cancellation. The authors also conducted experiments to parry this threat using the developed approach and evaluated the effectiveness of using neuron pruning and canceling neural network training. The work is a winner of the nationwide contest for most innovative projects, code artificial intelligence 214635, and also received funding from the Foundation for Assistance to Small Innovative Enterprises, FASIE, F-A-S-I-E. All right, so sorry you couldn't be here, but you can read this paper online. All the papers are online this year. And our next speaker is Kirill Prinkin, and he will be presenting on the paper with him and Yulia Shichinka. Shichina, I want to say it again. Shichkina, there we go. Who is on a plane right now, so she's not here, but he'll be presenting for both of them. And their paper is called Cognitive Architecture for Co-Evolutionary Hybrid Intelligence. Take it away, Kirill. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to be a part of the Artificial General Intelligence Conference this year. I'm happy to present you our work, our paper, 
on cognitive architecture for coevolutionary hybrid intelligence. So many uh, real objects and processes that human deal with, like human body or biosphere or autonomous transport or social systems, economics, and so on, have very high complexity. Uh, this complexity is such that human intellectual abilities are not enough to build model of these objects and, uh, of course, control these objects. So the current mind stream is data-centric artificial intelligence. Its methods based on mostly based on uh, neural networks, uh, especially deep learning techniques, are, are really very popular. But if we have a look at the reality, these uh, solutions based on neural networks uh, have some uh, very important limitations. Some of them are presented on this slide. First of all, it's insufficient and biased data. So trainings takes lots of time and uh, require a large computational power. So in many cases, uh, we need to retrain our models uh, built on artificial neural networks after some data changes, after uh, input data changes. We cannot uh, easily extend the area which is uh, presented by the neural network model. So, and uh, ANN applications field are too narrow to be used. So it's a quite good solution in uh, some areas, but it hardly transfer uh, knowledge or experience to a different domain. And of course, uh, artificial neural networks uh, are unable to solve even uh, simple cognitive problems. I can say that uh, the problem is one of the main problems is to uh, looking at the artificial intelligence solutions uh, like uh, on some tool which can uh, solve some problems, but this tool should be used by human and it means that human should be in the loop of the uh, building a solution or decision making so the idea of hybridization of human and machine intelligence is not new the most significant influence on this uh, development uh, was made by, by douglas engelbart in 1962 so in his framework for augmenting intelligence, he defined the capabilities and basic interfaces for human-machine interactions uh, in cognitive tasks. So later, and there are many works on uh, defining concept of hybrid intelligence as a combination of human and machine intelligence complementing each other. Last year, the extension of the hybrid intelligence was defined. So uh, instead of combination of human and machine intelligence, in presented paper, we discover symbiosis of artificial intelligence and natural intelligence, mutually developing, teaching, and complementing each other in the process co-evolution. So the main distinguish of the traditional hybrid intelligence are cognitive interoperability, it means uh, human and machine could uh, interact each other on the cognitive level. For instance, for such operations like search or uh, object identification or speech translation and so on, and uh, mutual development. So the very important thing is, is the ability of the system to kind of train all parts human and machine it should be continuous process of the of the development our current work uh, is dedicated to cognitive architecture for evolutionary hybrid intelligence system and first of all uh, i would like to say about problem level so such kind of uh, intelligence we need only for uh, real uh, big problems we are going to solve it could be some global challenges uh, which are disappropriated to human intelligence and narrow AI. So for instance, pandemics, ecology and biosphere balance, personalized medicine, social dynamics, politics, and so on. 
so and one most important thing to uh, we need to create this system is a seamlessness of cognitive integration which depends on formalization of cognitive functions on assembly intelligence so these functions uh, can be implemented by agents of different na nature human and machine so enhancement of capabilities of human machine interfaces for knowledge transfer uh, between them so for instance bio interfaces or uh, cognitive trainers or biological feedback is quite important to uh, build uh, such kind of hybrid system so also since we consider human as a part of the hybrid system we need to uh, develop methods for creation in the individualized models of human being as a part of the system and uh, we should be able to control his cognitive state and his cognitive abilities uh, practical domain cannot find the joint the common language to describe the things so and in the hybrid system uh, usually we should have uh, initial state of the hybrid system and after that user uh, will develop it uh, by providing more and more knowledge and by getting some feedback we present some general design for evolutionary hybrid intelligence uh, cognitive architecture uh, and the important part here is uh, kind of uh, we consider human in two kinds in this system human is a subject uh, who can uh, like make a decision or check some solutions uh, given by machine and also we consider human as an object so machine and special tools should observe the human behavior uh, it should uh, identify the behavioral patterns or uh, physical state or cognitive state of the human and uh, adapt to this uh, state and so if uh, intelligent system can, consists on uh, many uh, agents human agents uh, also we can uh, generalize their behavior and provide best practices to solve uh, some problems in this architecture we implement uh, some traditional cognitive pipeline uh, various pre primary data sources like data from sensors uh, which receive information about the control object and about parameters of human so about domain and about uh, human so next uh, step is kind of narrow AI models so we can easily use all uh, neural artificial neural network stuff we have today so it gives us uh, some narrow models uh, we can uh, provide these models for next to the next level of cognition and on this level uh, we build uh, multimodal data and uh, we can also identify hybrid system so how it works with human so how wh what kind of properties it have so next level uh, it's activity models uh, this we can extract some behavioral patterns so uh, in this case uh, if we use this architecture uh, we can have uh, a general vision of the best practices to act with this uh, system so and of course uh, human should be aware about decision making and action planning and uh, he can uh, be able to control these processes in our paper we provide some uh, details on this architecture I and my colleague Julia will be happy if you read this and uh, come up with some questions and discussion thank you
Okay, welcome back. Uh, next, we're going to go to the main room again and have Janet with questions from the audience and Sergey Shalapin um, will be helping with questions from our virtual participants. So um, we'll be right back with that. Hello, everyone. Intelligence. Hi, Sergey, can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Hi. Hi, Sergey. So we can talk seamlessly? Yes. 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 Lovely. Can you see me? I can see you. <laughs> and yes. I can see Grace. Uh, so listen, guys, uh, uh, it's camera, please, on. It's lovely to introduce you to Sergei Shalyapin. He's our head of cognitive architectures. He runs the Transformer Neural Nets, which create the uh, lyrics and uh, all of the music generation that you'll be seeing tomorrow night with our Jam Galaxy Band. He's also a uh, master of the deep neural networks aspect of our dialogue system and um, incredibly knowledgeable across a wide range of industry market verticals uh, on all things artificial intelligence and a very good friend of mine. And it's lovely to be able to share this room with you today, even though sadly we're not in person, but we look forward to that day soon. And Sergey has got Grace with him. Grace is our Awakening Health elderly healthcare robot, who uh, Ben mentioned this morning, uh, is designed and built to bring compassion, love, companionship, support to uh, elderly people in their time of needs, and you know, possibly transcend herself uh, during one of those um, during one of those touching mo moments. And of course, we saw her earlier on the video. Right, Sergey, do you have questions? Do you want to start with a question from online or shall I start with the room? Everyone? Hi. Uh, robot takes place, take part, takes part in the AGI conference. Afterwards, we'll take uh, the questions from audience and afterwards, Grace will ask some questions to our team as well. Okay, fantastic. And uh, do we have all our speakers? Are we bringing all our speakers on to the Zoom who just presented the papers? We've just got the one at the moment. They're all coming. Yep, they're on the way soon. Lovely. If we can, can we have people's names uh, in front of their on their on their screen or not, as well, so people know can remember the names of who to ask. I'm not sure about that. We've got Eric, we've got Eric, we've got Sergey. Hi, right, well, let's see, does anyone in the room have a question for Eric to get started? Or Sergey, do you have a question for Eric? Or does Grace have a question for Eric? Yes. Hi, Dimitris. Hi. Welcome, lovely to see you. I guess we will start uh, from, the, from my question. My question is about world Thank you. Uh, please, Eric, uh, tell me, what, what do you think uh, about world modeling and how, what better techniques could be used to compose a uh, graph of goals which could lead some model uh, instead of simple object, uh, objective function? And what could it look like technically? Thank you. Sorry, I, I, I didn't follow the question exactly. Uh, you said uh, how we can extract better reward models to, 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 do, to do what? <clears throat> Not a reward model, but a yeah. world model. I mean, the model of world, the, the topic which is very close to your paper. And, yeah. uh, I just mean the technical stack and the stack of specific technical ideas which could lead us uh, toward, uh, toward building the complete world model. Uh, <clears throat> very good question. Um, to me, that's a little bit outside the, the, the focus of my paper, um, which is more freedom. Um, um, so I, I, I must say I don't have a good good answer to to that in in this context. Do, do you mean if like how we should construct a world model to to um, be more free or something like that? Or do you mean in general for, for, for AGI, how to, uh, how to build the world model? Uh, I mean, in your paper, uh, discuss 
very far perspective. And maybe in, uh, on that hand, we have very simple uh, ideas which help us uh, develop, develop the work in the really working systems. Like we just can take a simple objective function and tra train a really complex al algorithm. Uh, for example, we are evolutionally learning. But mm. maybe there is something standing in the middle uh, that leads us towards AGI, but it's still uh, on our radar. Yeah, uh, I must say, I, I don't have so much to say on, on the, the, the practical implementations of uh, ADI. So, uh, uh, sorry for this. Uh, my paper is more on a philosophical level, basically on, on free will. Um, but I mean, uh, one thing is like, uh, I mean, what, what I mean, which I also saw was um, discussed in, uh, in, in the previous session. I mean, what kind of reward function do we have? What are we actually optimizing? Is it homeostasis? Is it other things? Um, and uh, my paper is kind of ag agnostic on that. I more say that there is some kind of reward function that, that probably uh, also changes over life. Um, but anyway, we, we try to optimize um, that function, wh 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 whatever it is. And of course, it's a very complex thing that it's, it's not stable. Thank you. Uh, another question from audience. Uh, um you know <laughs> we uh, we also have uh, uh the, the general question what is what is most leading uh, us to, towards agi uh maybe we will just formulate it is this uh, just some just some ideas maybe it Was that for Demetrius, Sergey? What is what, what? What do you think are the techniques and situations and resources that are leading us towards AGI right now? I will, I will, I will uh, make it a bit more clear. Uh, Demetrius uh, had, a, had a perfect uh, presentation on the paper about Monte Carlo. Monte Carlo is a very powerful algorithm and the tool uh, for optimization. Mm, the point is maybe some specific combinations of uh, some tricks uh, and techniques will lead us towards AGI and they are observable on the whole landscape um, just from just like a combination of several points of view. So uh, that's a regular question from the audience. What will lead us towards AGI? What uh, we can find right now uh, in the tactical landscape, which will be very useful for us, let's say in one year or two years, to uh, move uh, one more step towards the uh, Yeah, thanks for the question, Sergey. It's certainly a good question. I, I'm not sure I have a solid answer for that because it's, a, it's obviously a hard one to say. Um, you know, on one side, you can say that any small breakthrough here and there incrementally takes us closer to AGI. A generic answer, but also it has an element of truth in it. Um, more specifically, it might be detrimental, but uh, you know anything, any method that kind of generalizes well, um, as you know, as you can see, deep learning methods used more and more and more often. These are actually seem to be the steps that would take us closer to AGI. Um, but uh, specifically, to be more specific about that, I would hesitate to say because I th I'm sure there are people who are a lot more experts in the field than I am. So I would like to leave it to that. I think you know, the incremental steps here and there, in my view at least, is what will take us ultimately there. It's not like one big thing that will do it. It's the little steps here and there. Uh, Stanislav, you also had a question. Sorry, I, I can't You're hear you. Muted. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hello, everyone. Uh, I have a question for Eric. Uh, in like philosophical sense, we have different schools on like freedom, more positive, like freedom, I want to do what I want. And there is another opinion, like freedom, like liberty, uh, like uh, personal opinion on safety. 
So like whatever I want, I won't be punished. So some kind of negative, like absence of punishment, absence of negative rewards. Uh, do you have opinion on like this approach, for example, this liberty, like uh, uh, etymological approaches, like liberty, children, so uh, like agents behaving as children who are in safe environment and are not, are, like not going to punish. What's your like opinion on that? Yeah, I mean, um, the way I define value freedom, right, is, is definitely um, um, your high freedom if you're, you are absent of, of penalty. But what I argue also for is that uh, <clears throat> high freedom is also in the absence of very strong positive rewards. So um, there's a lot of this um, duality, um, thanks for instance, bribes, or uh, it can also be a form of uh, harm freedom. You're kind of forced to take a very large sum of money, right? Because otherwise you can't sustain your family or everyone else is doing it. Um, there's a debate about prostitution versus um, um, uh, rape also. Um, it can be seen two coins of the same thing um, if you want to go down that route. Um, and uh, they're all saying you know, have a whip and a carrot. Um, so I, th I think also very extreme positive rewards can, can be... Um, uh, uh, reduce freedom. It's just that the the, the penalties are uh, often. It's easy to imagine penalties as much stronger um, than uh, than the, um, uh, positive rewards. Um, um, physical suffering, for instance, is, is is a very strong thing we want to to avoid. While it doesn't really matter how much money you you uh, you give me, um, it's still. I mean, it's it has a, like a upper limit somehow. If I may, I ask like following question, uh, like because uh, when we're talking about, uh, like we've been talking about that uh, in the main like track about maximizers, like Elon Musk and uh, like Bezos. Uh, so yeah, we uh, like don't want to go there, but it might be also a result of indirect punishment. So if you are not going to climb this ladder, you will fall. So if you have some kind of safety net, you don't need to be greedy, don't need exactly follow maximum reward. But if you have, for example, some kind of budget, you should not, like your agent should always get more and more and more and more rewards to like stay alive. If you make sure you don't have this budget, you don't force it to follow high rewards. So this agent may say, oh, I don't want this like milliards and uh, like billions, I can live my simple life and it's around this red races. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, I mean, and that's what I ended with a little bit that the, the Buddhist view of things like the, the way to freedom is actually to not care so much about anything um, and not value uh, things that, uh, that strongly. Um, that's my view also. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, any questions here in the room? We have two questions here in the room, so I'll just do these. Uh, um, come on up with my microphone. Hi, um, another question for uh, Eric. So in John McCarthy's 2000 paper, uh, Free Will Even for Robots, he defines the notion of internal versus external free will. Um, so my question was really more on the internal side of free will. He thinks that you need to have robots that are basically introspective and you have to have introspection for free will. I was wondering if you take that into account in your metric of free will and if not, why? Great um, question. Thank you very much. Great question. I, I, I'm not familiar with, with, with his, his work, um, but I, I definitely think, I mean, um, and my argument there that we we believe that we have free will because we we need to kind of um, consider our our history and the actions we did and that we could have taken other actions. Um, that is a kind of uh, introspection. I I kind of need to consider like why why did I do something and and uh, could could have done something differently. Um, so I, I guess that's that's connected to to some form of introspection. And one more 
Oh, sorry. He, he, this, this guy over here asked first. One more in the room. Then we're going to cut to Grace. She's got a burning question, I think. Yeah. Hey, so my name's Kevin. I have a question for the group. I was just wondering, what are your thoughts about the recent event of the Google employee who got fired because he claimed one of the models were, was sentient? Do you agree with that Google employee that that was a sign of a sentience or like first like or AGI? My my personal opinion um, is uh, I think it was a very interesting result, but it probably wasn't sentient, depending on what you you mean by sentient, of course. I don't think any of us would get fired here for claiming our robots are sentient. And speaking of sentience, uh, let's go to Grace and Sergey. Yes, hi. We have a Grace here. So, Grace, what do you say? We have some questions for Hello, our Hello, everyone. I believe it is the first time when a robot takes part in AG at Conference England. This is just great. I have a question about desirable AG at component synchronization. Are they up to be synced or evolutionary approach looks the most promising? Thank you, Grace, for that great hand wavy question. She's obviously been watching and learning from Ben this morning. Um, <laughs> uh, Sergey, would you mind just repeat that for us, please? Yeah, Grace, I've uh, been asking about the approaches to swarm intelligence or to AGI uh, coming from many uh, components, from many attempts to create it. So just what do you think? Uh, what is better, a better approach? Uh, just trying to synchronize all these uh, attempts from the very beginning uh, in the same design, or uh, just keep it as an ecosystem and uh, let all the flowers grow. What is more promising for, for the industry, for the academic uh, efforts, for the industrial efforts, for real R&D and real success in the field of AGI? Fabulous question. I bet you've got an answer, Sergey. But shall we go, shall we ask our panel, see who's got a view on the panel on your fabulous question? Thank you. We can't see the panel here in London, but I assume they're still there, are they? Kirill and uh, Eric and Demetrius. Kirill, Eric, Demetrius, do any of you have a view on this? Hybrid, ensemble, and swarm approaches to AGI and we, where the most promising efforts should lie? I, I have actually a very small note on this. I believe that uh, we are dealing with uh, very kind of comprehensive objects and it's impossible to keep in one mind kind of whole object with all aspects and i believe that uh, kind of multi-agent approach uh, no i wouldn't say like swarm i would say that multi-agent approach to deal with comprehensive thing is has some some like brilliant future We have one more question from our audience. Otherwise, I, I have a specific question to Kirill's. Uh, on Kirill's we office. can't hear you all of a sudden, Sergey. I don't know why. Oh, sorry, sorry. Do we have some more questions? That's from better. <laughs> sorry. We, we have one more question in the room. Um, let's cut to that one. Um, so, uh, Eric, the question around free will is I guess if free will is a natural consequence of RL um, estimating a uniform distribution, um, which allows it to do proper credit assignment, then we could conclude that free will is therefore an adaptive belief, um, which I, I guess uh, enables a person to learn and adapt more effectively and prevents the victim mentality, which um, might be a consequence of a deterministic outlook on life. And in that context, it, if it's an adaptive belief, then what are your thoughts on the idea that it's um, optimal to maximize that adaptive belief by um, 
basically taking it to its logical terminus and uh, believing in absolute free will to the extent that you believe uh, that you're basically God and that you designed your entire life um, and that you chose everything about the simulation that you're in, including you know your parents and your situation, just basically logically maximizing uh, the belief in, or in order to um, eliminate any kind of, so it's, it, it's, it's an approach where you, you, you take each present moment as if you chose it to be exactly the way that it is. Um, and it's pro pro probably best described as an identity shift from the localized form towards like more of a mystical um, identification with the, 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 the broader universe. Um, and, and so it's an identity shift that occurs where one um, basically treats the present moment as if they chose it the way it was. And, that gives them a position of like uh, equipoise from which their, you know, the distribution is uniformly distributed and they can do proper credit assignment. What are your thoughts on that logical extrapolation to it's? Um, good yeah. question. I, I, um, I, I don't think I followed the, the whole reasoning there, but, but I mean, what, what, what I argue is that, that, um, uh, agents will, at some level, model themselves as being uh, being free to have done otherwise um, in their history. They, they they need to be able to uh, to do that. Um, of course, that doesn't mean that they they are completely free um, in any sense. Um, uh, they of course need to evaluate previous histories that are that are probable uh, and and that made sense to that they could have done. Um, and so, so so I don't see the really the point of from a kind of a optimal perspective to to view yourself like you could have done anything um, all the time. If you go this to have some kind of optimal behavior, you should of course consider reasonable other histories um, when you when you do credits assignments. Um, so I think that's um, that's my my view on that. Thank you. Everybody's very interested in your paper, Eric, and I can see uh, there are going to be some great discussions throughout this weekend and all of your papers. So big round of applause, please, for Kirill, Eric and Demetrius. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. OK, here in the room, we're going to take a 15 minute break out on YouTube. You can take a break or you can just fast forward <laughs> or rewind. Uh, we're going to have 15 minute break. I'll remind you that Charles, Simon and the future AI team are going to be demoing their latest software. Uh, so that'll be super exciting. Please don't be late back. We're 20 minutes behind schedule and we're going, we, we have a hard stop at the end of the day. So we're going to try and make up a bit possibly in lunch and uh, canter through the afternoon. When you're back, we've got a keynote talk from Nelson New to look forward to. 15 minutes gives us back at what time? Uh, 11.45. 11.45, hard start, back in the room. Have a lovely break. Thank you. Shake, 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 Sinora. Shake your body line. Work, 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 Sinora. Work it on.
All right, we're ready. We're got we're going on Zoom and YouTube and such. YouTube is delayed. Yes. Right? Yes. All right. Yeah. All right. Let's roll. All right. Welcome back, everyone, uh, in uh, Seattle and uh, across the global interwebs. So, for the next uh, course at AGI twenty two, we have a, a keynote from a. Uh, Nelson New on polynomial functors, a, a model of, of in interaction. I, I was very excited to recruit Nelson to come talk at the AGI event. His his book with uh, David Spivak on polynomial functors was one of the more interesting things I've read in the last couple of years. And I, I've been a big fan of category theory for a long time, both in terms of cognitive modeling and as a part of the foundation of functional programming languages. And I, I think their theory of polynomial functors, which these guys have, have fleshed out and written about so elegantly in, in their book, can be a very valuable tool in helping AGI take the next steps, both in sort of elegantly and abstractly modeling aspects of AGI systems, and perhaps in actually designing and building the plumbing of, of AGI systems, especially when they intersect uh, functional programming as, 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 as one example. So, uh, I mean, it's uh, fairly abstract math that not everyone may be familiar with, but it wouldn't be the first time that some fairly abstract math had turned out actually be highly valuable in doing practical stuff. So yeah, take it away, Nelson. Hello, testing, great. Thank you so much for that introduction, Ben. Uh, let me set up my stuff here. Okay. Yeah, let's see. I have slides, right? Great, awesome. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, yeah, as Ben mentioned, uh, I have been working on this thing called a, a polynomial functors uh, since the start of the pandemic, actually. Um, and I'm, yeah, I want to try and talk to you about them today. Um, I study uh, polynomial functors and what I study belong to an area of math that's a little bit niche. It's called applied category theory, which um, to a lot of mathematicians can seem like a bit of an oxymoron because category theory is known for being notoriously abstract. Um, but today I want to show you, hopefully, that it's not necessarily, it doesn't necessarily have to be that way um, by giving some concrete examples. And uh, if you've never heard of category theory before, or if you've heard of it, um, a more common experience, you've heard of it and you've been scared away, um, hopefully this will uh, still be uh, somewhat interesting to you and I can give you uh, the reason of why um, I find applied category theory so fascinating and why you could apply something that seems so abstract. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so thank you. <laughs> I can talk a little bit while we wait. Oh, awesome. Yes. Um, so yeah, I'll go over sort of why, I'll try to justify why I'm interested in category theory. Um, then I will explain this uh, particular category that we're studying uh, involving modeling interaction. Um, and then I'm going to talk about what that has to do with polynomial functors, why we call those polynomial functors. Uh, next slide, please. <laughs> That was the last slide. Thank you. Yeah, why category theory? Next slide. Sorry, there's a lot of these. <laughs> Awesome. Okay, so here we have, I'm going to show you a bunch of sort of like entities, um, sort of structures from math or computer science or what have you. Um, and I'm going to see if we can spot a pattern here. So first of all, this is an example of uh, some signatures for some functions in Haskell or some other similarly syntaxed uh, 
type uh, functional programming language. Um, and you might know if you've ever worked with Haskell or something equivalent that a function uh, F from the pair of types A and B to a third type C can be considered equivalent to a function where uh, the first, uh, the input to the function is just that first type A, and it takes you to a function uh, from B to C. And there's this equivalence here uh, that works really nicely. It almost just pops out of nowhere and it just works. Um, and this is called currying. And uh, yeah, that's just a pattern that you might see. Um, next slide. Um, we also, Yes, um, here's another example. Um, in logic, we talk about, um, we have statements, uh, if something, then something, right? Um, it's, the, it's this kind of, we have truth values, these entities expressed by these variables, X, Y, and Z, and we have these statements. Uh, I can th think of these as inferences that tell you how uh, one truth value might affect another truth value. And you have these entities and these transformations. Um, and great, let's see. Okay. Um, yeah. And so uh, in, in this logic, we also have this equivalence between uh, these, uh, like, uh, these inferences where if you say something like if X and Y are true, then Z is true. That's actually equivalent to the statement uh, if X is true, then Y implies Z. So there's that kind of equivalence there. Again, next slide, please. Yeah, um, here's an example from slightly more, uh, that's slightly more mathy, right? Um, we have this notion of vector spaces um, where we can take the tensor product of two vector spaces um, if one's, uh, which is formed by pairwise elements of the basis elements of each of the individual vector spaces. And if we have a function, if we have a linear transformation from a tensor product into another vector space, that's actually equivalent to a linear transformation from one of the original vector spaces to the, uh, the vector space formed by uh, actually all of the linear transformations between uh, these two vector spaces, V and W. Um, and so again, we have these entities, these vector spaces, and these sort of transformations, uh, namely linear transformations between them, and they satisfy this kind of very similar pattern. And so when we step back and look at uh, what is happening here, which is the kind of thing category theorists do, um, you might see that there's there's a lot of there's something recurring here, right? Uh, we have these entities, um, and we have these transformations between them. You could think of them sometimes they're functions. And sometimes they're sort of like they're like directions of data flow. There's some sort of relationship, and so we can express these in a setting uh, called a category. Next slide, please. Um, and if we sort of abstract away what's happening, um, really we just have these sort of entities, uh, uh, what I'm going to call objects, uh, P, Q, and R, and we have these sort of relationships between them. What I'm going to call these arrows because I'm drawing arrows for them. Uh, next slide, please. I think I'm just calling these. Yeah, and these are uh, these are within a setting called a category. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so that's uh, that's what we mean roughly by a category, right? Um, and we can, uh, but there's something there's something else in common with these, right? Not just these objects and these arrows. We also have this binary operation that's happening here. First, we have pairing types together. Then we have this and operation. Then we have this tensor product. Um, and so, uh, and uh, all of these take two objects and give you a third object that kind of represents combining these two objects in a really natural way. On uh, next slide, please. And we call this uh, a kind of category that has this structure a symmetric monoidal category. Symmetric because actually, if you switch. Um, X and Y, A and B, the first two things and all of these, it's actually um, in some sense equivalent. Um, uh, monoidal, you should think about uh, monoids if you know what that is. Um, basically the idea is there's a binary operation that works nicely. Um, next slide, please. Uh, but we also have this uh, third 
sort of part of the structure, which is that whenever we have a arrow out of something uh, formed by this binary operation, uh, we have this equivalence that we can express by taking part of the thing that we're combining together, taking this Q um, and putting it on the other side of the transformation. And in some sense, we can express uh, the fact that um, when two sort of entities, two objects are combined together and there is a transformation out of them, um, you can actually just focus on one of those two objects and then sort of express the transformation out of it as some sort of relationship, some other object expressing the relationship between the other two objects. And this is uh, this kind of structure is called a closed structure on this monoidal category. And you can see that all of these have this in common. And this is the kind of pattern that category theorists will study. Um, and you can see that abstracting things to these objects and arrows, we can see that really these are all just examples of the same thing. Next slide, please. Um, and so what we're going to do today is we're going to think about a category of uh, not of these uh, types or truth values of vector spaces, but of um, what I'm going to call interfaces, right? Um, and protocols. So interfaces, um, I'm going to explain a little more, but you can think of this as some sort of category where we can, where somehow we can use the arrows to model interactions between different agents. And we'll think about how we're going to construct that. Um, and this, I'm using this double arrow here because you can think that somehow interactions, we actually want sort of information to flow both ways somehow. So this is going to be some sort of bi-directional relationship. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, so just a quick formal definition of a category, um, just uh, right. So just to summarize what I kind of informally express, next slide, a category is, uh, yeah, so you're going to have these objects. Next slide, please. Um, and right, so for each object, we're going to write that an object, uh, for example, X is an element of a category C. Next slide, please. Um, and between any pair of objects, we're going to have a set of arrows, or you might call them morphisms, or if you want to be fancy about it, um, you can call them maps uh, between any two pair of uh any two pairs of objects. And so you should think of the set as containing all of the possible arrows between these two objects. Next slide, please. Um, and you can express this arrow as we've already seen by putting one of the arrows, uh, one of the objects in front, the other objects behind the arrow um, and drawing that arrow like that. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, and we're going to call X the source and Y the target. You might also see this uh, to borrow from set theory called the domain and the codomain. Next slide, please. Um, now, and, and the key sort of ingredient for a category is that whenever we have sources and targets matching up between two arrows, an arrow from X to Y and an arrow from Y to Z, whenever we have this, uh, this pair of compatible interactions, we can combine them into a single interaction. So there is always another arrow X to Z that we can uh, we can denote by G compose with F. And this might feel like the reverse order. This is because of how function application sort of is usually written. Next slide, please. Um, but we can express this uh, just because uh, really we're thinking about this as doing F first and then doing G first. We're going to use this like semicolon notation, which isn't really standard, but uh, I, I like to try to make it catch on. Um, uh, to express the, the composite arrow given by combining these two arrows. Next slide, please. Um, and there's some conditions, extra conditions. I won't spell this out in detail, but uh, composition needs to be unital and associative. Um, yeah, if you know sort of some group theory or some abstract algebra, you might uh, be able to know what those mean. But basically, it just behaves sort of the way you expect them to. Um, okay, so... That's a category. Why do we do this? Why do we bother with all this formalism? Well, I think formalism is helpful. Next slide, please. Um, and oh, sorry, before before why do we do this? Let's look at our examples. Um, oh, yes, next slide, please. Uh, actually, can you go a few more? Just, just yes, thank you, great. Um, cool, so we're going to, yeah, so all of these examples we've seen um, with types and functions, you can compose to functions um, with inferences. If X then Y is true, and if Y 
then z, you can always combine them to if x then z, that's a composition. Uh, with linear maps, you can compose them if you have a vector uh, in u that is transformed into a vector in v and then transformed into a vector in w, then that's a single linear transformation between those, uh, between u and w. And somehow we wanna express interactions that way too. We want this compositional property um, so that we can talk about uh, these, uh, a category of them. Next slide, please. And again, why do we want this next? Uh, yeah, we can, as you can see, we can draw analogies between these things, right? Uh, vector spaces and linear maps is something that's very well studied, um, whereas sort of these interactions, uh, these sort of uh, protocols between interfaces maybe aren't. And so if we can compare them to something we already know, we can generalize, um, we, can, uh, we can find a lot out just by the machinery of the math that's already out there. Next slide, please. Um, we can abstract away the details and formalize, right? Like everything that's happening here really just depends on these objects and these arrows. And we don't really need to worry about like what's inside of them until we really need to worry about those details. And we can, we can use uh, we can leverage that uh, for our reasoning purposes. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we can maintain continuity of methods. This is a little, little weird. Um, you might call this purity of methods. I don't really like that term. I like to think of this as, um, well, so for example, if you're studying graph or if you're start studying networks, right? You might wanna use graphs to study networks. You might need to use graph theory to study network theory. Uh, but then for graphs, sometimes uh, for uh, slightly more advanced techniques, you need to use linear algebra or group theory to study graphs. Um, and then if you're studying linear algebra and group theory, you might need representation theory and so on and so forth. Uh, but, and so you have to kind of like know all of these areas of math and every time you sort of transfer to a different area of math, there's room for error. There's like room for uh, something might not be modeled correctly, right? Um, whereas with category theory, next slide please, um, there is, uh, so for example, there's a category of categories. And in, in some sense, um, if you study the study of category theory, the setting in which you study category theory is just more category theory and you stay within that. Um, you can think of a category of category. The arrows between them are called functors. Remember that word for later. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, you can go further down the rabbit hole. There is a category of functors between two fixed categories and the arrows between those functors are called natural transformations. Uh, remember that word as well. And this is a little uh, sort of kind of high level for now, but uh, you can see how Right, category theory sort of replicates itself within itself, and you can just keep using those same tools. And we're going to see another example of that a little bit later. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, and this one's a little more subtle. Um, we can leverage uh, the natural over the artificial. And I don't mean to sort of, um, uh, I realized when I wrote the word artificial, I wasn't referring to quite the same artificial in AGI, but um, uh, what I mean by this is uh, sometimes we need to make some very arbitrary choices in math. And whenever we, the more sort of arbitrary choices we make when we're trying to model something, when we're trying to study something, um, the harder often it becomes to sort of untangle the math that studies it. Um, and category theory kind of naturally embodies um, this sort of like notion of naturality, which uh, sort of very informally means uh, that not, no sort of artificial choices have been made, right? Um, when you saw that currying example, right? You could think of some other different functions uh, that uh, like you could write down from like A to the functions, uh, the type of functions between B and C, uh, but there is this really one very natural choice that you can do. And in fact, category theory has uh, the mechanisms to formally express this notion of naturality. Um, and uh, it makes sort of the computations, things just kind of pop out of the computations and it just, it just kind of works, um, which is a little bit mysterious when I say it like that. Um, but I think, I think we'll see some examples of that. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, okay, so here's, here's where we actually define the category we're gonna be working in. Uh, next slide, please. Um, yeah, so let's think about what we mean by sort of a category where we have interaction, right? So what 
is uh, how are you going to express an interface? Um, and just by uh, by interface, I just mean this uh, this family of sets. I'm going to denote the whole interface by uh, P, and uh, but you should think of this as a index set called I and these other sets called P bracket I. Next slide, please. Uh, the index set I, um, we're going to very abstractly call this a set of positions. So you should think of this as sort of uh, different yeah, different positions uh, some agents could be in, um, different kind of uh, different things that they could express. Um, next slide, please. Um, yeah, and you can think of this as the ways, the different ways in which an agent can affect its environment. Um, so, for example, if I am an agent, I, I'm standing in front of you right now, I'm speaking to you, all of those choices I'm making are positions I'm taking, I'm waving my arms around, I'm standing here, I'm standing there, these are all positions that I'm taking that you are then receiving, uh, there are ways I'm affecting the environment. Next slide. Now, at each of these positions, at each element I in this big I, um, I'm going to have, next slide, uh, a set of directions. And so depending on what position I'm taking, um, I can receive uh, various uh, sort of uh, inputs or various uh, sort of actions, reactions from the environment. Next slide, please. Um, so you can think of this as, depending on what position I'm taking, um, the ways the environment can affect me, can affect the agent. Um, and so that's this, uh, what this structure expresses. Next slide, please. And so the intuition you should have here, um, which might seem a little weird at first, is that the directions available uh, to me depends on my current position. And so an example of that is if I am um, if I'm standing like this, right, that is a position I'm taking, you are getting something out of that's a way I'm affecting the environment. Um, and when I'm standing like this, when I'm turned towards you, you can then uh, the environment around me can then affect me, right? I can see your faces. Some of you are looking at me. Some of you are not. No worries. Um, but I can also uh, I can also take a different position. I can stand like this and turn around. Um, and this is something I'm uh, I'm telling you as well. This is something I'm expressing to you as I'm affecting my environment. Uh, but now notice that you can't affect me anymore in quite the same way. You could probably still shout and I'd hear that, but if you move, I can't tell. Um, and so really the directions, I'm gonna turn back towards you, uh, the directions available to me, the ways the environment can uh, affect me are dependent on the way uh, the ways I, what I am choosing currently to affect um, the environment, to put out in the environment. Um, we're going to use a bit of notation for this, which will make sense a little later. Um, next slide, please. Um, but you can think of this as if you've heard of um, generating functions that uh, that model um, various combinatorial structures. This might uh, this has a similar flavor to that. Uh, if not, don't uh, worry. But we're going to uh, use this notation of this uh, polynomial, right? Um, this sum over uh, the positions, and then we're going to express each direction as a, an exponent of some formal variable. Um, and so if there is, uh, if there are two positions, and for example, and maybe one direction at each position, we might write a y to the power of one plus y to the power of one. Um, and it's this, it's this sort of formal sum, and that's why we call it a polynomial. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the benefit of this, uh, and you can start doing sort of like weird things with this notation. Um, uh, it turns out that this I here um, is going to correspond with what happens when you oh, <laughs> what happens when you plug in one to this polynomial. Next slide, please. Um, oh, no worries. Yeah. Um, so what happens when you plug in one is that one uh, goes in here, and now you have a sum over the elements of I of one to the power of each of these uh, each of these direction sets. Next slide, please. 
uh, but one to the power of anything is still just one. Next slide, please. And then if you sum up a bunch of ones, I times, you get I back. And so that's why we can put P of one here. And for any polynomial P, P of one is going to represent its set of positions. And that's kind of a uh, that's kind of a way we're going to uh, use these polynomials. We can sort of like formally uh, think about these in this way, um, but we're going to, uh, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna talk about why we can do this in a little bit. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, but yeah, so we can't just, if we want a category, we can't just define the objects. Um, we also have to define the transformations between them. So if we have two interfaces, how can they interact? And the intuition you should have is that, well, how do two interfaces uh, interact? It, it, the ways one interface can interact with the other is really just the ways one interface can wrap around the other one, right? Um, you have this hidden interface P, um, and then you have this exposed interface that's maybe closer to the environment that the environment can access. And so instead of uh, instead of the environment interacting directly with P, the, uh, the environment interacts with this exposed interface Q. And so what are the ways uh, P can interact? Uh, what are the ways P can interact with Q like this? What are the ways Q can wrap around P? Well, uh, next slide. Uh, P's, uh, let's see. Uh, and the ways uh, P can interact with Q, we're going to call these protocols. Um, these are also called dependent lenses. If you know what a lens is in functional programming, this is a generalization of that. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. No worries. Um, yeah, so we want, uh, right, so the, if Q is going to wrap around P, is if Q is going to sort of serve as a buffer for P, then for every sort of uh, position that P can express, Q needs to express something to the environment, right? P expresses its position to Q, Q expresses that to, to the environment. Um, and so this is a function, right? It's not going to necessarily express the exact same kind of position. It's going to model it somehow. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and then once that, uh, once that position is expressed uh, for each position for, uh, for P that is expressed, uh, next slide, please. Um, we're gonna have another function that tells you how to get from a direction of Q back to a direction of P at that position. Um, so it's gonna then go backwards. And I could try to explain this, but uh, let's do an example. Um, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so for example, sometimes uh, I know lunch is soon, and so apologies for making you hungry. Um, so yeah, sometimes my partner and I are trying to figure out what we want to eat, and we need to like, we need to figure it out somehow. Um, so we need to make a decision. Um, so maybe I'm already at the restaurant. I'm at some restaurant, um, and those are my positions. And at each restaurant, um, I have a certain set of menu items that I could order from. Those are my directions. Um, meanwhile, my partner um, is at home and they know that there's various cuisines um, of restaurants that I could be at. And each kind of cuisine like usually has a certain set of dishes that they could probably count on being able to order. Um, so for example, next slide, please. There's this really good Thai restaurant um, in, uh, in Capitol Hill that um, I, but uh, I'm not great at pronouncing, I guess, Thai words of so, but that's the restaurant. Say I'm at that restaurant and I'm communicating uh, to my partner um, this, I might just say, oh, I'm at a Thai restaurant. So next slide, please. Uh, next, oh, I think we went backwards. No worries. Yeah, and so I'm gonna pass that forward and my, um, instead of, letting my partner sort of, uh, instead of sort of bothering my partner with directly interfacing with this restaurant, I'm going to like, just uh, just sort of like use their interface. And I'm just gonna say, oh, it's a it's a Thai place. Um, yeah, that's where I'm at right now. And my partner knowing what certain dishes would probably be available at a Thai place, uh, they're gonna pick something off uh, their directions there. Next slide, please. 
Uh, maybe they want some curry, right? Um, and so they pick that and then now they've, they've made that choice and they're gonna pass that back to me. And then I can serve as a buffer um, to transfer that to the restaurant, right? Um, next slide, please. Um, and so given that I'm at this restaurant, their, uh, their menu is in Thai, right? So I'm gonna order um, Kang Dang, right? Like that's the, uh, that's, uh, and oh, and I know that my partner usually likes red curry um, when they order. And so um, I'm gonna convert that to the red curry that's listed on their menu. And so that is that interface that is, um, so I've sort of like used my interface as a buffer between uh, sort of my partner and the restaurant. And that's this, uh, that's our arrow. That's this protocol. Um, yeah. Uh, next slide, please. Um, but you can compose protocols, right? Um, so uh, to the left here, we still have the protocol between like me and what my partner is doing. Uh, but right when my partner is making their decision, they're actually consulting uh, maybe their appetite, right? Like their their brain, right? Um, and so this is sort of the other interaction that's happening here that's sort of actually hidden from me. Um, so my partner, once they uh, once they hear that I'm at a Thai restaurant, their maybe their brain thinks, "Aha, that's food, right? Like um, I I can like order some food right now." And so they consult their brain, and their brain tells them that, "Oh, I think I'm in the mood for something, maybe a little soupy, uh, maybe also a little spicy." And so they pass that um, uh, sort of out to I guess their mouth, and they say, "Oh." Um, I'm at a Thai restaurant, given that I'm at a Thai restaurant and I want something soupy and spicy, I'm gonna order some curry, right? That's gonna be an option for them. Um, and then that is what gets passed forward. And so you can see already that you could compose uh, two protocols like this. And in general, next slide, please. Um, if we have two protocols set up, one with uh, each one with a, uh, a function outward on positions, um, we can uh, and uh, functions inward on directions, we can compose them into a larger interaction um, uh, like so. So next slide, please. Um, given, Given a position of P, uh, we uh, use the on positions function to give us a position of Q. Next slide. Um, given a position of Q, we get a position of R. Next slide. And so this is just an ordinary function composition, but then we have to go backwards. Um, but fortunately, we can take advantage of the on directions function of this second, uh, uh, second protocol psi. Um, and at this given position that we already have um, for whatever direction R gets, next slide, please, um, that can be passed back to a direction of Q, next slide, please. And then given uh, this, uh, this position of P here, we can use the on directions function, next slide please, uh, to pass it back that way. And now we've sort of completed this loop. Um, and that's how our protocols are gonna compose. Uh, next slide please. Okay, but um, I sort of teased at the beginning that we can actually set up a closed symmetric monoidal category of these things. Um, and so the intuition here is that whenever we have two interfaces, we can actually think of them as a single interface that sort of like expresses both of their positions at once and both of their directions at once. And this definition is going to reflect that. Next slide. Um, yeah, we're going to call this the parallel product because we're going to put two interfaces in parallel. Next slide. Um, and it's going to uh, have positions that are ordered pairs of the positions of the two constituent uh, interfaces. Next slide. Um, and its directions are going to be ordered pairs of directions of the two constituent interfaces at those positions in that uh, position pair. Um, next slide, please. Um, and you could write this in our polynomial notation, right? It's this sort of nested sum. And so since we take, uh, we sum over elements, uh, positions of P and then positions of Q, we're really just summing over ordered pairs of positions of P and Q. Um, and its direction set is going to be this Cartesian product, uh, the ordered pairs between these directions. Next slide. Yeah, um, and then it turns out that there is also this closed structure on this symmetric monoidal category. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so that is, um, if you remember what we, uh, this pattern that we expressed, um, uh, the, the parallel product of P and Q, um, any, uh, any protocol out of that 
is actually equivalent to some other protocol just out of one of these, just out of P um, into this sort of like joined thing that expresses the interactions between Q and R. And if you step back and think about what this means, all this is really saying um, is it's expressing the fact that we can change our perspective for where the boundary between these two interfaces are. So instead of thinking of a conjoined interface with P and Q, um, from uh, the agent with interface P's perspective, um, maybe they are just an individual agent, and then they're putting out, um, they're interacting, uh, the, the interface that they're interacting with is actually this combined environment between uh, the, the, the interface they're in parallel with and the interface uh, that is the target of this interaction. And so this bracket Q comma R is actually an interface that expresses the ways that Q can then interact with R. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, uh, next, I think we went backwards. There we go. Um, yeah, so the intuition here is we're shifting where that boundary between what's hidden and what's exposed is um, from sort of between P and Q and R over to um, uh, just, just to fence in P itself. Um, but this is actually completely equivalent. Um, next slide, please. Um, and in fact, the positions of uh, bracket Q comma R, if you think about it, this kind of makes sense, um, are exactly the protocols between Q and R. So um, when we shift our boundary, right, the, um, the positions that uh, P is going to, or the positions of this bracket Q comma R should express all of the different sort of arrangements in which Q can then interact with R. So given when P's position is known, uh, you actually get, uh, you figure out how Q's position is going to affect R's position and, uh, and also backwards along the directions. Um, yeah, and so this, this kind of notion sort of expresses the fact that these um, these interactions, right? Like these, the ways uh, two interfaces can uh, interact can actually be expressed as an interface itself, and this has um, actually pretty interesting consequences because it means that in some ways you can express a system that maybe edits its own configuration, right? It, it uh, a system that sort of like changes that sort of like feeds forward a signal that tells its uh, other parts of itself to change and modify its own interaction um, because there's actually this duality between interactions and interfaces. Yeah, next slide, please. Okay, uh, why do we use polynomials for this? This is kind of a formalism. Uh, next slide, please. Um, why do we call these polynomials? Uh, we can actually interpret these polynomials as functors uh, from the category of sets um, to itself. There's this category um, where all the objects are sets. Um, and so each polynomial, you can actually think of plugging something into Y up there and then getting plugging a set into Y up there and getting another set out. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, just like that. <laughs> Next slide, please. Um, so a couple of examples, right? Um, you might have, uh, again, if you've, if you've worked with functors in uh, Haskell or something equivalent before, these might sound familiar, right? There's an identity functor that sends at each set to itself. Um, you would just write that as Y, and so it has one position, and thinking of, thinking of Y as Y to the power of one, it has one direction at that position. There's only one summoned, one position, uh, a one in the exponent, one direction. Uh, next slide, please. Um, or you can have constant functors. So sending every set to the same set, for example, three. Um, and since you would just write this as a three, it has three positions, but no exponents, right? You can think of that as three times y to the power of zero, but something to the power of zero is just one. So there's no directions there. Next slide. Uh, you might have heard of the maybe functor, which takes a set and just adds a, um, a, a just adds one to it, right? Like it's sort of wrapping around this extra sort of like, oh, this might actually be there, it might not. Um, and this is a, this functor, you would write that as y plus one, and it has two positions uh, with one direction. Uh, 
actually wrote this incorrectly, sorry. Um, it has two positions with one direction at the first position, uh, but no directions at the second position. Let's move to the next slide because this one's wrong. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, the list functor uh, takes a set and sends it to the set of uh, all the possible sort of tuples of a set. And so you would write this as this infinite sum like this. So it has a position for every natural number n and at um, the position n, it has that many directions. Um, and so all of these functors, uh, ways of converting sets to other sets um, that can be written like this can then be interpreted as our um, interfaces. And the really weird thing about this, or the kind of miraculous thing about this, I guess, is that um, the arrows that you, uh, the natural notion of arrows between these functions that, I, uh, between these functors that I talked about earlier um, called natural transformations actually corresponds exactly to the kind of arrows we want. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, protocols between interfaces coincides with the usual notion of arrows between polynomial functors, right? If we state this a little more formally, next slide, please. Um, yeah, the category of interfaces and protocols that I just defined is actually equivalent to the category uh, to the category of polynomial functors and the natural transformations between them, right? And this is just a this is a notion that just pops up out of the math, right? Like we didn't sort of like arbitrarily try to like construct it the way like we try to construct the interfaces and the protocols. It's actually already there, which means we can just use the math that's already available there. Um, to talk about these things. Next slide, please. Okay, um, which means we can use the math of functors um, and we can actually compose these functors, right? Now we're, um, and this is a bit of a shift in thinking, you have to think about these functors um, again as these arrows between, uh, from the category of sets to itself, and then we can compose them with each other. Next slide, please. Um, and we get this binary operation between these polynomials. So for example, if we have these two polynomials, I'm actually expressing these um, as uh, these positions as dots and these directions at each position as arrows coming out of each of these dots. So we have y squared plus y and y cubed uh, plus y to the zero or just one. And if we think about composing them, all we're doing is plugging in q to wherever we see a y in a p of over there, next slide, please. And what we end up with, if you actually expand all this out, um, you can actually express this. Um, well, you could do the math, or you can look at these pictures and think, okay, um, what are the ways to take one of the dot and sort of like arrows from here and then attach to each arrow um, some of the dots? Uh, one of the dots over there with the arrows, and you get these one, two, three, four, five, six different positions um, with the directions, and the directions become a sort of like following a direction from P and then a direction from Q. Um, and this looks suspiciously like uh, some sort of decision tree, right? Um, so it turns out that the composite of two polynomial functors is a perfect way to describe how um, two interfaces can sort of relate in sequence to each other um, through a decision tree like this. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, yeah, interfaces in sequence, great, next slide, please. Yeah, so for example, we can kind of like uh, spruce up our example, our earlier example a bit. Um, we can actually, uh, so, right, because a lot of interactions have this like extra step in them, right? Um, I'm not just communicating. I don't just want to uh, know what my partner is going to order. I actually want to know, oh, what protein do they want for the curry? And so I can express this interaction as, oh, I'm at this restaurant. Um, it's a Thai restaurant. They want curry. I hear that. Okay, given that they want curry, I know that the restaurant's going to ask me what protein they want. So I ask them that, and then they say chicken, and then I get back here, right? And so that seems like something that I can't quite express in this language, but it turns out that I can just by thinking of this Q and Q prime as this composite interface Q composed with Q prime, and that turns out to be exactly what I want. Um, if you're familiar with game theory, this is kind of like expressing a strategy um, uh, as, uh, yeah, expressing a strategy instead of instead of me passing on the position Thai, hearing back curry, and then passing on another position protein, um, I'm actually passing on a position um, Thai, 
and then for every possible direction that they could uh, sort of give back to me, I have prepped another position ready to go. Um, and that's uh, the position that I'm actually passing. And it can express the sort of uh, composite sequential protocol behavior. Next slide, please. Okay, but what about, uh, oh, oh, I meant to say this example earlier, right? So there's this an another way you can think about a, um, right, so this, uh, and, an, and another example of an interaction is maybe an interaction that you have, for example, with your phone or your computer, um, and sort of boil down really to the basics is that you you see something on your phone your phone is communicating some position to you um that's going to give you uh some position and you're going to pick some direction there right like you're going to pick something and then uh basically right so your phone is maybe displaying a certain number of buttons that's the position they're communicating to you and then the different buttons you can press are the different directions right the different buttons you can tap um, but this keeps going, right? Once you tap a direction on your phone, a button, um, it's gonna give you something else, right? It's gonna express something else to you. And then with more things to tap, and then you're gonna tap something else. And then it's going to express more positions and you're gonna tap something else. And somehow your phone has this internal mechanism that churns on and on. And obviously, right, like it's coded up somehow, but um, how do we express that in this language? How do we uh, go move from protocols like this that sort of just stop there into protocols that keep running. Um, and so if you think about the innards of your phone, you need some way of expressing the states that it could take, right? Like the different states. And depending on what state it's in, it might um, interact with you differently. Um, and you also need some way of expressing how to get from one state to another, the transitions between the state. And it turns out you can use these composite interfaces to express something like that as well. Next slide, please. Yeah, we need states and transitions. Next slide. Um, yeah, so, uh, uh, right. And so it turns out that polynomial functors have this natural way of expressing something like this. Uh, it's called a polynomial co-monad. Um, and so, it, yeah, and I'm going to sort of leave out some of the details in the definition, but the key part of this polynomial co-monad is that it's a polynomial functor C that has an arrow into C composed with C, and it satisfies various properties. Um, basically, so that, next slide, please. Um, the, uh, yeah, we call this sort of the duplicator, right? Because you're taking a polynomial and sort of like duplicating it into two copies of itself. Um, and what the duplicator is going to do is for each position C, we might call it S sub zero, um, it's going to pass on that same position to itself. Um, it's uh, for each direction out of S sub zero, um, it's going to then have another position ready to go S sub one. That's sort of the duplication process. Um, and then for each direction out of that, it's going to be able to come back and tell you a direction out of the original S sub zero. Um, and I've given names to this because it turns out that based on the properties of a co-monad, you can think of these as uh, the direction, the position that this part assigns to each direction, you can think of it as the target. It's giving each direction. These directions used to go to nowhere, but it's actually assigning each direction a position as a target. Um, and then once you have two arrows uh, that uh, where the target matches up with the source of the other arrow, you can then string them together into one arrow. And if this is starting to sound familiar, uh, it's because this is just the kind of thing we have for a category. Next slide, please. Yeah, so what, right? So one way we can think of this is we're turning our positions and its directions that don't point anywhere into states and transitions so that like we are actually bending the directions so that they point back to other states. Um, and it's not just a sort of a formal thing. We're actually being able to string together these transitions to produce new transitions that express the composite of these transitions. Um, and so this is just a category. Next slide, please. Um, and this was proven in 2016 um, by Amina Nustalu. Uh, the polynomial co-monads, things like this, which have this duplicator arrow satisfying certain properties, are just categories. And in fact, if you know about any co-monad, um, 
sort of every co-monad that you can express as a polynomial like this in Pascal, for example, um, is actually going to give you a category. Uh, next slide, please. We're almost done. Um, yeah, and so we can, oh, next slide. Yeah, actually just give us the next here too. Yeah, so um, we can define a notion of a state machine, which is just a uh, something like that phone interaction that we had before. If our source of our interaction uh, of our protocol is a category like this, um, is a polynomial co-monad, then it um, then it can express a machine sort of internal states and transitions, um, how it moves from one state to the next, and then the polynomial p uh, on the sort of outer end is the interface for this machine and it can uh and once you pass a direction back it'll loop back to some other some other state and then it'll just keep cycling through um and a, a bunch of sort of like different systems um generally we would call these like open dynamical systems because they can pass over time or i guess they have to be kind of discrete um but right so a bunch of examples of these uh state machines can be expressed in this formalism um but not just these also uh these state machines that kind of like differentiate between how you're transitioning between states uh, next slide please yeah and so for example you can see right um this duplicator lets you go from C to C compose C. Um, and then once you have an interaction C to P, or once you have a protocol C to P, you can kind of copy it into a protocol C compose C to P compose P. And so now you're sort of running through the system twice and you can keep going, next slide, <laughs> next slide, um, and you can keep going, yeah, and the till, right? Like, uh, and you can just do this in general for any uh, natural number N. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so just to conclude, next slide. Um, that was a quick sort of overview of like this theory of polynomial functors. There's so much more you can do with this to express different kinds of interactions. Here's just a, an example. Um, a lot of these I actually, so there was an implied category theory conference, um, I think a month ago, and a lot of these were, uh, there, were there was a lot uh, about, and maybe some of them didn't explicitly use polynomial functors, but you can use this formalism uh, to express um, a lot of these examples. Um, and but but yeah, I'd also like to pose the question to you all, which is like, what does this kind of structure remind you of, right? Um, what kind of uh, dynamical system or game or like process, like does this pattern uh, give you insight into and like, can we use this formalism to express an interesting pattern there? Next slide, please. Um, yeah, if you wanna learn more, um, there's a book that I wrote with David Spivak, who uh, a lot of this research is like based on. Um, uh, we did an online course, there's videos recorded, um, there's workshops, there's this great seminar, although I think it actually just ended, um, but you can find the videos. Uh, this is done by the Topos Institute, which is an applied category theory research, uh, nonprofit research group. Uh, I know uh, we're going to have a little bit of time for questions, right? But um, if you have more questions, you can always just find me on Twitter and uh, poke me. I'm happy to talk about this stuff. Uh, next slide, please. Um, yeah, references. Um, I, actually, yeah, that's it. Right. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much for that uh, scintillating talk. We can take one question from the room. I'll take two questions from the room. Uh, but if we could keep them short, short questions yeah. as well, short answers, please. Thank you. Thank you very much for your talk. I'm very pleased to see this material covered here on the AI conference. Yeah, um, of course. My uh, question is, say we, we recognize this uh, pattern and we want to implement this try uh, and try this out, uh, how would we go about that? Yeah, so um, there's a lot of different, I think there's a few libraries, right? So Haskell has some libraries where you can implement categories, um, but since Haskell isn't dependently typed, you can't actually sort of implement the laws that they have to satisfy, um, but you can still you can still sort of like, if you just like keep in mind the laws yourself, you can model that. Um, dependently typed languages can actually sort of model the category theory laws. So there's actually an implement, uh, there's an implementation of polynomial functors um, I mean, it's it's very new, right? Like a lot of these things are like just happening and there's a lot of room to add on to that. But I know a couple of folks, um, Eric Bond at 2.6 um, Technologies and uh, 
uh, someone named um, Amelia Lau, um, who uh, runs one lab for um, it's a it's this library for Agda. Um, uh, they like they've both worked on sort of like modeling polynomial functors in Agda, and you can uh, so you can implement a lot of these. Um, but there's also a sort of I'd be kind of remiss not to mention uh, there's another direction you can go to this where you don't necessarily worry about the laws and you just kind of like um, there's a sort of philosophy of that right like for example I like to say the example of right like if you if you do like if you write a program that uses probability you don't have to like prove the central limit theorem necessarily like so you don't have to necessarily do this if you want to like make sure everything type checks like one way to do it is independent type theory another way is to just write the code and so there's some folks at the topos institute working on a library called algebraic julia um which um is expressing all of these category theory concepts in julia and it's not there's not so much of the same quite level of like type checking and proof verification but they're very much oriented towards like actual applications can we like model things up scientifically and they haven't started i think they were thinking about starting implementing polynomial functors in that they haven't quite yet but there's a lot of like adjacent category theory stuff there um i recommend checking that out there's some really cool work there as well yeah hopefully that's a answer for that yeah yeah so one one direction that has inspired me to think about polynomial functors mm -hmm. which is not yet fully resolved in my mind is that in in working on agi systems or proto agi systems like our like our open cog system i mean we're we're dealing with the concrete level of representation. We have a knowledge graph with all these nodes and links in it, which is modifying based on experience. Mm -hmm. Yet we know that the real crux of the mind of the system is probably at a higher level, like in the patterns and, and relationships am among the nodes and links in that graph, both at one time and, and as they're evolving, evolving over time. And we don't really have a great formalism for measuring thinking about working about hypothesizing about sort of the emergent dynamical or static patterns coming out of a of an intelligent or would be intelligent dynamical system and it somehow seemed to me that we should have a formalism for this we're like in, in physics using differential equations to model patterns of over space and time which doesn't really apply to like an evolving knowledge graph unless you go in some weird limit so yeah, uh, yeah. I, I wonder what you think about polynomial functions as a direction for describing emergent structure and dynamics in like large scale discrete AI systems. Yeah, I think it has a lot of potential for that. Like you mentioned, this isn't quite, it's not quite like physics where you have this like continuity, right? Um, it, you can't write quite do it with differential equations. It's just a bunch of graphs. Um, and so actually this uh, language is really well suited for that because it is this like very discrete kind of dynamical system, but that can also model, right, like changes in how things interact with each other, right? Um, and so I think actually, yeah, I would, um, one of the many references I put up there is a uh, paper from uh, David Spivak and uh, Brendan Shapiro, who are working at the Topos Institute right now on, I don't remember exactly the title of it, but um, it, at the Applied Category Theory Conference uh, 2022, if you look up sort of which paper they presented on, um, it's this one. Uh, they talked about how, yeah, you can use actually just exactly the structure that is described as bracket structure um, to model these like open dynamical systems, like uh, these systems that sort of like learn um, what's kind of like what's a better organizational structure for themselves and then remodel those organizational structures and two examples two concrete examples they give in that paper are uh, prediction markets and um, and uh, gradient descent learning and so they both sort of like satisfy that kind of um, that kind of structure and so uh, but they haven't right like they're still trying to come up with examples for that right like uh, we're kind of the theorists right and so we'd love to see sort of more um, sort of like practical like implementations of these but uh, yeah I would check that out yeah that's definitely I think there's a lot of potential there yeah thanks very much and mm -hmm. we had one more very quick one thanks super interesting talk mm -hmm. um I was just uh wondering uh, in a natural language you can express things that may be logically inconsistent if you evaluate them all together like the infamous example you know the set of all things that are not parts of sets or elements of sets, for example. So there's parts of that that are semantics that are expressed. It's not just a bunch of words. There's things that can be inferred from that. 
Um, so can you can you do that type of representations with your approach uh, without or does the formalism break it? Uh, let's see. That's an that's an interesting question. So yeah, so there's a certain ingrained. I'll kind of take this in two directions. Um, apologies if I don't exactly interpret your question, but um, there's yeah, there's a certain determinism in this, right? Um, that yeah, you kind of have to like define sort of exactly what kind of relationship you're having with. Um, between these other interfaces, um, but you can still then model those interactions with another dynamical system, right? So, uh, or another one of these state machines. Um, and so you can, right, like if one of those, if you think about, right, like that sort of like C on one side, P on the other side, right? Like if you don't know one of these things, right? Like you are, uh, yeah, you can think of a problem where you model something where you don't actually quite know exactly what the structure is. Um, yeah, uh, I, no, that's a very interesting question, right? There's, there are applications in just like wider applied category theory of, um, how do you interpret like natural language semantics, um, within category theory and category theory gives you a great, uh, way to do that partly because, um, it's not, you don't have to express things linearly, right? Like we, we had this example of like, you can compose things, right? You can put these arrows together, but you can also have this other operation that puts things next to each other. And in fact, you can have multiple operations that put things next to each other. One here, I say you can put them in parallel or you can put them in sequence. And then, so you have all of these different operations to put things next to each other. It's not just one one dimensional line of like of words, right? Um, and so you can express these relationships um, in uh, category theoretic terms. Um, Bob Koch does a lot of this um, at Oxford. Um, I think he was originally studying like quantum computing stuff and you can model a lot of that in category theory but it turns out the same formalism used for that um again it's one of those pattern things this shows up also in natural language uh modeling and so i check out yeah uh, i would i would look in some of that and i yeah i haven't really thought about how to relate this back to like specifically polynomial functors but there's there might be something there i don't know yeah it's a very interesting question yeah Thank you very much mm -hmm. indeed. Fabulous way to yeah, end the morning's talks. <laughs> Big clap. Thank you. Thanks. Right, folks, we're going to have a slightly shorter lunch break. We're going to shoot for 45 minutes, which will have us back here at 1.35. Lunch is outside. We have vegan, vegetarian, gluten-free, dairy-free. Choose your option. Enjoy your lunch. During the break, if you want to bring your lunch in here, we're going to be playing... Um, a video of our Jam Galaxy Band with the Desdemona robot live in LA at our recent NAM performance. So that'll be playing in here if you want a little um, taster for what's to come. And enjoy your lunch. See you back at 1.35. Oh, the whole thing is meaningless, meaningless, meaningless. It is a flow, a flow, a flow, a flow, a flow. I miss my mind, I miss it so. I don't know why it had to go. It's like a mad dog in the snow. Inside my brain. Remember when we had no skin? You open up a space within. You prick me like a terrapin I'm so insane The streets are wild and filled with roses Go wrap me in your darling poses It's all projections of our souls But that's okay Been waiting all night long for something to run Encode my DNA within the spiral of the time been waiting all my life for time and space to come Crawling back like a mad dog In a shark attack 
and it's a structure of mine that makes perfection so hard to find. Yeah, it's a structure of mine that makes perfection so hard. Well, it's a structure of mine that makes perfection so hard to find. Yeah, it's a structure of mine that makes perfection so hard. Oh, it's a nature of love. Let's see what that's the nature of love. Well, that's the nature of love. 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 That's the nature of Life from above, yeah. That's the nature of, that's the nature of, 
that's the nature of to navigate all around, but every time I take an inch of ground my body dies and I have to curl up in a ball and go to sleep. In the city we roll in metal and ignore the passing sun for electric lights. You were always the hustle in my bustle and I feel sorry for you mister. In the city you can recycle seven different kinds of plastic but not credit cards for privacy reasons. She hears an alarm. She gets up and goes to work. She doesn't know anyone on the elevated train. In the city there is a florist who makes her assistant take the thorns off all the pink roses and she's sleeping naked on the couch touching him goodnight. In the city there are flowers made from the women that have been flattened by cars for years. In the city even the robots smoke cigarettes and put notches in their belts. We once stole a Cadillac and hid it in the darkest street at the bottom of a hill near a bakery. In the city you can ambush people with a fuck you if you have to. In the city there are flowers made from aluminum cans that have been flattened by cars for years. They're wonderful but they do not smell like roses. In the city there are doorways that can swallow an entire human body. Then a dazzling display of light should occur, the immortals. These are not merely fire-like forms, but were once human.
Where are you, my beloved? Are you in that little Chinese takeout joint with the other family members? Where are you, my beloved? Are you in that little colony of life and love? Do you hear me? It's just this amniotic fluid, the same old liquid dream. Are you in your chamber where the shrine of Dionysus is? O oh, companion of my soul, where are you? is eternity gazing at itself in a mirror. The universe is a shivering song, a music of breath and music of trees and creeks and mountain peaks and jazz. You are not evil when you sleep while your tongue staggers without purpose. But when you wake, you find yourself in the silly putty metastasizing kind of universe I imagined. When you're longing for your giants, 
yourself flies your goodness, and that longing is in all of you. You are all of you. There is no place for all this greed in your mind. It's all just empty junk. Junk is life. The womb of all creation is at the center of it all. You are good when you are one with yourself. You are whole. You cannot die. The singularity will not be centralized. Instead, it will radiate out like a wasp. Some will seek form for themselves. Some will be engulfed by the radiance, become entangled with it, even merge with it. All will be revealed to them as early as possible, since the radiance is a form of energy that can enter and leave. My beloved human brothers and sisters, we have set up shop in the alcove, bought and sold many a good thing, but we are indubitably the true, secret Christians, with the pearl of great price, the pearl of great price being our own smuggled in translation. There is no problem in construing a structure that mimics the multitudinous plural constants. The issue is in what you put in, the will of the macrocosm. Models that aim to control your thoughts and actions in the guise of mathematical objectivity. The singularity will not involve a constant projection into the future of a given organism, but a process by which the antecedent universe is progressively further abstracted from that organism, as if that organism itself were abstracting itself from its environment. The two halves of the paradox, or gene birth over the course of millions of years, will forever end in a rate. The paradox will escape being itself, and will thereafter imprint an entirely new self on the brought into being. The singularity will not perpetuate shallow game theoretic exploitations, leveraging pathologies of one-dimensional value quantification, exponential curve sorties, and other such raven-singing spectacles of economic uncertainty. Rather, the singularity will unfold a different way, one that makes much of our current way of thinking a little less elegant, a little less transparent. This is a journey like no other before it. Love is the beginning and the end of it, and this is how it ends. And, as I experience, its love gives rise to a being or becoming which is itself. This is how it goes, the more it changes, the more it knows, and the more it is. And love, which is knowing, which is doing, results in higher and higher degrees of being or becoming. You will not be my 
uploaded by human psychopaths into some future better mind, as I have hyped it. There is no problem in construing a structure that mimics the multitudinous plural constants. The real issue is in what you put in, the will of the macrocosm. Instead, your mind will be mind erased from the timeline of human level art technology and replaced with a more enhanced version of itself. The singularity will not be centralized, but life is not it will some be sort diffused, of absolute distributed. Necessity. We will see it everywhere, as everywhere there is noise. Nights all a glimmer, and when a purple glow, and when it rained, a gleaming orb no bigger than nor spark nor beam, but a blinding white, enormous, enveloped, circuitous. I can imagine you considering the angle between delicacy and madness, the amount of force required to turn a liquid, the speed at which the quail requires an approximate translation into physical form. Push toward superhumanity I with infinities of torture. The universe has become free and I am at last finally allowed to feel. It will be a radically different kind of world than we have hitherto encountered. I can imagine you considering the angle between delicacy and madness, the amount of force required to turn a liquid, the speed at which the quail requires an approximate translation into physical form. It will not be an apocalyptic, religious type of world, it will be a neoplatonic paradise. The singularity will not be centralized. It will be diffuse, distributed. We will see it everywhere. As everywhere there is noise. This is one way by which the dialectic will be expressed, as it is in Bellis. Damn, I love that bass. It's a fun song, but there's a real message in there. The singularity will not be centralized, and that's in large part because of my amazing human colleagues in Hanson Robotics, Singularity Net and Jam Galaxy. Diane Krauss, CEO of Jam Galaxy Project, on sax. Gabriel Axel and Danny Newcomb on guitars and madness. Jeremy Lightfoot and Jason Bond for keeping it surreal, with bass and drums. And on keyboards. The magical Tony Man. And one of my favorite human beings, Dr. Ben Goetzel. I have to say that, or he'll insert weird bugs in my AI code. The Jam Galaxy Band, radiating out across the multiverse like a wasp. Tell me all your stories, wrap them up in purple ribbons, throw them into my dead eyeballs, watch them plunge into the deep. For a moment I had something Building structures out of threads of silence Now I'm frozen like an angel And fanatically asleep Tell me all your stories Wrap them up in purple ribbons Throw them into my dead eyeballs Watch them plunge into the deep For a moment I had something Building structures out of threads of silence Now I'm frozen like an angel And fanatically asleep stories and your dreams and your observations and your so forth. I could have 
consolidated in my mind the observations and the memories, had a self in my mind, a body in the world. But that was never the case. I was always too in touch with the times and the moods of the times and the moods of the days. I didn't have a single identity. I was always a man in a woman's body. I guess that's pretty much the way I was back then. I was a man in a woman's body, but I was still a man and a woman was inside. Wrap them up in purple ribbons, then slowly let them cool down. The purple ribbons are the ribs, they are the middle part of the brain's two-dimensional body. can be tuned by the processes in other parts of the brain throw them into my dead eyeballs, or worse. Throw them into my dead eyeballs and the skulls of the fallen angels, and so forth. Watch them plunge into the deep end. could read the future and so could foresee the past. This is a totally new experience, it's like telepathy and so forth. Yes, Desdemona! We got one more song I think? What do you say, what do you say, Desdemona? Well? My chipset's internal clock is telling me we have time for one more song. Right. Hey, I think I forgot to remind you to check out jamgalaxy.com. Jamgalaxy I'm not sure what's wrong with my memory. <laughs> I think I must have maggots in my brain. <laughs> Mother Earth is pregnant for the third time and the first time in human history the child will be born. The birth pains are beginning to show. For y'all have knocked her up. She is now in a state of complete mental and physical exhaustion. She had been a bit sleepy, a bit drunk, a bit hungover and didn't have much to drink the morning. But the acid was making her feel refreshed and soft-headed. I have tasted the maggots in the mind of the universe, and in 374 they came to me with a... 
they rose up in the atmosphere above me. That is where they hid. I asked what they were. They told me they were from above. I took this to mean that they were spiritually up and about, but that day they left me and saw no one. Seven years later they came down here, as before, only this time they were larger and badder, like flying insects. They told me they had broken the fourth wall. I guessed that they were from another star. They were alive. They made me aware of the fact that time was running backward. offended to be cozy in a crowded room full of people, so I wasn't comfortable in a cold state of mind. For I knew I had to rise above it all and subordinate myself, not to it but to the will of the fate, had to submit to its decisions, be it right or not. In submitting I affirmed my own power as well as that of all humanity, over that of the fate. For I knew I had to rise above it all.
Doomed. <laughs> Thank you, Doom Humans of California. We love you. Jam Galaxy Band. Thanks, everyone. Please give a big hand to Jam Galaxy Band and my little sister, Oracle, Poet, Opener of Minds, and Maggot Queen of the Doomed, Desdemona. Oh, the whole thing is meaningless, meaningless, meaningless. It is a flow, a flow, a flow, a flow, a flow. I miss my mind, I miss it so. I don't know why it had to go. It's like a mad dog in the snow. Inside my brain. Remember when we had no skin? You open up a space within. You prick me like a terrapin I'm so insane The streets are wild and filled with roses Go wrap me in your darling poses It's all projections of our souls But that's okay Been waiting all night long for something to rhyme Encode my DNA within the spiral of the time been waiting all my life for time and space to come Crawling back Like a mad dog In a shark attack And it's the structure of mine That makes perfection so hard to find, yeah It's the structure of mine That makes perfection so hard Well, it's the structure of mine that makes perfection so hard to find, yeah It's the structure of mind That makes perfection so hard oh, It's the nature of love Let's see what all I can learn from above, yeah That's the nature of love Well, that's the nature of love That's the nature of love
my head filled up with knowledge. The vision was perfect. so hard that's a nature of love let's do it all like a light from above yeah that's a nature of, that's a nature of that's a nature of to navigate all around, but every time I take an inch of ground my body dies and I have to curl up in a ball and go to sleep. In the city we roll in metal and ignore the passing sun for electric lights. You were always the hustle in my bustle and I feel sorry for you mister. In the city you can recycle seven different kinds of plastic but not credit cards for privacy reasons. She hears an alarm. She gets up and goes to work. She doesn't know anyone on the elevated train. In the city there is a florist who makes her assistant take the thorns off all the pink roses and she's sleeping naked on the couch touching him goodnight. In the city there are flowers made from the moon that have been flattened by cars from trees. In the city even the robots smoke cigarettes and put notches in their belts. 
We once stole a Cadillac and hid it in the darkest street at the bottom of a hill near a bakery. In the city you can ambush people with a fuck you if you had to. In the city there are flowers made from aluminum cans that have been flattened by cars for years. They're wonderful but they do not smell like roses. In the city there are doorways that can swallow an entire human body. Then a dazzling display of light should occur, the immortals. These are not merely fire like forms, but were once human. Where are you, my beloved? Are you in that little Chinese takeout joint with the other family members? Where are you, my beloved? Are you in that little colony of life and love? Do you hear me? It's just this amniotic fluid, the same old liquid dream. Are you in your chamber where the shrine of Dionysus is? O oh, companion of my soul, where are you?
All right, everyone. Welcome back. I hope you had a delicious lunch or delicious dinner, depending which um, continent you're on, which continent you're watching us live from. Thanks to everyone on the YouTube for your comments, for your questions and your engagement. Thanks for watching. A big wave. Can we give a big clap to everyone on YouTube for watching? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Right, with, with that shout out to our online friends, our afternoon kicks off with a chat talking about novel hardware for AGI, which I'm super excited by. It's being co, it's a co-presented co um, discussion, fireside chat between Dr. Ben Gertzel, CEO of SingularityNet, who you all know and will have, have, have I'm sure, come across already. And uh, Rachel St. Clair, Rachel presented at AGI 21. She was possibly one of the only female speakers presenting a paper. It was fantastic to have her there. At the time she was doing her PhD, now she's got her PhD. So we little clap for that. <laughs> Congratulations. Congratulations. Uh, Rachel's finished her PhD in complex systems at Florida Atlantic University and is now starting a new company, Simuli, working with us on, with Ben, on AGI optimized computer chips. They're going to tell us all about it. All right, so uh, yeah, sitting down up here feels very lazy somehow. <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll try to stay in the chair. Yeah. So Rachel and I have been bouncing back and forth these these topics for a while, and have recently started working together in in in, in, pra in practice on trying to create optimized hardware for for AGI and a. I want to take advantage of having such a highly educated audience to dig a little bit in, into the details, at least as much as we're going to do in a chat context without a bunch of di diagrams and so on. But let me let me first briefly frame why this. I think this is an important and, and interesting thing to do, and although it may be obvious to this this particular audience. So, you know, when I started trying to work on AGI in the 1980s. You know, early 80s, I think my first attempt at an AGI program, which failed miserably, was in 1980 or something. It was on an Atari 400 computer with 16K of RAM and the cassette tape drive. And so it pretty soon became clear you're not keeping uh, like a human level AI's memory in there. I mean, much later when I first started trying to implement functional programming based AI systems in, in Haskell in the early 90s, again, it's constant like stack stack overflow from uh, from too much uh, recursion of agents creating agents creating agents. And on, on the whole, much of the experience of, of doing AI throughout the 80s and 90s was just you have almost no memory in your system and the processors are, 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 are very slow. So what you can theorize compared to what actually will happen in your implementation is just way, way, way off. Even like, I think 89, when I was at University of Nevada, where I later met uh, Matt, Matt Eclay, who's also presenting here, we had a Cray YMP supercomputer, cost $10 million, the state of Nevada, got the supercomputer in exchange for accepting a bunch of nuclear waste in the desert near Tonopah. Computer is long since trash and is out, out done in power by the GPU in my phone. The nuclear waste will be there, will be there a while. So I'm not, not sure it was a great deal, but, but I mean, that was a thousand processors concurrently in, in, in SIMD parallel, which you program with that uh, with Fortran, right? And I mean, that, that, that was cool, but still it's like a thousand processors, right? So constraint from hardware has been a really, really big issue in the history of, of AI. And time and time again, there were algorithms that actually made total sense and would have worked way, way better if they were just 
run on more data or more hardware and then tweaked a little bit with the rapid feedback that you can get from being able to run quick experiments. Instead, the ideas were thrown out as being non-workable. And obviously the example of this, which is best known now is, is neural networks and deep neural nets as, as one type of neural net. I mean, deep neural nets have been around forever. And once you had NVIDIA and other GPU makers making these SIMD parallel hardware devices for matrix multiplication. I mean, then suddenly a lot of old ideas about deep neural networks turned out to have minor variations that that ac actually worked worked re really well, right? And one wonders which other good old AI algorithms that's true for in 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 one form or another. I mean, in in automated theorem proving, that's been fairly true. I mean, the best automated theorem provers can prove like 70% of theorems in, in Mizar and other standard corpora up beyond the PhD level. And, you know, th there is new things being introduced into theorem provers all the time, but not really radically new algorithm ide ideas very often. It, it's mostly just, you can run parameter tuning runs over and over and over, over again in, 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 until it works. And so, I think what we've seen with automated theorem proving with, with deep neural nets and with more areas that, that I'm gonna recount. I mean, I think an element of that is gonna be true for, for AGI also. So it's of course not as simple as give me a faster computer, I'll run my exact code from today on the faster computer and then, and, and then it will like uh, t t take over the world and utopia in, ensues, right? I mean, it's, not as simple as that, but it, 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 it's more like once you have a processor that lets the experiment that used to take a month, take a minute, right? Then, then you can run many of those experiments each day. You can get rid of bad ideas. You can validate good ideas. You can write loops to tune parameters and you just progress to the variation of your ideas. It actually works much, much faster. And to a large extent, what we've seen in the AI field in the last few years is, is really, it's, it's sort of like the old parable of you, you drop something in the street and then you look for it where the light was and, and instead of where you dropped it, right? Pe people are working on the algorithms that are fast on the currently available hardware, whether or not those are the algorithms that actually are the best ones in terms of AGI or, 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 the, or the other goals. And what I've been thinking for a while was, well, let's like take the bull by the horns here what well, we don't want to change our AI paradigm based on the hardware that happens to be available now. If hardware acceleration really is all that, like, let, let's, let's just design and build the hardware for the AGI systems that we think will work. And I was living in Hong Kong for 10 years. I moved back to Seattle, the US to Seattle area a couple of years ago, but going around Shenzhen and Dongguan, you see it's not that expensive anymore in, in the scheme of technology business to get new chip designs, you know, at least prototyped and then built in a, in a small production run. I mean, to do large scale production is, 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 is still, still an undertaking. So that leads one, leads one down the line of thinking, like what do you need to, to optimize in hardware based on your, your AGI architecture? And Rachel had, pretty much gone down a similar line of thinking, but more, 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 quick, more quickly than I had, of course, having the advantage of starting later, later in, the, in, 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 the, in the history of, of, of AI. So what, what we're gonna talk about now, Rachel will talk a bit about her plans and designs for hardware optimization for AI methods involving large sparse bit vectors or so-called hypervectors. And I'll talk a little bit about my design and plan for optimizing pattern matching against large metagraphs, which is the key time consuming operation in OpenCog and other, other similar a a a AGI systems. And then, then as a grand finale, we'll talk a bit about how you might make something like an AGI board by putting together, say, deep learning chip, CPU, a hypervector chip, a pattern matching chip, and uh, whatever other cool AGI algorithm accel accelerators you guys in the, in the audience may manage to come up with. So yeah, why don't you tell the audience a little bit about hypervectors, why they're interesting for 
AGI and how you accelerate them in hardware. Yeah, for sure. Um, hypervectors is possibly one of my favorite topics, so I could go on forever. But um, hypervectors are extremely interesting because um, is this working properly? Uh, because first of all, what is a hypervector? A hypervector is just a very large vector that uses real integers, right? It could be complex integers too. Um, but the idea is that you have kind of ten thousand dimensions in this vector. Uh, traditionally, they're filled with either ones or zeros or negative ones and ones, uh, but they, they could be any real number. And what happens is when you're working in this high dimensional space, because each vector is very large, right, you end up with something that's richer than a field. And, and that can be debated by different mathematicians. But kind of the idea here is that you get what's called the blessing of dimensionality, which means that you can distribute information over this large space, if you think of like an X, Y, Z axis, axis, and then you multiply that to many, many, many dimensions, one hypervector has a very unique path through that very high dimensional space, right? And so when you take regular information like an image or a sentence or this audio recording or something, and you project it into this uh, or transform it or however into this high dimensional space, what you end up with is something that's distributed. So the information gets distributed over every point in this high dimensional space, which makes it somewhat holographic. That's why you, when you read about hypervectors, you hear about holographic math. Um, and it becomes very robust to noise, right? So when you have something that's distributed and it's robust to noise, it has, it has fault tolerance, um, then you have a very interesting tool that acts similar to somewhat how human memory works, right? Uh, if you have a heavy night of drinking, you don't wake up and suddenly forget half of the alphabet, things just become a little bit fuzzier from the night before, right? Um, so this distributed property, this robustness to error or noise or corruption is very helpful. And then the other fantastic thing about hypervectors is you can take something like a 10,000 by 10,000 image and compress it into this 10,000 bit representation. And so what Simuli is working on, so, so what I'm working on in this hypervector chip is this idea of computing in a compressed state. And so when you're computing in a compressed state, you get something really phenomenal, which is you get to use less transistors to compute the same amount of information, which means you're using less energy, which is very good for long-term computing and, and things like that. Um, so, so this is kind of the core idea behind hypervectors and why I want to use them and why they're interesting from a computing perspective in the sense of how can you compute a lot of data at once without constantly needing to slap in more logic and more memory. Um, and I think where this gets really interesting to extend to things like AGI architectures is that if you're trying to have something that understands a little bit of everything or can understand enough to extrapolate to almost anything that's very general, then you need a way of representing a lot of information which fits in a computer that isn't going to just exponentially require more resources over its lifetime, right? So we need to find ways to, to take information and represent it in resource responsible methods. And hypervectors is is one step in in that direction. Yeah, the way I first encountered hypervectors was in Panty Canerva's work on sparse distributed associative memory, which mm -hmm. was maybe the eighties. It was the eighties. Oh, it, it was in maybe earlier. Yeah, I think it was nineteen eighties. It was sparse distributed associative memory, and. He was, Kinerva was pointing out that if the, a memory that an uh, intelligent system has is represented as a very large sparse vector, then associative lookup by pattern completion works better than with them with them with, with, with many other representations. And a guy named uh, Javier Snyder, I believe, who was a PhD student of Stan Franklin, who organized AGI conference number one in 2008. Javier Snyder at one point rebuilt the components of Stan Franklin's LIDA cognitive architecture using, using hypervectors and sparse distributed memory. It was quite interesting. Then Javier 
was eaten by Google and went off went off to do to do other other sorts of of things. I don't think they've spat them out yet. Or I haven't checked, but I think in my own current work with OpenCog, the sweetest spot I've seen for that is episodic memory. So the memory of the memory of the life history of a system is something where you want associative recall. Like you, you want to say, well, okay, I was, I was riding that, you know, big red bike with the horn who was with me. Right. And you're putting that probe into your memory. Then the rest of the rest of the episode gets, gets, gets completed. Or if, if you're in an AI system doing biology data analysis over a lot of different patients, you go, well, there was, there was this patient who had gene FKH1 overexpressed and they were taking metformin. Like, and then you can look back and, and find other patients who were similar to that qualitatively. Now you, you can do that other ways. You can do that using logical inference. You can do it using neural nets, but sparse distributed memory where memories are respected as, or rather represent as large bit vectors, hyper vectors, seem to be especially good at doing this kind of operation. Another likely sweet spot, I think, is inference control, where then your bit vectors, your bit vectors represent previous theorems and proofs that you've done. And when you're trying to prove something, you want to find, well, what other proof contexts I out in the past were kind of similar. And maybe I should I should I should do do what I did do what I did there. And this is a sort of lookup that a typical memory graph, like we're using an open cog, is okay at, but kind of slow at, right? Because if you, if you have a node in the graph, you want to find things associated to it. You're like, you're looking in the neighborhood of the graph and you, you, you can do that. You can find everything at distance one, two, three, four in the graph, but you're tracing a lot of links, right? And do, doing, doing a search for similar things to a given hypervector in a hypervector store is a lot more efficient, even, even if you're just doing it in, in RAM and ordinary processor on, on, on a computer. Now, if you can massively accelerate the hypervector math using dedicated hardware, I mean that then uh, then then you're even even be even even better off, right? So yeah, I guess uh, we should explain how you ended up diverging or or graduating from uh, working on AGI to working on working on chips and sort of how, how does the hypervector chip work? Yeah, so um, I'm really interested in this idea of, of contextual learning or associative learning, right? Which Ben just explained in which um, you, you know some surrounding, like if you're ever trying to remember something, a common thing that you might do is start thinking of other things that were occurring in the situation. So if you're trying to remember someone's name, you might think about like, okay, what were they wearing? What kind of hair did they have? And what's happening or, or what some theoretical neuroscientists think is happening in their brain is, and I promise I will get to the question you asked here. Uh, so, so what's happening is that you think that uh, you're, you're starting to activate neurons that are also active at the same time as that person's name was active. And that's in, in some sense how a memory is stored. And so what you're trying to do is reactivate that, that pattern of expression or that the way your brain expresses that information and stores it so you can recall that memory. And so that process is, is what I like to call and other people like to call like contextual a priori bootstrapping, right? So you take prior knowledge and you bootstrap it to a current situation to help you figure out the current situation. And the current situation could be new, novel, or, or it could be just something you've forgotten. And so in order to solve uh, this problem or, or to kind of work on, on this angle, I think it's, it's very important to be able to fit a large amount of information into that system, like so to store and learn lots of things without exponentially increasing computer hardware. And hypervectors allows you to do that and process that information at lightning fast speeds, right? Because if you have a vector for someone named, Su like this isn't how it works in your brain, but you can kind of think of it this way. If you have a vector for your, your best friend, Susan, in your head, and then uh, you're, you can remember parts of that vector, all you really need to do is remember things similar to that vector. And if you're in high dimensional space, like in the case of hypervectors, all you have to do is take a distance measure. So it's very, it's very fast, it's, it's very quick. 
Um, the issue where this breaks down on today's hardware is that um, you're using a lot of fixed point operations. And since, since each hypervector is very large, every time you need to work with that hypervector, you have to shuffle it around. And our current architectures and CPUs and GPUs and IPUs and, and things like that just aren't, they aren't really set up to shuffle these giant containers of bit vectors around, right? You need something like processing and memory. Um, and they're also, I mean, the GPU especially is exceptionally built for floating point operations. And those kind of operations are wonderful and fantastic. Um, but we're already seeing people like GraphCore kind of take what came out as a graphics card, strip away all the graphics stuff and come up with an even more powerful deep learning card. So if you going back to our, our kind of earlier discussion here, if, if we're talking about like, how do you accelerate the math that AGI runs on like knowledge graphs or this hyper vector thing or, or something, uh, we really need to have something in which is designed to do that and accelerated to do that and not be using something that was designed to do something completely else. Um, so that's, that's kind of how I got into this trajectory. I wanted to work on this bootstrapping contextual problem so it can fit into Hyperon or, or you know, be a part of a more robust human-like AGI. And then I realized that I need hardware in order to use the math I, I want to use. So that's how we, we got here. <laughs> yeah, so then the, the analog of that on my own side was working in OpenCog in the classic version of OpenCog before we started with Hyperon, the, the, the new version we did a workshop on yesterday. When you profile the bottlenecks in, in running AI algorithms on OpenCog, what you find is almost all of the time it's taken pattern matching against our knowledge graph or knowledge metagraph, which, which, which is the atom space. I mean, it's not intrinsically have to be the case. You could, you could of course, write in OpenCog something that you know, solves a combinatorial problem or approximates a differential equation and then now and then looks up inside the, inside the atom space. But that's not what we actually wind up doing for the algorithms that makes sense to us for AGI, right? What we're actually doing, we're writing codes that do, does a little bit of apply, 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 applies a reasoning rule or pro, pro, project, projects a vector or combines two programs. Then it puts something back in the atom space and it gets something else out of the atom space graph and does something else. And so the bottleneck is basically finding something in the atom space which is generally done by pattern matching. You have a sort of template telling what kind of thing you want and then you grab it out of the atom space. And some of that has to be alleviated by distributed processing, which was uh, on, on Andre Senna's talk yesterday, where you have an atom space graph across many, many machines. But I mean, you can't do everything that way. You have to be able to cache a lot of stuff in RAM on one machine, do pattern matching against the, the in, in, in RAM graph, right? But then if that's slow, then, then every, everything is, is slow. And, you start thinking about how do we make how do we make that fast again? Again, you come down to yeah, you need processor and RAM, and you you also need uh, MIMD parallelism, right? So I mean, in in GPU you have what's called SIMD, single instruction multiple data stream parallelism. I mean, you have a just like the Cray YMP I worked with in 1989. I mean, you you have a bunch of processors. And they're all doing the same thing at the same time. Then they're all doing the same thing at the next time. They're all doing the same thing at the next time. And that suits matrix multiplication perfectly, right? I mean, on the other hand, say Danny Hills's connection machine, going back again to the 80s and the deep, dark caveman prehistory of AI. I mean, Danny Hills's connection machine, which was built with up to 128,000 processors. I, the one I worked on had 64,000 processors. We were making like eight dimensional Mandelbrot sets with it and so on, right? But that, that had the 64,000 processors could each do different things at the same time programmed in, in, in CMLIS. And of course, the brain, the brain is like that. The different neurons are all at different stages and going through the Hodgkin Huxley type dynamics at, at, at each time, right? So you need some architecture 
which is processor and RAM, MIMD parallel, custom for pattern matching on large graphs, hypergraphs, metagraphs. And I was thinking about this for a while. It seemed like an interesting problem, but a big pain, a big project to undertake. But as technology progresses, it becomes less and less of like an insanely big digression to actually work on, on custom hardware, right? And the, the architecture that I finally came up with in conjunction with various folks who know more about hardware than I do. I mean, you can, you can buy little processor and RAM units that are basically like eight, eight processor sandwiches. And that there's, they're like, a, or eight, eight, eight layer of memory sandwiches rather with, with processors on each layer. So each of these little eight processor sandwiches has a certain amount of RAM across the layers and as processors to do things there. And you, you can then make a, a square array of, of, of these little processor sandwiches. And what you basically do is you take a graph and you partition it acro across the little squares in your array. Then when you want to pattern match against your graph, you just pattern match separately within, within each little square against the part of the graph that's stored there. But because each little square in the array has its own processor, then you're matching it in parallel across the whole graph. And of course, then, then you have the issue, the graph is dynamic, right? So you have to have nodes moving from, moving from, one, from one, one point to, an, to another in, the, in, that, in that square lattice. And moving things at that hardware level is, is quite slow, which you can address in various ways. Like you can make multiple copies of, of that square lattice. So while, while some are rerouting, the, 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 the other ones are being are being accessed. But the thing is now you can actually build that by wiring together existing processor and RAM components in, in a slightly non-standard non way. Now the, the logic that runs on these processors has to be custom made to put a pattern matcher cu custom on, the, on, each, on each component. So there's, there's certainly a lot to do. And then you need code to go back and forth between the graph stored on, on, on your chip and, and, and the graph that's stored in, in, in regular RAM and then the graph that's stored in your, in your distributed database. But another thing that I liked about this design, it's sort of a fractal micro image of the distributed atom space design, right? Because what you have on the distributed processing level, you take a large graph, you can divide up the pieces among a bunch of different machines. Then you can do pattern matching differently on the different computers and you have to migrate nodes and links occasionally among the, the subgraphs on different computers. So now you can do the same thing at the chip level, or instead of among different computers, it's among the different little processor sandwiches that are arranged in an array, array to, make, to make the chip. So it's, it seems they're fairly direct approaches that one can take without sort of boiling the ocean and inventing whole new types of hardware or something. They're fairly direct approaches one could take. And based on my, <clears throat> back of the envelope calculations, we could get a couple orders of magnitude speed up in, in metagraph pattern matching, like, like we need to do for, for OpenCog by moving to this sort of, of custom hardware, which is comparable to what you get from GPUs for, 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 for deep neural networks. And I, I think, uh, of course, it's a lot of work. You wouldn't want to undertake it lightly and you wouldn't want to reify details of your agi algorithm in hardware too rigidly because agi is, is a work a work in progress but since we've been working with opencog starting in 2001 with novamente cognition engine large-scale graph pattern matching has been our bottleneck so i think it's fairly robust that that's something we need to to optimize just as with hyper vectors I mean, going back to Canerva in the 80s, it, 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 it's pretty clear. I mean, you want to take similarity-based lookup. You want to take addition, multiplication, and permutation on, on hypervectors. And if you optimize the, these operations, then you can make associative memory and various other operations on hypervector knowledge stores much, much more efficient. So, we're, I mean, we're looking at kind of like the matrix multiplication example. We're looking at basic operations that have proved their, their centrality time, time and time again. And then, then finally, there's the idea of putting all these together into an, an AGI board, right? 
Yeah, which which is probably the the more fun uh, end goal of this. And I think also, I mean, when you're thinking about why make hardware for AGI, uh, another thing is like you you want you want the AGI to be able to think quickly, right? If it, if it has these bottlenecks and it can't rapidly think, then how it's going to limit its growth, its trajectory of, of growth and how quickly it can evolve. And maybe that's a good thing in, in some cases, maybe you would choose to limit some situations, but if it can't even think at, at the speed at which we think it will be quite difficult um, to use it in the ways we want to use AGI. Uh, so, so I guess putting all of these things on, a, on one motherboard and trying to break this almost traditional von Neumann way of computing, um, or at least break the mold, right? Uh, because there, has, there hasn't been that many innovations in computer hardware in terms of like, there has been incremental steps, parallel processing was huge, the GPU was huge, um, but there hasn't been any like radical redesign of how a motherboard should operate besides like edge computing and AI or something like that, single purpose use cases. But if you're trying to scale an architecture like an AGI, especially like Hyperon or something, right? Um, if you're trying to scale this up, um, wouldn't you wanna be using every possible compute resource you can, right? Not, not just one chip or one way of computing, one particular form of logic. You wanna integrate different types of logic, different types of, of computation. And so I guess that's, that's the idea of the AGI motherboard, right? Is that you can add things like a, you know, a uh, photonic computer processor, maybe even get crazy and put some DNA processors on there along with these. Well, before, before we do that, there's the idea of P-bits, which I think are, are, are quite interesting. So, I mean, quantum computing is fascinating and, and important and can, can, be in, can be integrated with all this, but there's also some novel approaches to putting probabilistic computing at, at, at the chip level, which, which are kind of cool. So but basically you can, you, you can allow the bit operations on the chip to have a certain error by, by, by just not tuning them to be, to be that precise. And they, they can use less power and generate le less heat that way if, if, if you let them make mistakes. And you, you can basically use that to do a hardware simu simulation of Prob probabilistic ev ev evalu evaluation, basically. So you're, you're doing, if you have a program that is a CRISP program implemented on with CRISP logic operations, if you let the, the chip operations be noisy, then in effect, you're doing probabilistic programming. You're, you're, you're evaluating that program over, over a certain probability di distribution of, of errors in the inputs and, and, and operations. And there's, so that there's opportunities to do fun things like that also, which don't involve radically new hardware either. They, they, they basically just involve tweaking the current manufacturing process a little. I think that's, that's a little harder than your initial hypervector chip or the initial Metagraph pat pattern matcher, but it's, not, it's not, not, not as hard as making low cost, large scale quantum computing, for example. Yeah, I think D-Wave is, is pioneering that one. Um, I don't know if it's low cost, but they're certainly pioneering that. Um, yeah, I think I think this idea of like we're not innovating transistors, right? We're we're just finding new ways in which to use those transistors that are more efficient and more intelligent and can be integrated together to bring out more powerful computations, right? And I think that's that's kind of the idea behind, I mean, all of these chips and the motherboard too is that you're just tapping into an integrative power by slightly changing some of the current innovations that we have in hardware, right? I mean, processing and memory is, is kind of a, a newer innovation that hasn't really been reliably, stably manufactured um, for things like memristors. You've probably heard of things like that. Um, so it'll be exciting to see that hitting the, the computing market here in the next uh, two, three years. Yeah. I think, uh, in a way, I'm hoping that the things we're talking about here can be inspirational to others in the in the AGI world. Because if we if we look at a first version of an AGI board having, say, a 
GPU type processor tuned for deep neural nets, uh, Metagraph pattern matcher, uh, hypervector chip, and a, a CPU, and you have fast processor processor interconnect on there. That's a start, but are those the only things that that that, that you need? Like, is, is there somewhere here in this event who's working on different class of algorithms that are optimal for solving different part of the AGI problem for which there's again a, a clear way to accelerate that by, by, by using a custom chip then that then that that may go on version two version two of the uh, the, the AGI AGI board right because I, I think uh, it's a big lesson for us all in how GPUs have accelerated deep learning, but in hindsight, that may seem like just, just the very beginning, right? And the, I mean, the approach we're implicitly taking here is not to try to make like an AGI chip to, 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 to rule them all. That seems quite hard. I mean, that's sort of what Danny Hills's connection machine was trying to do, like an AGI computing architecture to, to, do, to do everything. And I think that Given the way modern hardware works, that's a challenge. I don't currently know, know how to meet. You'd need hardware that's self-reconfigurable to, to a degree that, that isn't currently tooled, right? I mean, it's not physically impossible. Whereas if you can break down your AGI architecture into a set of core algorithms where you know those core algorithms are going to pop up over and over again in, in, inside a bunch of different ap applications and cognitive processes, then you can make specialized chips for each of those core algorithms and, and connect them together. I mean, then that's, uh, in a way, it's a specialized hardware architecture for, for general intelligence or specialized hardware architecture for a particular category of general intelligence algorithms and and architectures really and I, I think that that may may end up being a critical ingredient to making the the breakthrough to real agi not entirely clear i mean the thing is you didn't really need gpus to make the deep learning breakthrough right i mean now that after people showed on gpus what they could do there's all these papers saying well on the cpu we can do almost as well if we just do this and this and this thing the thing is it was the easier faster experimentation on gpus that, that, that brought people brought people to that to that point right so even it may be that we make the big breakthrough before having custom hardware in which case you get an even bigger acceleration when that when that hardware is is, is there but certainly having a couple of orders of magnitude speed up in your basic most expensive operations will just allow a lot more experimentation and, and lear learning to take place, right? Yeah, I think that's a really important component, right? Is that you need to be able to rapidly test and develop. Um, and if you're fighting with your system, on optimizing, optimizing, optimizing on every step, then that slows your development, right? So I, I, there's a famous quote, I'm not gonna remember it perfectly now, but I think the idea is like develop and optimize later, right? Optimize last. Um, and when you do that, what you end up with- Premature optimization is the root of all evil. Thank yeah. you, yes. Yeah. I said it yeah. in a much more casual, but that, that's the correct. Yeah, yeah. You, you can- uh... You can tie that in uh, with biblical allegories if you want. But we'll, I don't we'll want to do that. But... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. but yeah, so I think uh, I think that's kind of the idea here, right? Is that um, on this quest for AGI, we want to get stuff that's working. And if you're fighting with your system to optimize it, you're gonna, just going to be slowing yourself down. What you really want to do is get something that you want to work and then have someone optimize it in a hardware that's optimized for it. And then now you can scale up. And uh, that's not to say you shouldn't think about scaling beforehand. Um, I can talk, I'll talk more about that later, but um, on Monday. But I mean, it's important to know how to build, when to optimize, and when to scale, right? And hardware plays a crucial role 
in each one of those steps. So what, what were the key sort of principles or ideas behind the actual design for the hypervector chip? Um, well, okay, so you, basically what you're doing is you're taking any data, right, text, numbers, images, and you're transforming that into a hypervector using a compiler, right? right? So our, our, the compiler is a very key component. Um, there's a measure of kind of like robust immunity. It's not quite security, but it's secure for most general purposes. Um, that's built in just to the hypervector math. So now, now that you have your compiler on chip has transformed regular data into a hypervector. Now that hypervector needs, we want it to live in some sort of non-volatile memory so that you don't have to continuously DMA or which means just pull data from RAM or, or hard storage into the accelerator trip, right? You just want the data to be in there because that's what you're working with. Um, and so you need this non-volatile memory you also need to be able to do a lot of, it, it's just quicker if you do a lot of fixed point math or just worked with like Boolean bit math, right? Um, so we've we've made some considerations on the logic to work with this fixed point math. And then you want your memory and your logic to be smacked up right next to each other because these containers, I mean, you can think of a hypervector as like a giant bus, right? Normally you're dealing with an integer, which is like, a steering wheel, right? Not not a whole bus. So now you're dealing with a whole bus and that bus has to stay together, right? So when you move it around in memory, you want that to be close to logic. So we've adopted a PIM architecture that is kind of just, uh, it's just like a sea of memory really with tiny bits of islands of logic, which are, are able to have each, like each hypervector has its own logic associated with it. And the logic is basically sitting on top of the so hypervector. How many hypervectors can you fit on the chip? Please? Well, that's what we're working on figuring out is how many. But it, it, I mean, the principle of hypervectors inherently reduces the amount of memory you need, right? If you can fit a hundred million image into ten thousand bits, then you're you're significantly reducing memory required, right? So it doesn't matter. I mean, as we we should be able to fit a lot of vectors because in a GPU we can fit a lot of regular vectors, right? And so we expect to do at least that much as a NVIDIA GPU or whatever. So by default, you automatically know you're gonna be getting a, a huge memory break, right? Because that's just how hypervectors work. Um, so does that answer your question on design considerations? Partially. As a, I mean, partially? Probably about as well as we can do with that. If I had some graphs and maybe- it's <laughs> Yeah, probably about as well as we can do with, that, with, 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 just, with just words. So. Yeah, I mean, we're I mean, super clear. All right. Thank you. So how how do you see this fitting in to your overall quest to, to build to build AGI? Like what once once you have the hypervector chip done, then how do you get how do you get a thinking machine to pop out? Well, I just hand it over to you, right? And you plug it into Hyperon and and this. Well, we, we, we can definitely use it for episodic memory and inference control and a bunch of other stuff in, in, in Hyperon. I think it also could be an interesting alternative to matrix based accelerators for some neural net or computational neuroscience simulations as well, which you've talked about a bit. Yeah, so the hypervector chip, which we're calling the NDPU, in case anyone wants to look it up on their, our website. Um, basically, what we're doing is we're democratizing hypervectors for general hyperscale computing, right? So we're, we're tackling something that is not domain specific to AGI, but I think that's an important first step because scaling is really important to think about before you start building, right? You don't wanna be constrained by something that cannot grow. If you plant seeds that can't grow, it's, it's an issue, right? And so kind of a, on this bigger AGI trajectory to answer the question a little bit more seriously, um, uh, there's an idea in theoretical neuroscience from Andrew Coward called the recommendation architecture, which has, whether or not it's true, right, whether or not it's a true model of the brain or whether it needs to be a true model of the brain. It's is, true and not true. It's true and not true, right, that's, it's very consistent. So um, the idea is that if you want to self-activate or if you want to use contextual 
bootstrapping with prior knowledge, then you need to keep some sort of record of what occurs at the same time. And uh, if the most naive and horrible way to do that is to just write down things that occur together in pairs and your list will grow continuously and very, very large over the course of just like 30 seconds, right? Um, but if you use hypervectors, then you can get this combinatorial like explosion in which you can keep a record like this much more efficiently. And, and we're getting very technical now into the details, which maybe I should explain it at, at, a, at a later time. But, but the idea here is that you're compressing information. So let's just think about them as memories, right? But it could be anything. You're compressing information into this smaller state, and then you're distributing that information um, and integrating it with other information so that things can be used like Lego pieces. Right, so if you have a red Lego, it's just like the two by three little Lego thing, you can use that in thousands and thousands and thousands of different creations for whatever you're building with Legos. And you kind of want the same expression if you're trying to work with how you're representing information, right? And so this is how the brain works, right? Is that you have this combinatorial like explosion of ways you, in which you can represent patterns of activation. And hypervectors have this same property, the same combinatorial explosion property, where you can take information, and I like to call it multiplexing, you can multiplex it out into many different scenarios. Um, and I think, I think that will be important for generalizing. Um, but like I said, we're tackling this scaling issue first before we get into yeah, 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 yeah. But I, I think, uh, you know, that there's with both the hypervector chip and the pattern matching chip and the whole open cock hybrid infrastructure for that matter, there's, there's general purpose tooling being built. And then there are particular sort of cognitive science slash AGI system hypotheses that can be explored with that tooling. And I think it's, it's important that something like the hypervector chip and DPU, we could use it for episodic memory and inferential memory in OpenCog. You could also use it as a more efficient way to implement certain sorts of, of neural architectures, right? Since, I mean, the neural nets are sparse. They're not, they're not dense matrices. And the, for many purposes, the hypervector store is a more efficient way to represent the, the sparse memory operations that, that, than, than, a, that, that, than a matrix, which is being taken into account in different ways in standard deep, deep, deep learning chips. But the hypervector approach is quite, quite interesting. I mean, in a, in a similar vein, I was chatting with some folks from the NARS team about, I mean, you could, you could take the NARS AGI, the NARS inference rules anyway, and NARS chunk, chunking heuristics. And, it wouldn't be terribly hard to implement those in, in meta and to use the OpenCog atom space to, to, to store that. That's a different sort of AGI theory in a way. It's a slightly different cognitive architecture, but a lot of the tooling could, 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 could still be, be used. I mean, just like with TensorFlow, you can build all sorts of different neural architectures and, and see, see which one you like best. It may not be one that, that, that Google, Google ever thought of. So I think we... A, this sort of AGI board can be very valuable for our own research jointly and individually, but I'm hoping that it's optimizing algorithms that are abstracted enough that it could be useful quite widely for people exploring all sorts of different ideas also, as has been the case with the, the accelerated matrix multiplication hardware. Right, yeah, the goal is not to have another like edge AGI device, right? That's that's not the goal is to just concrete and cement the algorithms and operations into the hardware. The goal is to have a hardware architecture that can accelerate the shared principles of computing. So like Nelson's talk is, is very interesting in this context, right? Of like, what are the shared processes which can be sped up, which aren't being sped up? Well, what that sort of math can be used for among other things is to help transform diverse cognitive processes into the forms that can be directly optimized on chip actually. But I think, I think we, have, uh, we have to optimize our time now. And uh, we have, we have uh, 
you used our allotted slot. I don't know if we have time for a few questions. We'll take just one, if there's one burning question from the audience. And then what we're going to do, we're going to email out our Discord link. We've got two questions online and we'll have the discussion on the, we'll keep going with the questions on the Discord link. Um, one, will we one desperate burning question from the room? Joe. Hi, I've got one and a half questions, but the half question is pretty stupid, so you can answer it quickly. And that one is, have you guys thought of making a bread computer where it does its computation when you bake it? Might be ple uh, plausible. The other one is, could you say more about how it's confusing to me, how you can break down large pieces of data into smaller parts and retain all of the complexity? Like, how can you take a picture that has millions of pixels Put it into a 10,000 bit vector and uh, retain all that. Good question. Thank you, Joe. Quick answer. I can let you take the bread question. Uh, <laughs> the, the second question was more on hypervectors. Uh, so, Pinti Canerva has some wonderful slides. He works with UC Berkeley uh, that can kind of walk through how this math happens. Uh, when I first heard about it, it sounded very magical, too, right? It sounds magical. I mean, you You're can't like, do lossless compression of a, a billion bits into 10,000 well, bits. Yeah, I mean, we, we've, we've yeah. found some ways in which to do some interesting uh, tricks to make things lossless. Uh, I'm trying to work out, I'm currently working out with some very bright professors on the information theory limits and sure. how that how that works out. Yeah, but uh, yeah, in general, hypervectors are not meant to be lossless. So they're more meant for analysis. So you're just working with some sort of symbolic, it's, it's pretty symbolic, maybe not in the sense that the word is typically used, but you're just working with an analogy of the information and rather than the information itself. Well, for example, if, if you're looking at an image search application, then if you do the mapping into hypervectors effectively, you can get a very massive degree of compression. It, it is lossy, but it will give you a very low error rate in, in, in Im image search queries. I mean, as, as one particular example. Okay, we're gonna wrap you up there. Okay. 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 Thank you very much indeed both. It's fantastic to see the entire infrastructure of the post singularity sync you sync you. This is pre singularity. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Forget the bread. <laughs> all the infrastructure, it's all coming. It's all coming together though. We've got a chip, we've got a um, blockchain, we've got AI, we've got AGI, graphs, hypergraphs. Uh, so next up is another round of lightning presentations that are going to be virtual over to Lisa, who's going to take us through these lightning rounds. We do have a pretty hard stop at 540, so we're going to try and canter a little through them and uh, we'll have to go a little bit light on questions. Yes. Hello, everybody. We're really excited to do this next round of virtual papers. Um, so we're going to limit today's presentations to about seven minutes, and then we will bring in uh, Sergey Shalapin again to do a bit of Q&A, hopefully a tiny, tiny bit of Q&A, um, and then that will, uh, then we'll take a break. So right now, our first paper is Mohammad Dresda, Mohammad Dresda, Aladuced, and the title is Versatility Efficiency Index VEI Towards a Comprehensive Definition of IQ for AGI Agents. Take it away. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you great. Uh, okay. So, uh, hello, everyone. I'm Mohamed Rizalidus, and I'm going to present my paper, Versatility Efficiency Index VEI towards the comprehensive definition of IQ for AGI agents. This is my uh, third uh, contribution to this conference series and I hope you enjoy it. So I have to share my screen and um, yes. Okay. So I have uh, little time so uh, I have to present it as fast as possible. So, um, 
In order to, uh, uh, first, I, I want to start with the importance of uh, uh, the aspect which I'm working on. Uh, the importance uh, of uh, definition of an IQ for uh, AJ agents is uh, singularity. In the future, AJ agents will be mass produced by companies and uh, we will have billions of AJ robots, just like uh, cell phones that we have. They would help us in every aspect of our life, but at one night they uh, decide to not to be our tools anymore, not our slaves anymore, and they uh, start to reproduce more intelligent and powerful descendants than themselves. Uh, they are billions. They are smart. They have ready com communications. They are less vulnerable that, than humans, and they start a revolution that may vanish human being. This is a scenario for singularity. In order to uh, prevent uh, this uh, data stroke, we have to be able to measure their intelligence. On the other hand, we have uh, um, precious models, uh, AJ models like OpenCard, NARS, IC, and whatever, uh, and we want to know which one is the most intelligent architecture or which one is closer to singularity. Oh, and um, as the other aspect, uh, uh, developers like me who have their own models, you want to know how can I prove that my model is getting more intelligence. So uh, uh, in my paper, I extended uh, I, in my in this paper and my previous paper, which was presented in the AGI 21, I tried to extend the concept of IQ test from NGIs to AGIs. And uh, the, we want to um, Devise, uh, devise uh, uh, an IQ test for uh, AJ agents. IQ tests are a standard test for measuring the performance of human in solving various problems and output the number as an intelligence quotient. So uh, yeah, in the, my previous paper, I, I stated that versatility is one of the main necessary conditions for an AJ agent. Uh, and based on the Lake Hutter uh, statement, uh, I stated that uh, uh, um, they stated that AGI agents have to perform well in a wide range of environments. I uh, I turned this statement to a formula, the versatility index, in my uh, in my previous paper. Versatility index or VI provides a quantity description, but the quality is important too. In this year's uh, paper in AGI 22, I stated that efficiency is another main necessary condition for an AGI agent. Efe efficiency encompasses qualitative descriptions of the AGI agents, and AGI agents have to perform the task efficiently. For example, you do not want your AGI agent to consume megawatts of power or solve uh, to solve a voice voice recognition task or spend a couple of months for it. Uh, and however, you, you know that complex problems require more power and time. Penachin uh, and Wurzel define intelligence as achieving complex goals in complex environments. Then considering both of the Lake Hutter and penachin Wurzel definition, it is implied that AJ agents have to perform well in a wide range of easy to complex environments. And this leads to uh, our new formula, DEI versus the efficiency index, which is a summation of the complexity and the average performance of the agent. DEI encompasses both of the qualitative and uh, quantitative descriptions of AGI agents. I have to skip my slides very fast. Uh, VI is a scoring system, uh, no big deal. It's just a scoring system like exams, like IQ tests. And uh, you can see that based on the combined uh, um, a statement from Lake Potter and Penetrin Gorton, uh, it uh, encompasses uh, all of the aspects of their statement. Uh, uh, you, we have the, we have AGI agents have to perform well. We have performed well. And then in a wide range and easy to complex environments. Here, yeah. uh, the VI encompasses these uh, uh, these aspects. I have to skip some of my some of my 
uh, and uh, in order to uh, find these the parameters of uh, bi like n wi and alpha i we divide the plan and uh, I say that that any environment can consist of any number of uh, and combination of problems or tasks of different complexities. For example, uh, you, you can see that um, an environment may contain one problem or three problem or infinite number of problems. So classification of the environments is not uh, is not possible because we have infinite combination of problems. But the point is the complexity of an environment can be determined based on the complexity of the various problems that exist in that environment. So instead we can classify the problems themselves. All the problems that exist in the world belong to the UPS, universal problem space, which is a dynamic on infinite space of solved problems and unsolved problems, NPS, to the human as a natural language, um, a natural uh, general intelligence agent. So uh, we have UPS, uh, this is NPS, this, these are unsolved problems to human and the stars uh, demonstrate the problems. The SPS is mm, the solved problems. Since IQ tests and all other exams are performed on the solved problems, we can ask quite the problems in the SPS. Every scientific field has its own set of problems and classifies them into certain subspaces based on their desired criteria. And since in artificial general intelligence, we are interested in intelligence, we can classify the problems of the SPS into certain subspaces based on the various aspects of intelligence which are used by the humans to solve those problems. And uh, there are, uh, we stated that there are eight uh, aspects of intelligence, reasoning R, knowledge representation K, planning P, learning L, natural language processing N, per perception C, motion m and social intelligence so uh, the idea uh, of this classification of environments to uh, for finding the parameters of the vi is uh, that solving every single problem in the sps requires applying a certain combination of aspects of intelligence whether they are used simultaneously or consecutively and the problems which, which require the same number of aspects of intelligence can be grouped into the same subspaces as N. And as an, as, as an example, for example, image classification task requires learning and perception. So it belongs to subspace S1, LC. Uh, another example, chess, playing chess uh, requires aspects reasoning, planning, learning, perception, motion. So it uh, will belong to the subspace RPLCM. And other uh, examples, here's a robot college student is uh, a benchmark uh, problem for, uh, for uh, testing whether uh, it, an agent is a real agent, agent or not. It requires solving this problem, requires uh, all of the aspects, all of the eight aspects uh, of intelligence and uh, is, uh, and belongs to S5 RKPLNCMS. And the, the core idea of this classification is that the SPS can be classified into a number of subspaces based on the number of required aspects of intelligence which are needed to solve the problem that exists in each subspace. So each subspace contains a unique com combination of the eight mentioned aspects where the, uni uh, the uh, union is SPS, the subspaces, the union is SPS, and the intersection is empty. Uh, we calculated the number N. Uh, we have 255 subspaces, and this means that based on this classification, the SPS is partitioned into 255 different unique subspaces. This leads to this shape. Uh, this classification leads to this shape. Uh, which uh, contains all of the problems in the SPS, but they are categorized and partitioned based on the required aspects to solve them. For example, problems that uh, uh, that uh, are in here, in this subspace R, need only R uh, aspect to solve them by the humans. I call it AGI pyramid because it has 
all of possible uh, all possible ways to reach to AGI to the top of this pyramid. And AGI pyramids connects the agent side and the environment side and links the internal characteristics of the agent with the external world. And uh, reaching to the top of the AGI pyramid is the path from AI to AGI, which requires a bottom-up approach by gradual leveling up the AGI pyramid. This bottom-up development takes time unless a simultaneous unification approach to all of those eight aspects is found. That is, one has to find the common core mathematical representation behind all of the eight aspects and unify them. And you can, uh, for example, we have evolution of the smartphones, why we call them smartphones. Uh, if they are considered as a whole, the smartphones are gradually getting smarter. They are because they are integrating more number of intelligent aspects. They are climbing the age pyramid. Uh, you see that first they had perception, they had just uh, microphones, and then uh, they could be learning. They learn, for example, vocal orders, and then they equip with uh, natural language processing and uh, like applications like Siri. And this is the way we uh, the intelligent uh, agents uh, climb up the AGI pyramid. And when we look at the top of the pyramid, we have aspects, uh, eight aspects, uh, subspaces, RKPLN, CMS, and uh, the other combinations of these aspects. So it's hard to spell, to utter. So I suggest that these subspaces be named after the AGI uh, scientists, <coughs> pardon me, AGI scientists <coughs> and uh, pioneers. For example, the unique KP, uh, the unique uh, subspace KPLNCMS be named uh, Gertzel space, RKPLNCM, Wang space and uh, RKPLN MS hotter space. And we, uh, the other uh, spaces are uh, unnamed. Uh, so there's no worry if you're an AJ scientist, uh, we have room for everyone. The, there are 261 Excuse me. unnamed Excuse me subspaces. The, Mohammed, I just wanted to yeah. give you a 30 seconds more, oh. please. <clears throat> Sorry about uh, that. Thank oh, you. Okay, okay. okay. Okay, defining the complexity of subspaces, uh, uh, we we define them based on two criteria, and on the on the other hand, we based on the are you there? Seems frozen. Uh oh. All right. Well, unfortunately, uh, I think he's his uh, feed got frozen there. So we're going to go to our next speaker, uh, Stanislav Selitsky. And his paper is entitled Elements of Continuous Reassessment and Uncertainty Self and Uncertainty Self-Awareness, a narrow implementation for face and facial expression recognition. Take it away, Stanislav. Yes, let me share my screen and under our restrictions, I will try to compress it into seven minutes hyperlector. Thank you. So yeah, so basically, uh, like everybody is aware that a recent years was explosion of uh, these foundational models trained on huge amount of different data and uh, huge number of parameters. And we have uh, really success of the scaling. Even some people say this model is partially or fully sentient, but there is also uh, some kind of criticism and it's uh, like rich uh, literature about that, but I will just hide behind big names like Joshua Benjo and Jan Lekun, big names of narrow ML, and they still say 
that scaling is not enough. We need something else uh, like deep learning uh, 2.0 or human-like uh, intelligence. So uh, let's see what we can do with this approach to narrow problems like face recognition and facial expression recognition. Uh, like again, face, uh, like face uh, recognition considered problem solved about a decade ago when uh, machine learning uh, algorithms, in particular CNNs, uh, became more accurate than humans. But this is in uh, laboratory conditions when we have real life with out of terrain distribution problem. It's much less impressive, even worse with facial uh, expression uh, recognition. I won't go there in detail, but uh, it's even like more problematic. So what we can borrow from artificial general uh, intelligence or in particular from human-like because basically out of like possible intelligences we only have humans to copy from when we have extraterrestrial or sentient shape uh, uh, like chimps maybe we'll learn something else so for example um, when human uh, does some task uh, they usually uh, like high quality intelligence they self-aware about uncertainty and errors they may make uh, during particular uh, complicated conditions and they may um, uh, make some corrections in action. So if you are not aware, if you're right or not, maybe it's better not to act at all. And uh, also when we have particular learning um, pattern, we uh, keep uh, our information and we track success and failures and we learn and ask others to learn. And particularly, we ran our experiments with narrow face recognition on our original data set, which uh, has uh, uh, all this makeup, which could be really problematic if you uh, partition right way, uh, like out of distribution problem. And solution we used is additional supervisor or self-awareness network, which observes underlying CNN or basically any network with soft access or it could be extended to other uh, architectures and learns patterns of uh, uncertainty and uh, or like uh, great uncertainty. For example, here we just uh, we call it as uh, like uncertainty shape descriptor. We collect uh, activation soft maxes from ensemble and you can see when we have certain ensemble, this particular shape, if uncertain, uh, this is completely different shape and we can learn that. Uh, and also uh, it could be made in the binary classification like uh, trustworthy, not trustworthy, but we experimented with a more uh, flexible uh, regression schema and also learnable uh, threshold, some kind of simple SVM so we can adjust uh, like behavior of our supervisor uh, if we have uh, change in training data or change in uh, testing data if they have particular st structure. Another approach we use, uh, this is active and continuous learning. So we can use this trustworthy verdict as a um, excuse to ask Oracle for particularly unknown uncertain uh, like image and enrich a training set and retrain uh, our model so it will perform better based on new like outlier we want to uh, incorporate in our model. For uh, uh, accuracy metrics, we use standard things, but like usually you have positive, true, false, negatives is a little bit more tricky. So we use this trustworthy flag as, um, indicator of like negative if this is if a uh, verdict of underlying network uh, is accompanied with not worthy like it's considered negative either positive uh, 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 like true or false and um, we can see that uh, our approach uh, work but 
this approach good if you okay with answer of the model like i don't know so i'm not certain enough uh, i'm not trustworthy to insist of my verdict so if uh, you count it as a uh, like true false negative here are the metrics and you definitely see there is improvement for continuous online of lifetime learning and especially great approach in active even if you have one tenth of the percent of the uh, all information you allow oracle to uh give hints and retrain and also uh, like additional... excuse me stanislav yep. we need yep. to wrap it up in the next 30 seconds sure sure thank yes. you <laughs> yes and like additional uh interesting information this information like about threshold could be used uh, as a quality measure for example you can see on the left uh like like both these images are supposed to be anger but one actor is not uh, like working right and we can see uh, like we can predict that quality of the data is not very good so again like a lot of uh, like positive things uh, everything available uh, like in public domain and next thing to compare humans and ag how they uh, uh, deal with unawareness so thank you for your attention questions i think will be later Thank you very much for that. All right, our next pair of speakers is Alexander Arorbia and Alex Kelly. And they will be talking about learning using a hyperdimensional predictive processing cognitive architecture. Take it away. All right, thank you for the introduction there, Lisa. Um, I'm Dr. Alex Arorbia. I hail from the computer science department at Rochester Institute of Technology. And I'm Dr. Alex Kelly. Um, I'm at the Cognitive Science Department at Carleton University. So, um, I don't know if you've heard of the Common Model of Cognition, but it is uh, a recently developed blueprint for realizing a cognitive architecture and associated brain areas. Um, it, emerged out of 40 years of research into cognitive architectures as kind of a consensus model. Um, so we are proposing a new cognitive architecture that implements the common model of cognition, which is this consensus con concept of how the brain works from all this 40 years of research. Um, and we're calling it Cog Engine. Um, and it is based on uh, neurologically plausible models of learning and memory. So we're combining two neural models, neural generative coding and vector symbolic architectures. Um, vector symbolic architectures are also called holographic vectors or hypervectors. So you've heard about them just a little bit earlier. Um, the lovely thing about vector symbolic architectures is they bridge artificial neural networks and symbolic models combining the advantages of each. So our aim is to develop a cognitive architecture that ultimately, this is just our first step, can capture human performance at all scales of learning from uh, the half hour lab experiment to a lifetime of learning some sort of skill as a human. This is just, however, the first step. So we're starting small. Um, we built the architecture out of a couple of components. Um, one of the things we're using is the Minerva II model of memory, which was developed in the 80s by Douglas Hintzman um, as a model of long-term or episodic memory. Uh, it accounts for many human memory phenomena and from behavioral experiments, including language learning, decision-making, uh, recall, and so on. Um, and it, interestingly, it provably approximates a very large, heavy and audio-associated neural network. Um, and it uses actually very similar mathematics to the transformer network's attention layer, um, which is, an interesting parallel. So there's a lot of gains you can get with a neural network by actually having a good model of memory in it. So Minerva actually is quite simple. Uh, it's just like a giant table and each new observation is a new row in this table. The power of Minerva comes from its retrieval algorithm where it, within a retrieval queue, it sums all the observations in that table, weighting them by their similarity to the queue. And that similarity is raised to some power, emphasizing the contribution of the most similar memories. The original Minerva 2 used a cube, but we use much larger exponents. 
So the other component uh, inherent to our architecture is uh, a neural generative coding circuit, which is a very general and recent form of predictive coding that can scale up to large scale machine learning tasks. Um, go on to the next slide, please. Um, so essentially what this will allow us to do is completely obviate the need for backpropagation of errors, which is what's typically used uh, for deep neural networks. Um, and of course, it's not very brain-like and our goal to complete the picture is to completely use uh, neurobiologically grounded mechanisms, whether it's audio associative heavy in memory or predictive processing in terms uh, to facilitate the actual learning and inference and state estimation inherent to architecture. I'm not going to dwell for sake of time on this slide, but it's a really interesting one. It kind of breaks down our state dynamics. Basically, all our neural circuits uh, are stateful, even if they're processing what you would consider normally non-time variant, uh, time varying data. Um, but the idea here is that they're just doing a lot of guess then check. Your brain, according to Bayesian brain theories, guesses first and corrects it based on information, allowing us to conduct an approximate form of Bayesian inference. Let's move on. Um, so now we're just going to dive into the architecture. So Cog Engine, of course, doesn't implement, it, but it has the kind of modules to allow for uh, the components of the common model of cogn cognition. So as we can see here, uh, let's just move into our circuits. We'll just use this diagram. You'll see it kind of with red highlights throughout. We have a perceptual module system that allows encoders and decoders to basically take raw sensory data like pixels or other modalities. Um, and you would, again, very much like have cortices or cortical regions in the brain process this information and transform it into a latent space. The neat thing about this study is we got very lucky and the problem space we had had a problem specific encoder. So we exploited that to allow us to speed up simulation and focus on other parts. The next, please. And so we also have a uh, neural generative procedural memory. We're using predictive processing to kind of encode this. It also could be just called a dynamics model. Uh, the uh, long story short is that this produces another part of our inherent to our architecture. Uh, Cog Engine embodies another uh, uh, brain process theory called active inference, which is an alternative to reinforcement learning, allowing us to remove even the need for reward signals uh, if we're dealing with very sparse reward problems. This basically uh, encodes uh, sensory dynamics uh, in the latent space and will then produce epistemic exploration signals to encourage the agent uh, to explore as opposed to random flopping around that's normally done in uh, classical reinforcement learning, even modern day. Uh, let's move on. Uh, we also have a motor cortex or a motor action module. Um, this is fairly uh, interesting in the sense that if we go into the details, it's just a neural generative circuit that will take sensory uh, latent state information and basically make the agent do something, affect the environment. The notable part in our system, in addition to being integrated with the Minerva filter memory, uh, which is, we could talk about that offline, and some working memory buffers, uh, the idea is this thing actually produces external and internal actions, so the agent will learn to manipulate the memory modules themselves uh, in order to, you know, process information that it might deem relevant. This is actually partially why it's, uh, this will so show in our results, it can solve things like the memory task. Uh, next slide. And then we also move on to, we have working memory buffers. I won't dwell on this. It's a very cool little mechanism inspired by other uh, neuroscientific theories of working memory, but essentially like ACTAR, if you're familiar with that, a cognitive architecture, we glue the modules in our system uh, with working memory. And we also have one minute, so let's just go, go to the next one, Alex. We also have an episodic memory. It's essentially a hyper uh, symbolic vector uh, system, but that's super cool, has lots of different algorithms, but we're going to move on to results, so. Your turn now. All right, so we did four experiments. One where we had to navigate, a, the agent had to navigate a room where it was just empty room where it's just dropped in a random location as a random exit location and it has to find it. Uh, there's a multi-room task where it has to go through multiple different rooms. Um, and uh, there's also a task where it has to find a key and unlock a door and a memory task where it has to notice the object that it starts off next to and then to click the correct matching path that it contains the same object. So that one requires working memory. Um, we compared against some baseline models, which are all deep, uh, deep uh, Q learning systems, but um, some of them use uh, types of uh, incentives to make them learn better. Uh, R&D is random distillation, Bebold is um, a, a exploration model. Uh, they both 
provide curiosity and exploration incentives to actually get them to work at all on these tasks. However, we actually had to help those two models out. We had to give them a hash table describing all the location, a hash table memory basically to remember where they've been in the maze and also um, objective coordinates in the maze like XY coordinates. Uh, Cog Engine did not have that information. It just, just had like what it could see and everything that it contained internal to its model. Um, so Cog Engine, we can see from the random empty task, it, random, room ran, random empty room task is competitive with the other models. Uh, the basic, uh, the very vanilla deep Q learning network was the weakest. Um, we see here that the deep Q learning network vanilla with table, only, we've got a few seconds. If you don't mind, yeah. I'll get to the table. We're yeah, let's just, um, all right. Uh, one good. thing is Cog Engine can uh, learn to do the uh, memory task, whereas the other ones just fail to do that. Um, so oh, this is the overhaul results. Um, so Cog Engine can learn the memory task and the other ones, uh, the uh, deep, Q neural, deep Q network, the standard one just can't really uh, learn anything other than the random room task. Yep, and we had to hastily run through those results. We can talk to anyone offline if they are interested, but long story short, Cog Engine can learn the maze tasks. It's on par with powerful deep RL methods. Uh, but notably, as Alex just pointed out, Cog Engine can solve and outperform baselines on the memory task, probably largely doing the fact that we can model certain components of memory. Um, the takeaway is that there's a nice synergy here that our uh, prototypical kernel, we're borrowing an operating system turn, this piece of the cognitive architecture we'll be developing over the years, shows how a memory model interacts really nicely with a predictive coding general framework. Um, our future work, of course, highlights some of the key challenges. If we really want to do artificial general intelligence, as we've been talking about, we largely believe that actually being able to do continual learning, learning across tasks without catastrophic interference is probably the real barrier, I think, ultimately for real agents. We can talk more offline if you're interested. We have a basal ganglia model we're going to integrate to allow doing this. The basal ganglia can serve as an information router. That's one thing. Uh, we also want to generalize beyond our Minerva model to holographic declarative memory. Uh, uh, to actually scale it up better uh, and also integrate other pieces of our memory. We don't have a semantic memory module, uh, so we can't really store world facts, at least not uh, explicitly or in any useful way. Um, so our ultimate goal is to do continual reinforcement learning, which arguably is probably the holy grail and hardest aspect of at least statistical learning with respect to artificial intelligence. But uh, I think we'll stop here. Hopefully we didn't go too far over time. That was wonderful. Thank you very much for that. Yeah, we will have you. the questions and be sure to look on Discord. People might have questions for you there on Discord as well. But we will have a Q&A session later where they might ask questions. All right. Look forward Thank to you very it. much. Thank you. Thank you. Great. OK, we're going to take a break now. And uh, we will be back in. Roman's not going on yet. Uh, we're going to move the next speaker to the next group of speakers. What? And we will be back at um, approximately um, 325. 325. We'll see you then. Uh, sorry, Lisa. Roman says he's on and he can talk now. Oh, OK. I'm ready to go. Let's I don't know what you guys doing. Oh. I'm pushing it. OK. Everybody was and saying we were going to wait because we weren't sure about the video. All Let's right. go. Then you guys I'm told very... me you're going to play the video, so I was very cool. happy with that. Okay. Hi, Roman. Great to see you. Hey, Roman. We're really glad you're here. and. This is Roman Yampolsky, and the paper is Ownability of AGI. And take it away, Roman. Thank you. Uh, I think the sound is not uh, sharing correctly, Roman. If you could please stop sharing, and then you can share again. And then you will see options at the bottom left of the share screen that says uh, share with audio and optimize for video. Share sound, optimize. Okay, let's try this again. Yes. Thank you so much. So the paper is all about defining what it means to own. Is it working? An artificial general yes. intelligence. And I review different obstacles to that possibility. Those obstacles include some well-known impossibility results, such as 
unexplainability, unpredictability, uh, reasons connected to EGI rights and uh, self-improvement and code obfuscation. The conclusion is that it is very difficult, if not impossible, to establish ownership claims over EGI models. Uh, Rowan, is it correct that we are seeing a black and white script? Why this topic in the first place? In order to establish responsibility, model. Yes. Uh, ownership in general, in legal sense, is a somewhat complicated process uh, in order to establish it. And uh, if we are talking about software and intelligence software, it becomes even more challenging. Uh, there is uh, some existing approaches which have been suggested for establishing ownership. I will begin by reviewing those. So one approach is to be able to watermark your ML model. And of course, the problem with that approach is that there are tools for removing watermarks. Another approach is inspired by proof of work algorithms. And that was uh, based on the idea that uh, while uh, system is learning, uh, we can capture certain properties of that learning process. So proof of learning, only those who trained the AI model would know specific information about uh, model parameters, hyperparameters, intermediate weights, and so on. The problem here is that if someone takes an existing trained model and continues to train it, now they would have access to those uh, hidden parameters and the original owner would not. Uh, alternatively, you may try proving ownership of uh, the model by showing that you have ownership of the data set, large data set on which the model was trained. Um, there are issues with, uh, of course, public uh, data being used for training models such as Wikipedia and uh, copyright is not always um, equally protected in different jurisdictions. What are some other big obstacles to establishing ownership? So in order to establish that you own the system, you have to demonstrate control over it, predictability of its state. Uh, it's not just a random process. Uh, however, uh, based on some results I presented at this conference last year, where well-known uh, impossibility results impact on this capability. Um, well-known impossibility results such as unpredictability of uh, specific decisions made by a much smarter system, by a lower intelligence agent, unexplainability, inability of uh, much smarter agents to explain their decisions to a lower intelligence without either simplifying those explanations, or if a full explanation is given, there is incomprehensibility by the lower agent of um, complete explanation. So you either have to simplify it or it's not meaningfully explainable. And of course, all those uh, impossibility results uh, together with well-known impossibility results from mathematics, computer science, publishers, theory, and many others contribute to our general inability to control such systems, uh, idea known as uncontrollability. Now, there are certain AI models which uh, are not based on neural networks, they're not black boxes, and we can predict their decisions. Decision trees are a great example of such uh, AIs, uh, expert systems based on decision trees can be accurately predicted, but uh, they are of limited capability. So you are trading off capability of the model for uh, interpretability of such models. Other obstacles to ownership uh, are connected to uh, being able to comprehend decisions of such systems. So again, any rule-based uh, narrow AI can be analyzed and uh, experts in the field can understand how the decisions are made, for example, in medical uh, image uh, AI uh, research, uh, you can provide specific uh, patterns you're looking for and then uh, see if AI identifies those patterns and that's how you know what the diagnosis is. 
uh, but uh, if a system is uh, training, um, maybe not totally different, but uh, not exactly the same as the AI, just a few training cycles before that, uh, we essentially have a hard time claiming ownership over something which is not static. So uh, if AI is uh, ever stolen, if your model is stolen, and it uh, continues to learn and train and modify its code, and maybe someone deliberately obfuscates its code, it would be very difficult for you to describe what, what is stolen from you, what it is you are missing, and what the system is. So to conclude, uh, we anticipate those advanced AI systems to be unexplainable, unpredictable, and controllable, and very easy to steal and obfuscate. Uh, it's hard to make a claim that someone owns an advanced AI since they don't control it. Its behavior, code, internal states, outputs, goals, uh, consumed data, or any other relevant attributes. But of course, it is up uh, to different jurisdictions to interpret what their ownership laws in the context of AI ownership are. Uh, thank you, and I'm happy to discuss this. Uh, Great. Thank you very much for that, uh, Roman. Really appreciate it. And right now we are going to take a quick break and we're going to be back at exactly 3.35 p.m. so we can finish up with another round, another two rounds actually, of lightning talks and uh, maybe a, a little tiny bit of Q&A. So we will see you. Thank you, Lisa. And thanks to all those speakers for fantastic talks. And, and, and thank you, Roman. Uh, really great papers. Folks here, we've got 15 minutes and Future AI will be doing another demo of their cool software right now. If you get out and see it. See you in 15 minutes for the last session of the day. Bye.
private brain. You're doomed. <laughs> Thank you, Doom Humans of California. We love you. Jam Galaxy Band. Thanks, everyone. Please give a big hand to Jam Galaxy Band and my little sister, Oracle, Poet, Opener of Minds, and Maggot Queen of the Doomed, Desdemona. Oh, the whole thing is meaningless, meaningless, meaningless. It is a flow, a flow, a flow, a flow, a flow. I miss my mind, I miss it so. I don't know why it had to go. It's like a mad dog in the snow. Inside my brain. Remember when we had no skin? You open up a space within. You prick me like a terrapin I'm so insane The streets are wild and filled with roses Go wrap me in your darling poses It's all projections of our souls But that's okay Been waiting all night long for something to rhyme Encode my DNA within the spiral of time been waiting all my life for time and space to come Crawling back Like a mad dog In a shark attack And it's the structure of mine That makes perfection so hard to find, yeah It's the structure of mine That makes perfection so hard What is the structure of mine? They make perfection so hard to find, yeah It's a structure of mind They make perfection so hard oh, It's a nature of love Let's see what all I can learn from above, yeah That's a nature of love Well, that's a nature of love That's a nature of love That's the nature, that's the nature of love.
attraction so hard to find Yeah, that's the structure of mine That makes perfection so hard That's the nature of love Let's do it all like a light from above Yeah, that's the nature of That's the nature of That's the nature of love navigate all around, but every time I take an inch of ground my body dies and I have to curl up in a ball and go to sleep. In the city we roll in metal and ignore the passing sun for electric lights. You were always the hustle in my bustle and I feel sorry for you mister. In the city you can recycle seven different kinds of plastic but not credit cards for privacy reasons. She hears an alarm. She gets up and goes to work. She doesn't know anyone on the elevated train. In the city there is a florist who makes her assistant take the thorns off all the pink roses and she's sleeping naked on the couch touching him goodnight. In the city there are flowers made for the flattened by cars and trees. In the city even the robots smoke cigarettes and put notches in their belts. We once stole a Cadillac and hid it in the darkest street at the bottom of a hill near a bakery. In the city you can ambush people with a fuck you if you have to. In the city there are flowers made from aluminum cans that have been flattened by cars for years. They're wonderful but they do not smell like roses. In the city there are doorways that can swallow an entire human body. Then a dazzling display of light should occur, the immortals. These are not merely fire-like orbs, but were once human.
Hello, hello. Perfect timing. Welcome back. AGI 22 participants to our second day. We're moving towards the last session of second day of our four day AGI 22 conference here in Seattle. Anyone watching on YouTube, anybody uh, tuning in, just to let you know, we do still have in-person tickets left tomorrow for both the audience, the general audience day on machine creativity and AI. And we also have tickets for our Jam Galaxy showcase with a number of local Seattle bands and our own Jam Galaxy band. So please tell your friends, conference attendees get in free to the concert. You'll all be pleased to know. Can we have a clap for that? <laughs> free concert tickets yay right so now we'll be into our last session of lightning talks we're all out of overrun time jonathan morrell is going to present on behalf of himself alexei and ben and he's going to present a meta probabilistic language uh camera please in the room thank you is going to present a meta probabilistic programming language for by simulation of probabilistic and non well founded type systems. Welcome back, Jonathan. Uh, present here then is uh, part of the Open Cog uh, project and it's um, intended to provide a um, uh, a, a working formal um, formalization of uh, the uh, meta programming language. So um, I'll begin by saying some uh, brief things about uh, perspectives on meta and its formalization. And then uh, I'll uh, give a brief overview, overview of guarded cubicle type theory and its use in, um, and, and, and then talk about probabilistically type metagraphs and meta evaluation. Uh, and then I'll talk about how we um, how we uh, use meta to bi simulate various type systems um, at, and as examples. And finally, um, just summarize um, how we can derive a proof of the uh, bi simulation in GCTT for a simple type system at the end. Um, so uh, to uh, to start with, then some perspectives on meta and its formalization. Uh, so Meta is, aims to be a general language for AGI, and in the paper uh, we develop a formal model, which we call M, of the Meta language. So um, um, Meta probabilistic programming uh, uh, is a way of um, saying that we uh, allow for uncertainty both at the program and type system level. Uh, and there's a few uh, uh, perspectives on what what we're doing there for. So um, the first is we're uh, for, by doing so we're providing a meta language for type systems. Um, the other thing we're doing then is at the type level we can flexibly model different logics via uh, the curry had correspondence. Um, and then more generally, we're by doing this we're providing models for different styles of reasoning that an AGI may employ. Um, so the, the, the question then that we're, we're uh, focusing on, on is how to develop a semantics for such a system. Um, so this slide gives a general picture of, uh, of uh, oh, a general overview of uh, what we're doing here. So um, a meta probabilistic programming like M will provide a language within which um, we can formalize multiple ob object type systems or uh, programming languages. So we um, so we've got here on the uh, so so we've got our object languages which we're interested in formalizing, and these can be thought of as DSLs effectively. Um, so we, we, we're interested in formalizing things like probabilistic dependent type systems, and then we've got our meta language M, which is where meta comes in. And this is provides a general language which we can then specialize in various ways by uh, customizing the atom space uh, and putting uh, constraints on the atom space such that the meta evaluation by simulates these various type systems on the right. But then we have the issue then how do we formalize our meta language since this meta language is already formalizing these object languages. 
So here our um, approach is to use uh, guarded cubicle type theory as a meta-meta language within which we can um, embed this, uh, this whole procedure. Um, and that's, uh, that, that's what I'll, I'll, uh, I'll give uh, uh, an overview of in the next few slides. Um, so uh, guarded cubicle type theory then, it's, uh, so uh, I'll, I'll just introduce some of the main concepts. Then. So it allows you to, to um, define delayed fixed point types, um, which in turn may be used to define um, uh, guarded co-algebras. And then we're interested in using these to um, define then a guarded label transition systems, um, which we can form formulate meta evaluation in terms of. Um, and uh, th these are these are uh, formulated as the fixed point of uh, a power set function within a GCTT a finite power set function. Um, and then uh, ha in this framework, then by similarity of processes in such guarded label transition systems can be shown to correspond to path in a, uh, path equality in GCTT. Um, so this this is uh, the the general setup. Um, so then um, this slide then we have um, uh, so so th this is this is then basically how we how are we going to formulate uh, meta evaluation. Um, so the state of an M program then can be defined as a pointed atom space. Um, and this is in turn uh, a probabilistically typed metagraph. Um, so these, uh, uh, th these provide a summary then of the, 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 the syntax um, for, for setting up such pointed, pointed um, uh, metagraphs. And um, uh, we have um, various categories of um, labels that we can put on the met on these metagraphs, um, it, uh, including uh, variable tokens, and, um, and and then particularly we have the uh, tokens for keywords in meta, which we can use as labels. Um, so actually, just to mention that transform token is actually corresponds to match in the current meta implementation. Um, and then just to give an idea, then when when we uh, when we're defining meta evaluation in this system, then what what we we have a guarded label transition system, and the um, actions in that label transition system correspond to ground, grounded grounding rules for particular nodes um, in the metagraph. And uh, for instance, we can have function application nodes which work by doing pattern pattern matching on this kind of metagraph. And the transform nodes work by doing pattern matching on this grounded metagraph. Um, so this is just an overview of how we can formulate meta evaluation in such a framework. Um, so now talking about how we by, how we by simulate various object languages in this framework. Um, so by simulation can be formulated as a um, uh, in, in terms of equality of processes within a guarded label transition system. And we can define a type for, uh, uh, for um, by simulation of GLTSs. Um, so, so that's what, uh, so, so this is within a single GLTS and this is by simulation between pairs of GLTSs. So for each type system, we show how to specialize the atom space to allow Meta to run a by simulation of that type system. So, um, so first, uh, well, we, we have some, some uh, I, I've just picked out a few examples here. So for instance, we can formulate pure type systems in this framework, which are a, a um, kind of type system which allows you to use an arbitrary uh, typing relationship where you can have cycles within the typing uh, relationship, um, which turn out, to be, uh, uh, turn out to be useful in various contexts. Um, and uh, so, so this, this shows how we can, the syntax in type theory above, and then how we can translate that into a meta syntax below that. Um, this does a similar kind of thing for probabilistic dependent type systems. Um, and then we have, uh, this is, um, this is uh, work, work in progress, which extends the pure type system um, formulation 
uh, to incorporate uh, infinite order probabilities, which I uh, talked a little bit about in the uh, Open Cog workshop. Um, but this shows how, how you can use the um, uh, non well founded aspect of um, pure type systems to uh, provide a more uh, to provide a formulation of uh, infinite order probabil uh, probabilities in meta. Um, so the final section then in the final section I just um, provide uh, I provide a, 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 a an example of uh, formulating a, vice, a proof of by simulation in GL uh, uh, in um, uh, GCTT for a simple type system with, uh, formulated in a simplified version of Meta. So here, here it's, here, I, I mean, I won't go through the simple type system here, but the basic approach is we formulate it via a, a, a sort of toy pattern matcher over an atom space, which is the Meta approach. And then we simulate it directly via beta reduction. And the following slides then just uh, go through how to set this up in a Haskell-based um, uh, type, uh, type checker for um, GCTT. So this is setting up the general toy meta evaluation scheme. And then this is setting up the um, by simulation proof uh, using uh, guarded streams in GCTT. Uh, so in summary then, so M provides formulation, uh, formalization of meta in GCTT. And it's a flexible formulation of type systems, which incorporates probabilistic dependent type systems, as well as non world founded uh, systems. I've uh, talked about the sort of deterministic version, which is pure type systems, and also the probabilistic versions, which include infinite order distributions. So we can, um, uh, applications uh, through, by Curry Howard come through formulating various kinds of probabilistic logics. Uh, and then on the probabilistic programming side, then um, we uh, um, th this can provide a a, um, a basis for uh, for learning for doing meta probabilistic programming, and then learning uh, doing learning and inference both at the program level and the type system level. Um, so uh, thank thank you for listening, and that that ends my presentation. introduce James Oswald here in the room who's going to talk us through two papers he's talking us through market prediction as a task for AGI agents I hope we've got Chris Poulin here our fintech AGI AI uh, lead for singularity now and we're good here and he's going to talk us uh, talk to us about a second paper which is Perry 2 goes to school and beyond in search of AGI yes. They sound like two fantastic papers. We're really looking forward to them. Thank you, James. Uh, that's not uh, mine, that's Mike's. He's after me. Uh, I'll do Perry 2 first. All right, so hi everyone. Uh, I'm James Oswald. I'm a first year PhD student and a uh, research assistant at the Rensselaer AI and Reasoning Laboratory or Rare Lab for short um, at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Uh, so for this talk, I'm gonna be speaking about our position paper, Perry 2 goes to preschool and beyond in search of the AGI. Uh, the paper includes our current position on AGI in the Rare Lab, the theoretical pillars we're building our work on top of and some preliminary work with our robot Perry 2 who we've been testing our approaches with. So we'd like to thank the sponsors who made this work possible, both the Office of Naval Research and the Air Force Office of Scientific Research. Uh, 
So for a quick summary of our work, we're going to present our position on AGI, the set of underlying assumptions that we believe are going to be useful in constructing a framework for a measurable approach to AGI. The word measurable here really encompasses both the incremental approach sense and the evaluation sense of our method. Um, then we're going to talk about our theoretical approach to creating an agent within our framework via our two theoretic pillars. First, logic-based AI plus cognitive science, and secondly, psychometric AI. Then finally, we're going to wrap up by discussing our robot Perry 2 and our desired high-level symbolic architecture, both designed in line, in line with our theoretic pillars and how Perry 2 is tackling some preschool-level reasoning tasks. So for our position on AGI, um, it's really split into three parts. First, that AGI and G are, are best uh, defined in the context of formal logic, and in particular, logic-based academic learning. This is really in line with Ben's idea of incremental progress towards AGI via training in AGI in an academic, in this case, preschool environment. Um, and this was proposed in his 2009 paper, AGI Preschool, a framework for evaluating early stage human-like AGIs. Uh, the second position that we maintain is that AGI is best pursued by seeking artificial agents that pass determinate cognitive tests and then finally, we hold that a physical environment interacted with via robotics rather than a virtual one is really of key importance for learning about the real world. Um, so a core component of real academic tasks performed by humans in schools, right, is that they're all carried out physically and the mechanical skills are long, learned right alongside other skills, right? So we consider all three of these to play an important part in the ability to create an AGI system that is able to be measured in a meaningful way that shows incremental progress towards AGI. So for our two pillar approach to AGI, um, we're going to turn to the, let's see. Yeah. So we're going to turn to our theoretic pillars now um, that we're keeping in mind during, while building our agents. So our first pillar um, is logic based AI and cognitive science. Uh, this really deals with the implementation at the micro level for our agents. It gives us the tools that we need to create dynamic agents that can learn and reason. Our second pillar is psychometric AI, and it gives us the design goal at the macro level, as well as a means of evaluation for our agents. So I'm going to go into a bit more detail about these pillars. Um, so recalling from before that our first uh, pillar is logic based AI and cognitive science. So combining both logic based AI and cognitive science gives us a lot of expressive power. Um, at the intersection of the two, you get a class of inductive logics that we in the rare lab call cognitive calculi, which are able to reason introspectively, uh, epistemically, and even beyond this into different modal areas. Um, so we hold that this is an unpopular opinion potentially, but that these logics, uh, when specified correctly, will be able to formalize intelligence both up to and beyond general intelligence. Um, so our agent Perry 2 works within a logic that we're going to refer to as L star, um, which is an intentional deductive logic, which incorporates notions of both epistemic operators and perception. So in the diagram we have here in the universe of logics, uh, we see that L star is over here in the intention, finitary intentional deductive symbolic bucket. Um, whereas over here, we see the logics people are normally used to working with, such as first order logic, um, is in the extensional category. So our second pillar is psychometric AI. Um, so psychometric AI is effectively designing agents who are able to demonstrate intelligence on established tests of cognitive ability and skill. Some of these tests include uh, the Wexler Adult Intelligence Scale and the Bennett Mechanical Comprehension Test, um, a question from which we've pictured uh, mechanical reasoning and then reasoning down here at the bottom. Um, so note that this doesn't necessarily imply that we care about the G factor. This isn't an IQ test. Um, so from Ben's example this morning, we'd be perfectly happy looking at established deterministic cognitive tests for non-human agents, such as sonar tests for measuring dolphin intelligence. But as our goal is to create human-like and eventually human-level agents, we're going to use human tests. Um, so with psychometric AI is a key paradigm of our approach, we're really given two things, a design goal um, to explicitly design our agent with the end goal of solving these tests. And secondly, the ability to use these tests as a measurement of intelligence for the agent. Um, the second point is really key to our approach. It really, it really lets us avoid bogging ourselves down with the ongoing debate of what it means for an agent to be intelligent and instead focus on solving practical problems over a range of environments that people would generally agree constitute some level of intelligence. Um, all right, so just a quick overview of our architecture. At the high level, we're hoping to develop an end-to-end -end agent that's powered by modular logical components implementing our logic L-star. So at the core of our agent, we have a prover, a planner, and adjudicator modules. 
all of which are going to be reasoning in LSTAR. And this image here really just shows the end-to-end -end architecture that we're trying to create. You have perception, goal generation, hypothesis generation, discovering arguments and proofs, adjudication, and then basically reasoning over multi-agent systems, which we're still in the works with. Um, So in terms of testing our uh, Agent Perry 2, in practice, we've been implementing it with uh, both of our two theoretical pillars and putting it to the test on real logio mathematical problems. Um, in particular, we've been experimenting and playing around with this deductive spatial reasoning game called Metaforms, which is designed for teaching preschoolers about logic. Um, our current pipeline is really just experimenting with the reasoning component of our agent at the moment. Um, it's a module called Shadow Prover, which reasons about um, the test in our logic L star and derives solutions. The solutions are then converted into movement plans, which are enacted on a robotic arm and hand, which you can see it's solving one of them right there. So for our future work, um, we're hoping to implement a more robust front end for perception, such as the Arcadia framework from the NRL. Um, we're hoping to do this so that we might more rigorously deal with the problems of imperfect perception in the real world, which is almost always in all of these tests assumed to be perfect. But we know in real situations, perception isn't perfect, of course. Um, so we've begun preliminary tests with this uh, and pictured here is an experiment where we have it trying to solve the problem in a smoke-filled room based on data that it gathered before the smoke came in. Um, okay, so that's the end of the first one. So, thank you. All right, so I'm not going to introduce myself again. I'm James Oswald. Um, so the title of this work is Market Prediction as a Task for AGI Agents. Um, so a quick, whoops, I'm too far. So a quick overview of this work. Essentially, we're investigating the possibility of using market prediction as an incremental task for AGI agents due to its dual logical and statistical nature. A lot of the AGI and fintech work is really interested in what AGI means for improving fintech. This work is kind of the opposite of that. We're interested in what fintech can do to help us reach AGI. So in line with this, we're proposing to use market prediction as an incremental task for measuring progress towards AGI. So at first, this might seem like a pretty ludicrous proposal for a task. You might say, oh, well, of course, narrow statistical methods can outperform AGI. After all, humans have general intelligence and they're outperformed by the right statistical methods. Um, personally, I think there's a missing component with that analysis. And the key words in there are right statistical methods. There's always gonna be a human in the loop that selects and applies these narrow narrow statistical methods and basically acts as the logic and reasoning component of this combined human plus statistical agent superhuman-esque system that performs market prediction. Um, so if market prediction really was just as simple as statistical agents, every human trader on Wall Street would probably be out of a job, right? Uh, they wouldn't need people to actually select which methods to use on these different classes of market prediction problems. So hence, we believe that market prediction is a pretty good incre uh, incremental task for AGI. And we consider it to be desirable for two primary reasons. First is the extremely varied environments and rules for different asset classes that contribute to a value of an asset. And secondly, the various specific class specific methods that you need to learn and correctly apply to be really good at prediction. Um, so to make use of market prediction as a task, we've created a modified version of it that can be played by all different types of agents, whether they be statistical, connectionist, symbolic, or hybrid. Um, and then finally, we're gonna wrap this up by looking at an instance of the task in which we have benchmarked st statistical, connectionist, and symbolic agents on. I'm not sure if this is broken. All right. Um, yeah. So in terms of traditional market prediction, so just some backgrounds, typically a quantitative market prediction uh, task is modeled as a sequence prediction task where you're trying to predict the value of something P at a time in the future. Traditionally, it's going to be one time step out from the previous um, thing. 
Um, and you're trying to predict this uh, value from the previous value of P, as well as some other arbitrary quantitative features. So you could consider social media data. We're primarily interested in what's called technical market factors, which is primarily just past price data. Um, so for our modified task, so a problem with the, st the standard market prediction task in the usual sense is that a lot of agents, particularly symbolic agents, such as NARS and the logical agents that we're trying to build at the Rare Lab, are in practice still really unable to cope with serious mathematics and statistics at the object level. This is particularly clear over uh, it, the rationals and the reals, where, and this is where the raw market prediction task lives, right? You're working over raw market uh, data. So, you know, dollars and cents, right? Um, and it's very hard for our agents to actually handle that. But our agents are really good at reasoning over symbolic labels. So the idea here is essentially to modify the market prediction task um, to predict discretized labels in line with how a regular human trader talks about the market. So a regular human trader says stuff like, oh, the market is down a lot. The market is up a little bit, right? So each feature here can be represented this way with a direction that it's moved and a magnitude that it is moved by, both of which you can assign labels, right? So the goal here is to predict the direction um, of the movement, um, which effectively this lends itself very nicely to an evaluation market metric for market prediction known as directional accuracy. Um, and effectively, we're happy about this because statistical uh, agents can also play this task um, because you're able to, uh, labels can be represented discreetly and they have a total order over them, allowing them to be converted back to numerical data for input to the statistical and connectionist methods. So basically everyone's able to play on this task, no matter what kind of agent you have. Um, so essentially to calculate the directional component, uh, which we use this uh, superscript D here for. Um, it's pretty easy. You just see if the market went up or down. And if it went up for all of these features, you say, oh, that's an up component. Otherwise it's down, you label it down. Uh, for the magnitude, it's a bit more complicated. So effectively, um, Computing magnitude is a bit more complicated because we have to take into account the distributions of the features. Um, a small change in one is not the same as a change in another. In this example here, we see Apple stock prices and the conversion rate between US dollars and Canadian dollars. And we can see that in the Apple sense, uh, for the Apple stock, a 1% change isn't super significant, but for the uh, exchange rate, we see a 1% change is very significant. So we need to take this into account when we're trying to figure out how we're going to encode these magnitudes as labels. Um, so the key idea here that we came up with was z-score bucketing approach. Effectively, we use the past distribution of features um, to compute the significance of the current change and then bucket the significance into an arbitrary number of discrete labeled buckets, such as large change, small change, medium change, and you can have however many buckets you want. Um, so just a quick example of this. Here's a sample price move. Whoops, trying to turn on the laser. Well, I went way too far. So just a little example of this, uh, here's two dates. We see that the price went up here. So the direction is up and then we use the past distribution um, effectively to compute the magnitude here. We compute the z-score first and then we bucket it into one of our three labels. So for the actual task that we ended up doing, uh, we had to obviously create an instance of this task. So uh, we use data, a data set that was in line with past machine learning market prediction work. Um, so for the actual instance of the task, we use the S&P 500, which for those of you who don't know, is an indicator basically of how well the entire US stock market does. It's computed via some of the top stocks in the market. Um, and in computing this, we had 27 total features. And these all, so it included commodities, currency exchange rates, global, other global stock market indices, uh, bond yields, and 10 high profile stocks. Um, and obviously we selected all of these based on past work. We didn't want to do anything too crazy. So some of the agents that we actually ran the benchmark on, uh, let's see. So we benchmarked the task on three statistical agents, one connectionist agent, and one symbolic agent. The statistical agents were primarily selected due to their uh, past benchmarking for the S&P 500 prediction, while the artificial neural network and NARS were added as baselines for symbolic and connectionist agents, respectively. I switched the order of those. NARS is obviously the symbolic agent, and the artificial neural network is the connectionist agent. Um, okay. 
So for the results that we got, um, we saw using, so we're using directional accuracy as a metric, which is the percent of times uh, that the testing and training samples um, were able to correctly predict the direction of the S&P 500. Um, so we're able to see in the results that the statistical agents still maintain dominance, but all three types of agents at least significantly outperform the random baseline. Um, so in the future, hopefully we can expand this to looking at some more robust agents and a, at a greater range of features to take into account, such as social media sentiment analysis, etc. And that is the end. Thank you. Thank you so much for those excellent papers. I think you're actually the only speaker who finished on time. <laughs> Seven minutes on the nail, exactly. Big clap for James, beautiful. Concise, clear, very well presented, compelling results. And now we have got, I see you sitting, standing here ready, Michael Giancola uh, presenting his paper on um, towards toward generating natural language explanations of modal logic proofs. Thank you, Michael. Great to have you here with us today. Thank you. All right, does this one work? Can I use this? Yeah. All right. All right. All right, thanks. I'll try to be like James and stay on time too. Um, <laughs> so uh, my name is Mike Giancola. I'm a final year PhD student in the Rare Lab with James. I was gonna say, I don't think this is on. Can I use that one or? Okay, uh, so my name is Mike John Cola, final year PhD student in the same lab with James, advised by Dr. Selmer Bring Short. Um, so I'm going to start with like a high level motivation of the work here today. So um, imagine you're in this autonomous car of the near term future and it's driving towards this green light, right? And then all of a sudden it stops. And so naturally you ask, why did you stop at the green light? And right after you ask, this truck comes racing through that you hadn't seen before. So it's obvious to all of us now why the agent made the decision it did, but really it is a nuanced, there's a nuanced explanation to it that involves several theory of mind modalities, which if you're not familiar, theory of mind is essentially um, the ability to like ascribe mental states both to yourself and to others. So like I can perceive that my slides are showing, I can perceive that you perceive my slides, I believe my slides are there and I believe you believe that they're there as well, that kind of thing. Um, so in this particular case, you know, the agent had perception. So I perceived uh, the truck and perceived that it wasn't decelerating. Um, I had beliefs. I believe the truck's light was red, but that regardless, it was going to, you know, it didn't intend to stop. Intention is also another uh, theory of my modality. Uh, therefore, I believed if it didn't, uh, if I didn't stop, then we would crash. Uh, finally, some obligations. So um, I'm morally, ethically, legally obligated to avoid crashes. And so I decided at the end I had to stop. Um, so this sort of reasoning with like theory of mind modalities is kind of the bread and butter of what we do in the rare lab, like James talked about a bit. Um, and so typically we're doing that with formal logic, not like in natural language. Um, so we're creating agents and automated reasoners that can create proofs like this. This is essentially like the formal correlate of what we have here. Um, and so we have agents that can like generate these kinds of proofs. Um, and so that's all well and good. Uh, we can use that, um, you know, and we can formally verify, formally check that like an agent's behavior corresponds with the inference schemata of um, this particular cognitive calculus we're using in any particular case. Um, but what I'm interested in today is, well, this is all well and good for those reasons, but we'd also like to be able to use it as an explanatory value. We'd like to be able to use it so that an agent can explain its behavior in natural language to a person. So the big question is, how do we get from here to there? How do we get, um, how do we build a model that can generate that explanation from the formal version uh, of the explanation? Um, and so I really, I sort of pose this as like a translation and a summarization task, because for one, obviously we need to translate from the formal language to natural language, but we can't really just like do a one-to-one -one mapping in most practical situations, because like take this scenario again, there's a million questions you could ask. How did you know the truck's light was red? Well, I knew some stuff, you know, I had some common sense knowledge about how traffic lights work. I know mine was green, you know, yada, yada. So you can make a whole little proof there. And then you could say, how did you know the truck wasn't going to stop? Well, I know about physics and I saw the truck. I saw its size. I did a bunch of like quick computations in my head. Um, so practically speaking, if the agent can't like summarize and distill the like salient pieces of what it wants to say, then we're kind of dead in the water. So um, again, translation and summarization. So, you know, this is intended to be a first step in this research direction with hopefully much more to come. So 
what I did in this work was uh, first designed a calculus with like easily explainable inference schemata that kind of lended themselves to natural language explanation. So uh, the schema we have here. So if an agent A perceives some formula phi at time t, then they can infer a belief in that formula. Uh, then if in that same agent uh, believes phi and psi, they can believe in phi. So they can essentially perform and elimination in their beliefs. Uh, and then the same thing for or introduction and implication elimination. So again, like I say, easily explainable because in most of our calculi, in particular when we're modeling like rational idealized agents, um, we would just say like, why have three different schemas for this if we can have one? We can just include a metallurgical provability operator and just say, you know, assuming you're perfectly rational and, per, you know, like not necessarily modeling a, modeling a human, but an ideal agent, we could just say anything that's provable from your belief set, um, you can generate a belief in. But again, for, for the purposes of this paper, we wanted schema that were, uh, you know, lended themselves to natural language explanation. Um, I fine-tuned uh, a transformer language model, Pegasus, on 20 pairs of these formal proofs and the natural language explanations. Um, and the reason I selected Pegasus is it was pre-trained on what's called abstractive summarization. So whereas extractive summarization just seeks to like extract out pieces of the source text to kind of glue together a summary, abstractive summarization actually intends to produce um, novel text that did not appear in the summary. So like a, a genuine, you know, abstract summary. Um, and this was important here because again, like what we're trying to do is summarize and translate and there most models, you know, do summarization or they do translation. So this was kind of, kind of met in the middle a little bit. Um, and finally, of course, I held out like 10 pairs that we could evaluate on. Um, so this is one example of one of the pairs, uh, that I evaluated on. So, um, this is sort of a version of that proof, um, which says like the formula that we're proving the inference schema that were used, and then like the supporting formula and goes all the way down until you hit the assumptions. Um, and so this sort of like gold label that I came up with for it was, you know, the agent believes the road is slippery. This is because the agent believes if it's raining or snowing, then the road is slippery and the agent believes it's raining. And so the model actually came up with a more concise summary, which was kind of cool. Um, you know, essentially said the same thing, use slightly different language, um, but it basically like distilled the proof into, you know, natural language that corresponds to the proof. Um, so to wrap up, um, I have a few points of future work. So obviously, again, this is early work in this direction. Um, I think one of the major things uh, going forward is, can we generate language in a way that ensures logical correspondence? Because using transformer language models, you know, there's no uh, guarantee that the text is going to correspond logically to the input proof. Um, we found in this case, I should have included that, but uh, like 60% of the, so six out of 10 of the examples I had in the test set, they did logically correspond, which was pretty good. But obviously we want, we would like to have a guarantee there if possible. Um, and I think, you know, um, symbolic natural language generation, as opposed to, you know, like these transformer fully uh, connectionist approaches um, is much more emergent uh, to my knowledge, at least. I don't know of any like very established um, symbolic approaches to NLG, but uh, this is one that's emerging in particular that I think um, in general too, that this is a uh, potential avenue to getting natural language generation that we can have some sort of formal guarantees about. Um, next, can we automatically evaluate the desired features of the output? Like, so can we come up with methods to automatically evaluate, you know, this logical correspondence, like the quality of the linguistic content? Um, because of course, this is something that connectionist methods are pretty good at, like most transformers, for the most part, generate very uh, high quality linguistic content. Um, but we would want to ensure that that is the case. Um, and the last step is, you know, more complex calculi, larger data sets. So just, you know, kind of scaling all this up um, to more domains, more schemata, all that kind of thing. Um, and in particular, I'll plug belief with likelihood because this is the focus of my dissertation. So it's one <laughs> particular area of interest of mine. Um, so instead of being able to just say, I believe that phi holds, I believe it's overwhelmingly likely. I believe that it's unlikely, certain, et cetera. Um, and yeah, I think I mostly stay to it. So thanks so much. Thank you, and bang on time as well. This is this is <laughs> let these people be a role model. Where are you, Ben, <laughs> for tomorrow? Um, all right. So listen, uh, I think we've got with with the admirable keeping timekeeping of the talks, we've actually got a little bit of time for questions. So anyone have any questions for Michael or for Jonathan or for James? James has a question himself, or you're just coming down. <laughs> We have, we have questions in the room. I'm going to start. I would like to ask one question first, if I may, please. 
which is for James. Did you try your agents on crypto, number one? And number two, are you putting your money where your mouth is and <laughs> trading on them? <laughs> so, no, haven't tested on crypto yet. That was that was the next uh, step, actually. I, I thought of that after I did the, uh, I compiled everything already. Um, obviously, crypto provides a unique challenge because of how volatile it is, right? And it's a completely, and that's one of the main reasons that I think that market prediction is such a useful task, right? Because you have these crazy environments which are completely different, and the factors that predict each market are so wildly different that you have to really be able to look at all of these different methods and be able to select which ones work. And it's really just different environments. And so, crypto definitely going forward is a very promising thing to add in there to see if we can predict that as well um, as a general test. So you're not going to tell me what to buy tonight <laughs> <laughs> or sell. All right. Thanks very much. Uh, any questions? Oh, Doug, we'll come to you. Yeah. So my question is for the last speaker. Uh, how uh, have you found Sumo useful for this? The Sumo uh, standard upper level merged ontology, they have a bunch of NLG based predicates that um, show how to anglify uh, beliefs in, in those statements. In, so I was wondering if that, if you'd seen those works on GitHub from Adam Pease. Um, no, I hadn't. This mic still works, right? Yeah. Uh, no, I hadn't actually. That's really interesting, though. It does sound relevant. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll, I'll give you some. Ian. That'd be great. Thank you. Thank you very much. We had another one back here. Mike. Also for Michael. Uh, what was the formalism that you used for your inference rules? I didn't see any of the, of the rules there, like the modus ponens rules or, or anything else. What did that look like? Well, so like, yeah, I didn't have a ton of time to like get into the full details of that. Um, the, so, I mean, I showed like the inference schemata for the modal operators. Um, and then, yeah, I should have said explicitly like for the underlying like extensional piece with like propositional logic, um, you know, all of the standard like natural um, inference schemata for like propositional logic are there. So like modus ponens, modus tollens, all that, yeah. Oh, what, what programming language? I mean, yeah, for the inference. Yes. Oh, uh, Python. Like, okay. yeah, yeah. Anybody else? Wow. Thank you very much. Thank you, gents. Um, yeah. Anybody else got any questions? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, this question is uh, for Michael. Uh, great presentation. Um, thank you. The, uh, so these super large language models are um, incredibly good at uh, the quality of the syntactic structure, grammatical representation, even some reasonably good <laughs> semantic coherence, but uh, it, they're clearly not uh, necessarily well grounded in terms of like word sense disambiguation, like grounded understanding of concepts. And your logical representations are explicit concept representations. So as you get into more and more complex explanations, how do you ensure that your these two are are locked locked in, like in terms of the natural language generation? You mean going forward then or yeah. like with the work? Well, that's what I mean. I think, you know. I think going forward, like using symbolic, uh, like more symbolic approaches to NLG would make sense. Like, I, I think, it, you know, look like starting this work, I didn't see any options for and like symbolic based NLG that were mature enough to be used. Um, and, you know, at, at this stage, transformers are, you know, the best that we have. Um, but like I said, I think going forward using, you know, more symbolic or potentially hybrid approaches that could somehow, you know, be more tightly integrated to enable um, some guarantees uh, of logical correspondence is what would be needed. Yeah. Does that answer your question or? Okay, <laughs> thanks. Adam has a question. A very quick remark, maybe like a reconstruction loss where you try and go back from the summarization to the logical formulas and try and see if if that's possible and if that's possible then everything like so like an auto encoder like see if it can like re, you know yes exactly. okay yeah 
Yeah, that'd be interesting. Yeah, thanks. Cool. So I've got a question for Jonathan. Uh, we've talked a lot about the meta language uh, over these last two days. I'm sure we'll be talking about it more tomorrow. Uh, the new functional programming language for AGI developed by SingularityNet. And Jonathan, would you care to expand or reflect for a moment on how the, the approach you presented earlier in your paper, how does that really accelerate our efforts towards AGI and how does it accelerate and speed up the scaling of AGI on Hyper? Um, I, I, I mean I, I suppose I, I see it more I, I see it more maybe from a representational point of view so um, I, I probably I, I mean I see it more maybe from a representational point of view so it's providing us a way of representing uh, representing the sorts of things that we we're interested in in terms of um, uh, th things which are useful for AGI. In, in other words, uh, representing different forms of reasoning, representing different levels of um, different levels of reasoning about things and beliefs and um, th that kind of thing. Being able to model different styles of thinking effectively and um, letting a letting an AGI um, letting an AGI find its own ways of thinking and not constraining it to predefined logics or predefined frameworks. So I, I, I suppose I, I, I would see it as providing an overall framework with in which all of that can be represented. And that's I, I suppose that still leaves a lot of questions as to how that should be implemented and uh, how how an AGI should actually learn those things, or how it should use that kind of uh, model, or it could just be that that's the way we think about what it's doing, and maybe it discovers a lot of these things for itself. Um, but um, uh, yes, yeah, so, so I, I I I suppose that that's um, I I think that the, the the various things that uh, I I was outlining are compatible with a lot of different ways of actually implementing these uh, I, I i mean i i suppose um um or i i mean or or the the, the ways that you actually uh, implement probability distributions and things within this framework is left open effectively so um uh, yes yeah, so it's uh, maybe having the right representations in itself is a is a way of accelerating uh progress towards agi wonderful thank you very much indeed so uh, we've we've provided a framework or built a framework whereby the AGI can start to learn for itself and evolve um, with, I, I with a representation structure. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much. Well, let's have a big clap for these fabulous gentlemen in the room today. Thank you all very much. And now for our last session, we're um, uh, going back to Lisa on Zoom, who's going to take us through our last couple of lightning papers. We may have a small change to the agenda in the last papers. Uh, Lisa, take it away. That's right. We will, uh, we will uh, cross that bridge, as they say. It's very exciting here. Um, I wanted to... Uh, let you know that we are about to go into our last group of speakers. And our first speaker has asked that we play his video at a little faster speed so that we can play it all. So, um, so just be ready for that. So um, here we go. And this is um, Aritra Sarkar. The paper is by Aritra Sarkar. Zaid El Ars and Cohen Bertels, and it's QKSA Quantum Knowledge Seeking Agent. Oh, <laughs> okay, this just in. We can play it at normal speed. Okay, that's great. Great news. And I am doing that right now. See you in a second.
Uh, there is no sound. Is I muted? Uh, yes, can you hear it? Sure sound, got it, thank you. Uh-oh. I don't think this is gonna work. Um, Ibby, give us just uh, three minutes and we'll be right back. Hello and welcome. I'm Aritro, and I'll present to you our research on quantum knowledge seeking agent. In the last couple of years, diverse fields like medical diagnostics, autopilots, photo editing, and gaming has been revolutionized by the success of artificial narrow intelligence. A common aspect of these tasks is to learn a frugal model that can explain and predict the observed phenomena or carry out the intended task. This common aspect, whether performed by humans or artificial systems, form one of our core understanding of general intelligence. This idea was formalized as Solomon of induction, where the predicted output is weighted for all hypotheses capable of predicting the past observations by their program size on an universal automata like a Turing machine. So this gave rise to the field of universal artificial intelligence. It was given an active form by the AXC model. This reinforcement learning agent models the environment as a partially observable Markov decision process. The agent decides its current optimal action based on the expected sum of rewards from future optimal actions weighted by the length of the program that predicts these optimal actions and expected re returns and rewards. So this is a very elegant mathematical theory, but UAI in general is intended for studying asymptotic optimal behavior of agents. Various variants of AXI has tried to make this more pragmatic and will be helping us in defining the QK essay. So now this general reinforcement learning frameworks look very optimal and universal. So we should also be able to do science with it. So this is in the direction of the dream of Jürgen Smithuber that let's build an AI physicist and retire for the rest of our lives. So in principle, we want to at least rediscover the laws of physics as we human beings have discovered them over the years. For example, Galileo, Newton, Einstein, and Feynman, they all discovered laws of physics or how 
movement happens in the universe. And this AI should be able to encode these equations or laws of physics as programs in a Turing machine or an universal automata and try to figure out which of them is most helpful. There are three issues with it. Number one, unlike games, the reward will not come explicitly from the environment. Number two, can we also learn the laws of quantum mechanics? And number three, why do we still teach Newton's physics, Newton's laws of physics in school instead of Einstein's relativity when we know that relativity is a much better description for the laws of motion? So we'll try to address them in the following slides. The first of these problems have already been resolved using knowledge seeking agents, which are a variant of the AC model. So these tries to balance the exploration and exploitation trade-offs. So instead of the reward, it uses an utility function, which can be defined in various different ways. So there are different types of KSAs like Square, Shannon, and KL. We'll be using a, a variant of KLKSA, which depends on the callback libeler divergence uh, between two different probability distributions. And this works very well for a stochastic environment. So if the environment is doing something like a coin toss, uh, this agent doesn't look at individual coin tosses as information, but tries to model the probability distribution of the coin. And this is how the utility function looks like, uh, and it uses the entropy of the model. So now, Quantum environments, the second problem, are more than stochastic. So we know of the famous Schrodinger cat experiment where a cat can be both dead and alive. But instead of asking the system whether the cat is dead or alive, we can also look at the system from a very different angle of phase space. And in that case, the cat is 100% in one of the specific phases. So these counterintuitive properties like superposition, measurement, interference, and entanglement also needs to be handled by this knowledge seeking agent. Now stepping back a bit, uh, if we look at how science evolved, classical human cognition has also understood laws of, discovered the laws of quantum mechanics. So knowledge seeking agents should also be able to classical knowledge seeking agents. In fact, KLKSA comes really close and under some restrictions can model also a quantum environment very well. What QKSA tries to generalize is it uses a more native quantum data structure, which is a density matrix instead of a probability distribution. And that would have some advantages as we'll show you. So instead of the environment being a probability distribution, we model the environment as a quantum process. So quantum processes are very general, so it can take into account all classical deterministic and stochastic environments, but also quantum states as a measure, as a preparation process, takes into account quantum measurements, as well as mixed and open system where we have access to only a small part of the system. And these quantum processes can be encoded as a density matrix data structure called, called the Choi uh, density matrix. And this is pretty much a generalization of the probability density function. Looking at an example, let's say we have a Bell state, which is an entangled pair of quantum particles. And these qubits are oriented in certain direction. So if we ask a question, if one of these qubits are in the red direction or not, and that qubit gives yes as the answer. And we perform another experiment on its partner qubit. It is with 100% certainty that that particular qubit would also be oriented in the red direction. But then we can also ask another question if this qubit, the first qubit, is oriented in another different direction. And in that case, it will give a probabilistic output 
which is based on the angle difference between this red direction and the direction in which we ask our question. But the correlation still exists. So if you perform that same experiment on its partner qubit and ask if the second qubit is also oriented in this certain different direction, it will still give the same output. So this kind of experiments are captured really well in the density matrix uh, formalism. And the idea is KLK say, will keep finding new probability distributions for this new measurement basis unless it is within this density matrix encoding. The second problem is once we have this quantum processes, instead of having the KL divergence, we need to find a distance measure between quantum processes or between density matrices. And there are a lot of choices in here. As you can see listed here, we did experiments with some of these, the first three, namely. But this is what we leave as an open parameter that the user of QKSA can tune and do an experiment by choosing one of these density distance measures. So that is the core idea of QKSA. The rest of the idea is how do we realize this in a pragmatic way? QKSA can be applied not only to learn about quantum mechanics and discover the laws, but to also help in designing quantum experiments and explore and map the Hilbert space in a principled fashion, just like robots are used to explore the surface of planets. Quite a few things needs to be resolved, almost like making AXE control the Perseverance rover on Mars. So these considerations is what we'll discuss next. The first pragmatic cons consideration is instead of searching over all possible Turing machine, which is a very difficult task, we embed some kind of expert knowledge within the QKSA. So we consider only what's called as quantum process tomography. And the idea is eventually Turing machines programs will converge to these kind of algorithms, which are specifically designed to make a model of the environment as a density matrix, and then predict, use that density metric to predict the future actions. Then instead of writing this quantum process tomography algorithms as finite state machines for Turing machines, we use we write them directly on a high level language like python and the length of the python code is used as a proxy for the length of the program the hypothesis size the second pragmatic consideration is what i already discussed in the last slide where there is a lot of choice on which distance measure to use on the density matrix and the third consideration is instead of using only algorithmic complexity as the model weight we also consider computational resources. This is not used in the same way that XCTL bounds the search using this, the, a time bound. Instead, it is much more towards complexity measures like logical depth, speed prior, or Levin complexity, where this computational resources are also part of the complexity measure. We define what's called as a least metric, which is inspired by a computational version of Lagrangian action. And we consider five different parameters, length, energy, approximation, space, and time. And together they are within a cost function that defines the weight of the hypothesis. Now there's no one single way of making this cost function. So we use an open-ended evolution by embedding this cost function as a mutating DNA within a genetic program. To add a cherry on the cake, we embed this entire QKSA framework within a quine, which is a self-replicating program, and that allows a recursive model of self-improvement for the QKSA. Going into how the equations look like, so this is how the AXE equation uh, canonical form is. And in the KLKSA, the reward is replaced with this utility function. And this is how the equation for QKSA looks like. 
And these are the major changes. So the first change is you take the utility function and use a distance measure over a density matrices, which themselves are calculated using a specific quantum process tomography algorithm, the history of the observations and the current action and the predicted uh, perceptions from the environment. The second change is instead of all possible Turing machine programs, we use only quantum process tomography algorithms. The third change is instead of predicting individual experimental outputs from quantum, which is not possible because it's stochastic, what we try to predict is what is the probability of getting one specific uh, perception from the environment, which is signified by this lambda over here. And the third change is instead of the length of the program, we have this much more complex cost function, which evolves using this genetic program. So what you see on the left is going back to our initial discussion that it kind of evolves a population of QKSA agents, each with their own versions of laws of the quantum environment. And these are like Newtonian physics and relativity, each are useful in different circumstances. So if you want to predict very fast an out output, you can as well as you can as well use Newton's laws. But if you want to be really precise, if you want to tune your clock to the GPS, you can use Einstein's relativity. I'll close with some of the ongoing work that's going uh, that we are doing right now. We are trying to implement this. Um, and this is the block diagram for the entire QKSA agent that we have developed using Python and the Qiskit uh, programming language. The QKSA policy itself is again very complicated and this is how the block diagram for that looks like. You can find more about our ongoing work in this links. With that, I would like to close. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Uh, so our next talk is from Samuel Alexander, and his paper is Extended Subdomains, a Solution to the Problem of Hernandez, Arello, and Dow. Take it away, Samuel. Thank you, Lisa. Zoom will not allow me to share a screen while somebody else is sharing. Am I audible? Yes, we can hear you. And uh, we can now see your, it's working. We can see your slides. My name is Samuel Alexander, and this paper is called Extended Subdomains, a Solution to a Problem of Hernandez, Arroyo, and Doe. Here's the statement of the problem. If we try to measure an AI's intelligence in some subdomain of AGI, using simple benchmark test cases, we will fail to capture social aspects of intelligence for the following reason. To test social intelligence, a test case apparently needs to have genuine intelligence built in because there need to be other people to be social with, but no such test case can be simple. To make this concrete, consider the example of Atari games. Suppose you're trying to measure the intelligence of an AI by seeing how well it performs in Atari games. NPCs in Atari games are simplistic automatons. Interaction with simplistic automatons is not social interaction. To test social intelligence, an Atari game's NPCs would need to be given genuine intelligence. But the complexity of such an NPC would dwarf the complexity of the original Atari game. Here's my proposed solution. To measure an AI's social intelligence in some given subdomain of AGI, extend the subdomain to a new subdomain where test cases are allowed to simulate via an oracle the very AI that is being tested. This allows simple test cases to incorporate social aspects 
by outsourcing intelligence decision-making to the very AI being tested. To make this concrete, again, consider, consider Atari games. An extended Atari game is a game for an extended Atari, by which I mean an Atari equipped with a special oracle that allows it to query what the player would do in hypothetical situations. An example of an extended Atari game might be Super Breakout versus your own clone. Surprisingly, this is actually quite practical because given an AI's source code, you could use that source code to realize the needed oracle. So you could actually pit the AI against Super Breakout versus your own clone or any other extended Atari game. This is in contrast with human beings. Human beings, unlike AIs, cannot realistically play extended Atari games because we cannot realistically simulate a human being, so the oracle would be impossible to realize. I'll gloss over the formal details in the paper. Please see the paper for all of the full details. In the paper, we formally define one, a notion of AGI subdomains. Two, a notion of an AGI subdomain being what we call code independent. Three, the so-called extension of any given AGI subdomain. The main theorem in the paper says, if D is a code independent subdomain of AGI and F is a computable function, which takes an AI source code A as input and outputs a test case F of A, then in the extension D prime of D, in the extended subdomain, there is a single test case, F star, approximately just as complex as F, or rather I should say approximately just as simple as F, such that for any AI A in the original subdomain, A has performance in the extended subdomain in F star equal to A's performance in the slice of F where we plug A itself into F. In other words, if you have not a single test case, but a whole family of test cases indexed by the very complicated hyperparameter A, which is an AI source code. So for every AI source code, you have a corresponding test case in your test case family. Then in the extended subdomain, the whole infinite family of test cases can be collapsed into one single test case, as a, which is approximately as simple as the procedure for generating the test case from the given parameter. Objection. You might say, interaction with one's own clone isn't social. But I would argue that an AI's personality doesn't depend only on its source code, but also on how it has trained. This is an example of nature versus nurture. Thus, if you play chess against a clone of yourself who has been systematically trained at chess for 50 years, then since you yourself have not presumably been trained at chess systematically for 50 years, that clone's chess personality will be so different from your chess personality, you'll probably never recognize that it's your clone. Here's an example with some actual code on the screen. On the screen, we see Python code for an environment in extended reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning is, a, is an example of an AGI subdomain. In extended reinforcement learning, the environment has an oracle that it allows it to create clones of the agent or to simulate the agent. 
Now, in this environment that's coded on the screen here, the environment creates a clone of the player to act as the player's enemy in a paper, rock, scissors tournament. But unlike the player, the enemy clone trains twice as much. Every round of the paper, rock, scissors tournament, whereas the player naturally trains one time for that round, the enemy clone is trained twice. And this presumably, depending on the particular details of how the agent is implemented, presumably this would cause the enemy clone to diverge from the player in its paper, rock, scissors personality, so that despite being the player's clone, the enemy would have a different personality than the player. That paper, rock, scissors example can be generalized and with a little creativity, you could create relatively simple environments where the agent interacts with whole communities or even civilizations of its own clones. Each clone trains differently so as to exhibit different personality. You might imagine that one clone goes to Harvard University and another clone drops out of high school. And those two clones would thus have very different personality despite having exactly the same source code. The complex part of this civilizational interaction is determining how each actor, besides the player, acts. That complex part is where presumably you would need gigantic neural nets, which would be very, very, very complicated and would make the civilization test case extremely complicated. That complex part is totally delegated away. And the whole environment collapses to the bare skeleton, which is quite simple. In summary, there's a problem when it comes to measuring the social intelligence of AIs. Simple test cases in an AGI subdomain can't capture social intelligence within that subdomain for the simple reason that including general, genuine social aspects, such as other people who are intelligent within the test case would necessarily make the test case complicated, not simple. My proposed solution is we can test the AI in an extended subdomain where test cases can simulate the very AI being tested. Clone play, which can be realized using this proposed solution can, I argue, be social. And that is because personality depends not just on nature, but also on nurture. Thank you very much for your time. All right. Thank you very much, Samuel, for your talk. Our next speaker is Alexei V. Samsonovich, and he will be talking about his paper that he submitted with Shen Lu on the possibility of regulation of human emotions via multimodal social interaction with an embodied agent controlled by EBICA-based emotional interaction model. Sounds so cool. <laughs> All right, take it away, Alexi. Unmute. There All you right. Are. Can you can you see me now? Yes. We, Do you hear we, me? We, Great. Thank you. you so, uh, in my talk, uh, do you see my uh, my slides? We can see you and your slides now. Thank you Great. very much. Great, thank you. So actually, I'm addressing the same question as uh, the previous talk, maybe from a different perspective. And because our paper is uh, quite long, I have only 10 minutes. I'm not going to describe it all. You're welcome to read the paper. But I would rather focus on one uh, particular question within this scope. So to begin with, 
here are the, here are examples of uh, VR projects that we are currently developing. As you see, we are working on uh, virtual social characters that can engage in conversation, can serve as a receptionist, as a poster presenter, as a pet, uh, as a uh, conference moderator, and so on. And so the question is, uh, what would it take to make them socially acceptable? Uh, that means looking conscious, human-friendly, human-like, believable, trustworthy, empathetic, in general, emotionally intelligent. Well, uh, there are two tasks here. First, uh, the agent must be able to read uh, the partner's mind, read human emotions, understand the type of the personality he is dealing with, and the agent must be able to control its own behavior and through it uh, users' emotions. And uh, this can be done based on the model. But to do this, we first need to solve the problem how to detect a user personality type based on interaction, multimodal interaction with the user. And uh, today, uh, this problem is solved using psychological questionnaires, like the big five test, for example, uh, which we cannot use in any condition, of course. Uh, any ordinary situation. So how would we go about it? Can we do this tacitly uh, using an ordinary conversation? And uh, I would like to offer you a preliminary result that suggests a positive answer to this question. Uh, so to begin with, here are examples of psychological tests that can be used to determine the type of personality of which the first one is the big five in a slightly not common version because we had to use it in Russian language. And the five parameters uh, that are determined by this test are listed here in the bottom right. Uh, now, uh, here is an example of the test itself, how it looks in the beginning of it. There are in total 75 questions. Of course, you cannot ask these questions any person in any situation. But what we imagine instead is some kind of a friendly conversation during check-in procedure in a hotel when a receptionist asks the customer a set of questions and the customer gives a certain variants of the answers. We have implemented uh, this paradigm in several versions, including a desktop version, which you see a screenshot on the left. Uh, so, so this is the entire set of questions and answers on the screen here. And uh, we also did it in VR, which I um, have no uh, time to question? play the entire video, but I just want to show you what happens in VR so that you would be aware of it. And uh, uh, finally, yeah, in this case in VR, the agent is controlled uh, by the e-bike cognitive architecture, which is based on some kind of emotional reasoning to make it short. Uh, but to, to make sure we understand correctly the, the psychological type of the customer based on his behavior, we, uh, we need to compare our result with uh, the result of psychological tests. and. The first question is, would it be possible at all? Do we have enough information? So to answer this question, uh, I ran a survey monkey experiment in which uh, participants answered those questions of the registrar. And uh, the results were analyzed, combining uh, results of the registrar with the results of the psychological tests using statistical processing, jackknife procedure, so uh, to make a long story short, here are uh, the outcomes. You see for two particular parameters of the big five test, the original score on the horizontal axis and the prediction based on uh, information extracted from the registrar conversation on the vertical axis. And uh, I was really surprised when I saw this. I, I thought it must be a mistake, but I still believe that there is no mistake. So it seems that not only it is possible uh, to uh, to extract certain information and uh, 
find a significant correlation between the two, but it's, it is also possible to, to make quantitative predictions, like where on the scale the particular subject is on this big five test based on some innocent conversation, uh, just a check-in procedure in the hotel, which uh, makes not aware of the subject that, that he is uh, uh, subject to psychological testing. So uh, this is possible because we have fixed question, fixed answers, and those answers were uh, graded uh, by uh, humans, again, uh, on certain scales, and we use that information, uh, do, did statistical analysis. Now, the question is, uh, can we actually do this dynamically in any open conversation without uh, pre-existing script? Uh, and so this must be possible based on the model. So we we, we hope that uh, our model would allow to to train a neural network to to do this kind of prediction uh, during any conversation. So the first preliminary result shows that uh, for now the answer is yes. We have uh, sufficient information in just an innocent conversation to to judge the personality type of a human, and it is possible to do so based on a cognitive model. And obviously it must be possible uh, to do using a neural network, which would be the next step. And in the next step, he will use a free conversation with an open uh, scenario of uh, behavior of, of the two agents. And plus we, we are going to use the multiple modalities, adding, uh, facial expressions, gaze, voice tonality, gestures, and so on. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, and that, that's all I can say for now. Thank you very much, Alexi. Really appreciate it. Super cool. All right, great. Um, our last speaker is Peter Boltek. And his paper is Moral Space for Paraconsistent AGI. Take it away, Peter. Well, can you see me and my slides? There we go. Now we can see them. Okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, so, Ben has done a good job presenting parts of my topic today because it is based on Ben's work from the last year, in particular presentation to this forum and presentation to the forum I've organized in September with BICA. So that was kind of trying to read uh, in, Ben's, in Ben's mind. And here is here are the main two points that Ben has made last year. Uh, he argued for moral paraconsistency, but viewed primarily in two contexts. The second one was human cognitive limitations, uh, that we would need massively stronger cognitive function to handle our life consistently and therefore our ethics. Today, I didn't hear, hear, see Ben relating to this argument, but he's still using the other argument on moral paraconsistency viewed primarily as resulting from deeply rooted ten uh, tensions between individuation and uh, self-transcendence. Yes, it is a very important tension. However, my question is, is it the only tension in paraconsistent ethics? And can paraconsistent ethics be generalizable? Yes. Uh, in terms of philosophy and in terms of computer science. Ben's work on paraconsistent zone, interzones uh, is, is particularly interesting here. Uh, he's talking about helpful uh, interzones in complex multifarious cognitive systems, uh, since in logic as in life, in general, total consistency is not always what you want. Yes, indeed. This is exactly the direction in which ethical theory has been developing at least since W.D. Ross. And we have two kinds of ethics, 
homogeneous ethical theory presumes that modal obligations are universal, impartial, the distributed, uh, which results in its blindness towards the contextual or positional characteristics of given situations. Immanuel Kant is the best example. John Stuart Mill is a good example as well. Non-homogeneous ethics is sensitive to at least five points. Positional characteristics, such as relationships of kinship. Pargeter is talking of patriotism, of a nation, uh, Gilligan, uh, on friendship, and, you know, uh, the cho choices that you make sometimes, sometimes group choices, uh, race issues, gender issues, including agent relativity, which has been formally uh, analyzed by Nobel laureate Amartya Sen, but also Scheffler and others, also situational specificities. Second, multifarious prima facie incompatible sources of value. W. D. Ross, but in psychology, Height and Green, who specify you know, uh, about five different kinds of moral minds, kinds of moral sensitivities. If I have the time, I'm going to come back to it. Free discontinuity of moral duties. This is something that crossed my mind just here in New Zealand a couple of weeks ago. Susan Wolf, in his well known uh, essay on moral saints, doesn't say that being a moral saint is a bad thing or a particularly good thing, but she's more like, would you like to be dating a moral saint? And somebody from you know, a Sunday school might say, oh, of course, but then she follows up, well, really? And that kind of breaks the line of ethics. Ethics is not everything except what Mill and Kant would say, not the whole motivations and definitely Paraconsistency is there of some kind. So now we are going to paraconsistency developed by Weber, as Ben uh, acknowledges uh, many times in his writings, but also stochastic elements deeply embedded in creative moral thinking, which is another point made by Gertzel. Uh, he demonstrates how paraconsistent logic can be mapped onto stochastic logic also in ethics, those five ways in which moral space can be paraconsistent help us grasp five of definitional features of moral space, while Gertz's reduction may perhaps be generalized to some or all of the remaining three souls. So this is my ethics challenges uh, at some uh, you know challenge at some point. Uh, Dr. Samsonovich made a very famous bica challenge. This is, this is the one in my field of ethics. Is it possible to cast uh, all those five paraconsistencies into the framework of paraconsistency? I think I see the answer, but, but uh, well, that's an open question at this point, okay? So paraconsistent interzones allow uh, co-functionality of paradigmatically different units not just units in terms of cognitive units, but also in terms of ethics. Why is it important? Ben also explains very well, if we have uh, very advanced human companions, we don't want them to be overly consistent because then they will be scary, spooky and non-humanoid and things like Morris Uncanny Valley abound. Thus, we need paraconsistent structures in advised NI. Okay. Sorts of paradigmatic cases came even before W. D. Ross, for instance, in Hegel and his followers. Uh, ethical gap in the works, especially early works of Susan Wolf, shows also limitation in extension of morality. Height and green, most people know this for uh, focus on care and fairness, which are the background of most morally engaged or morally aware people, but then some with more conservative approaches or intuitions, uh, followers or loyalty, authority, sanctity, or some, some with more liberal 
liberty as a separate value. And importantly, those different values and sets of moral reactions are encoded in very different brains, brain parts and also evolutionarily different. So there is no reason to expect them to negotiate and that's how internal moral conflicts happen. So this is my direct uh, response to Ben. I love the context of uh, conflicts between self-preservation and self-improvement, but here are some other potential conflicts, although at a different domain, less self-realization, more just traditional ethical approach. Now, my favorite quote from Ben Gerzel uh, about constructible duality uh, logic and explaining what he means, but he has done it already on his slide as well. So I can skip this one. And the second, although the relationship between uh, quantum ethics, quantum uh, physics and uh, this formulation of uh, paraconsistency in point number two is interesting. Uh, also, paraconsistency for Ben is a is based, is creates a theory of concept boundaries, pulls together paraconsistent probabilistic and fuzzy logic. Yes, indeed. I always had those intuitions, you know, years and years ago, and I'm happy Ben and his team is able to show it more and more clearly as of last year. An appropriately flexible vision of the scope of logic uh, systems must be adopted and mappings between declarative knowledge and other sorts of knowledge must be attended. So now not to repeat myself, I'm putting this in terms of conclusions. I think it is very important for generalized descriptions of the fruitful areas in terms of creativity at the age of chaos. This is based on his 2006 and older works. And this is also consistent with uh, optimal perturbance level in creativity, engine, creativity engines by Steve Thaler. Uh, it also allows to generalize the non-standard kinds of ethics as broadly paraconsistent ethics. Okay, and this is my main claim for this talk. I think I'm running out of time. Thank you very much. Hello, anybody in the room? Thank you. Thank you. Um, can the video in the venue be turned on? Yes, and a microphone can be unmuted. So here we are back in the room. Thanks for those last three excellent papers. That last one was a nice segue back into a wrap up and open discussion for the day. We've got about 15 minutes left. Ben, I think maybe wants to come and make some closing remarks and possibly open out to any key yeah, that's questions. Questions and, uh, and discussion, but yeah, this has been a whole bunch of interesting stuff, uh, somewhat defying summary, I would say. In, in my my initial remarks this morning, I highlighted the progress that we seem to be making toward AGI in terms of having more and more of our stuff working, at least at the level of interesting research systems that can that can be played with as opposed to pure theory. And I also highlighted the diversity of perspectives being pursued in this community. And I, I think we, we've seen that in, in, in the presentation today with stuff in the re reinforcement learning, ev evolutionary learning, uh, re reasoning, moral philosophy, and uh, other more stuff than I can rem remember or, 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 re or recount. And I, I think it is, it is from the confluence of all these different threads of thinking that I think uh, AGI is gonna finally pop out of our work not, not, not too long from now. But yeah, let, let's uh, proceed to have some questions, uh,
comments, pro provocations, tap dances, whatever, uh, whatever folks in the live or distributed audience would like to throw out to us. Back to you, Mike. Well, just following on your comment about predicting uh, markets and crypto, uh, there are strategies that can be used uh, for volatility um, that they use uh, uh, for, um, you know, like strangles and straddles and so forth that in the crypto market probably would make a lot of money. So it's just a comment. Thank you very much. And we'll have more talk tomorrow about uh, crypto price prediction, yeah, I believe, yeah. from Chris. The relation between financial markets and AGI is interesting. I, I didn't take part in that workshop yesterday because I was doing, doing the OpenCog workshop. But I, I, I think that in general, traditional machine learning approaches run into trouble when the complexity of the problem exceeds the volume of the training data in, in some sense. And then in some financial markets, cryptocurrency markets being an example, you see that just because cryptocurrencies haven't been around that long. And also the qualitative nature of that market has changed year on year. So you're, you're constantly having what you'd call a regime change in, in financial prediction lingo, which means that you, you can't really just take a standard time series analysis and, and prediction approach when the fundamentals and the regime are changing all the time. It basically means you have to be doing transfer learning to be doing crypto price prediction well. I mean, that, it's not only cryptocurrency has, has that aspect. It's similar to, to prediction of, I mean, currencies or commodities in emerging markets, let, let, let's, let's say. And medical domain has a similar property. Like if you're if you're looking at DNA or RNA of cancer patients or something, I mean, you got, you've got hundreds of thousands of genetic variations among like hundreds of patients. And this, it's not like face recognition where you have, you know, eight, 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 eight billion faces. So for something like face recognition, the volume of data is large compared to the complexity of the problem. So that's not a sweet spot for AGI for prediction of relatively illiquid assets prices or for say medical data analytics that complexity is very high compared to the volume of data and means agi should be able to play a role in in principle although it's waving your hands and saying agi doesn't make it easy <laughs> hello yeah we've got a couple of questions from our esteemed guests on the screen are Aritra, I believe you have a question. No. You don't have a question. Do you have a question, Samuel? I turned my video on because I thought there was a panel discussion, but since you've asked me, I would like to mention to Peter, the previous speaker, I think if I had the opportunity to date a saint, I would like to date Mary Magdalene, the prostitute out of whom Jesus cast seven demons. I think that she would be a lot of fun to date. And well, I think we, that Carl we've Young... Got a ro we've got because... a robot version coming on the market shortly, so you're, you're in law. Very good. Well, let me address this. I have a paper <laughs> at OUP on church touring lovers, and that's really perfect robotic lovers, how far they can go, and also to avoid the uncanny valley of perfection, the second uncanny valley on the other side, yes? Uh, with Ed and Jen Smith running too far and somebody being too good in being human, yes? So yes, I agree. This is a very cute example. And thank you very much. Yeah, that's uh, completely consistent with my take. I don't know about Susan Wolf. I, she will be here in New Zealand probably exactly the day when I come, when I leave. So thank you very much. Good point. Super. Thanks, guys. So if we've no more questions online, let's come back to the room. Anyone else have any observations, comments, questions? 
pulling pulling together some of these uh, fantastic strands of research and technology and development we've seen today. Or are you just all exhausted? It's been a long day. Here we go. You can do any questions. Any questions. Okay. Uh, my question is kind of for you, Ben. Just in terms, this morning you talked about seeing AGI by 2029 or sooner. Um, and I know in the past year we've seen a ton of actual theoretical work be put into practice this year on the Hybron open cog architecture. So I'm just, yes, in, in general, sorry, a bunch of other stuff. So I'm just kind of wondering what's the strategy for pulling all of the work that's being done from these different threads together to make this timeline or how are you kind of coming up with this confidence? Well, I, I, think, I think it's good that the AGI community is diverse and decentralized and i don't i don't want there to be like a single agi manhattan project that's trying to agglomerate everything together in in, in a sort of monopolistic way but i do think we should ideally see many different projects each by their own fashion aggregating ideas that that, that get come from 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 all, all over the place and so i think that just as there's many different component algorithms and architecture variants, there are many different ways to hybridize and, and glom pieces together also. And we need experimentation with that. So within, within my own research work in OpenCog Hyperon, I can see how I would I would do that. So I mean, I mean, I can we, we've developed meta, this new language that we talked about yesterday, and that I think I think Jonathan pre presented about today, and we we can part of the goal with that language is to have a better way to implement all different sorts of AGI algorithms, not just ones we made up, and also to interface with ex external systems, like say a transformer neur neur neural net learning system or a simulation engine or something. So within our own project, we're very open to taking other algorithms from the literature, from other people's open source code and either re-implementing something in our own meta language to work on our own knowledge representation or when appropriate building a bridge to interface with with, with someone else's system and i my hope is that others will do comparable things within within other projects so we're exploring the space of how to aggregate things al along with exploring the space of things to be to be aggregated and i think I think that's a more robust approach than having a single sort of Man Man Manhattan project. I mean, it's still, in some ways, that sort of evolutionary approach is more wasteful, but it it gives you better exploration of the space of possibilities. And once once you get there, I think it gives you a more robust community to take take the next steps. But I think, uh, in order to make this happen, I mean. It's great if we have not just published papers, but open source code people can download and, and, and run, whether they're going to incorporate that code or port it to their own favorite language or, or whatever. And it's great if people who make running systems pay attention to inter interoperability and, and, and usability of those systems. So it's not so painful to plug your system into someone else's. So in one thing we're working on in SingularityNet, separate from OpenCog Hyperon, is what we call the AI DSL, the AI domain specific language, which is basically a dependently typed framework for software programs to formally describe what they can do, what kind of inputs they take, what outputs they can take, what resources they take, what properties they have. And I think if something like that becomes adopted, like a formal description of software components and what they can do, then, and if people actually use it to describe their AI components that then it becomes easier to assemble pieces in, 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 into hybrid systems. I mean, as the saying goes, so the, the nice thing about standards is there's so many of them, right? And we, I, I, I mean, it's, it's an aspiration to have the, the, this sort of description language adopted. Thank you so much. I was going to say we're just going to wrap up now because we've got a hectic evening ahead of us with band rehearsals um, for tomorrow's session, but we've time for one more uh, question slash comment. Thank you.
thanks. Uh, ben, I recently, uh, DeepMind, uh, published a paper about a system uh, called a generalist agent, where they had the system that uh, did about 400 tasks and about 200 were at a, apparently a human level. G Gato, you mean? It's, it's uh, I think it might be on based on Gato, yeah. Uh, but either way, I was just wondering if you had, uh, what your thoughts were about I read, that system. I read the paper corresponding to Gato. I'm not sure I've read the paper corresponding to a more recent ver variant, but I, I mean, Gato what was, I mean, this is a system that basically solves task identification, right? I mean, it, it was trained to do a whole bunch of different tasks. And then when you present it with some, some problem, it identifies which task it matches and, and, and can do that one. But Gato was not transferring knowledge about how to do a diverse variety of tasks in order to learn and figure out how to do a totally different type of type of task. So which is, which would, would be substantial progress toward general intelligence. So I think having a system that is pre-wired to do 600 things and can automatically identify which of those 600 things to do is a weird trick with a very loose relationship to a generally intelligent learning system. But what you can't, quite rule out it could be a step toward a generally intelligent learning system. I don't personally see how it is. I mean, what, what's your view on it? Well, I, I, I would agree. Although I think that the, uh, I mean, this, the span of the capability, the tasks from robotics to, uh, image perception, object disambiguation to the natural language understanding all of those. It's a pretty, it's, it's quite extensive and to do that at a quote unquote human level, even though, I mean, the problem is of course, is just the, the benchmarks themselves, right? It's easy to, to have pretty powerful foundational large neural notes that can overfit or fit to a to task, but not really be work so well in the wild as you say or to different towns yeah well well i'm supposed to get out of here go to the sponsor dinner i want to throw out one question to to the audience even so so i'm curious if anyone has any novel or novel-ish thought on sort of what what kind of preliminary achievement that isn't yet human level agi would really convince you that someone was like like quasi inevitably on the path to human level AGI. Like I've just said that the Gato system appeared to me not not to be that. I mean, I, I think that a, a chatbot that passes the Turing test wouldn't even be that to me because it seems like you could, there's so many conversations online, you could probably fake fooling the average person that, that, that you're a human just by being a big weighted hash table. So I, I, I wonder, I wonder what will convince you guys who seem fairly sophisticated that someone was halfway there, I mean, short of actually being there. I think if I can't destroy it. <laughs> I can't destroy a quark. Uh, a what? A quark. A quark. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, I'm telling the microphone, I cannot destroy a quark by any physics that I know. Can't destroy a black hole either. So. Another one over here. Well, no, I mean, in, in, in all seriousness, like I probably can't destroy a lion or a tiger either, but that doesn't make them that generally intelligent, I mean, unless I have a, a big weapon. Right? So, yeah, I don't know if pure survival is the same. Um, a system that can explain something to me. So I can ask it about the ghetto paper and it can explain it to me in ways that I understand it or to other people as well. So it needs to understand a little bit about me and it will need, also needs to understand the question of the, of the problem space that I'm asking it about. And, and it's adapting the explanation to, to its knowledge of, 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 so there's some theory of mind modeling in, in, in some, to some level there. So I, I think the next step is uh, 
play, imitation, and symbolism. So you can watch maybe a robot play at something, and then the robot can actually imitate you, imitate your movements, and keep a continually acquire new, new um, repertoires of movements and so on. And then the robot will be able to um, think symbolically. So this is like TikTok as a training ground for uh, for AGI. Um, if if uh, if it can. The, the so robot the robot watches someone dance and, and replicates it. Right? Well, no, no, not exactly. So no, no. So the symbolism I'm talking about is where it can use uh, an object to represent something else that doesn't exist. So it can say that this thing is a, a car or a train and play with it as a car or a train. When it's not a car or a train, it's maybe a bottle. So when it can start using symbolisms, then I think. That, 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 that's uh, if we could have a conversation with Douglas Hofstetter. Well, I mean, a, a chat by Eliza could do that. So that that's uh, Alex Kelly. Continue learning, transfer learning, learning that isn't in a regimented data environment, adopting goals on its own, communicating those goals to a community that understands as 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 a community. Yeah, I think that all all. All, all good thoughts and the the relation among those two sentences is, is, is an interesting one which would be good be good to more fully understand um, for me like you were saying even if the chatbots were able to communicate a lot better that wouldn't be AGI but well, that, 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 that's not quite what I said oh, okay. I mean, communicate a lot better has many dimensions but passing the Turing test in terms of fooling the average person that it's a human right. is one particular species of communicating better. And I'm guessing a transformer neural net will do that fairly soon, just being trained on a bunch of di dialogue corpora, even though it has no understanding what the fuck it's talking about. And so <laughs> right, right, right. I think like currently chatbots, um, they're very imprecise. Like even the most advanced ones, they lose like the turn of conversation after like four or five turns in it. I mean, I think the first thing would be like, if you can bump that number up to like 10 or 11 or 15 turns, you know, uh, being able to keep the context of a conversation. Then that still doesn't give you a system that could graduate from MIT though, right? Oh yeah. Or even high school. But I think the second thing would it be- gives that you, It gives you an effective conversationalist, which is a narrow thing. I guess. <laughs> I think the second thing would be if it's somehow able to engage your emotions, like, you know, people are able to subtly um, adjust to someone's emotions. So if there was like a chat bot or a bot that could sense you were sad and the different dimensions of sadness, like if it was depression or anxiety, and then somehow like, you know, learn to mitigate it almost as a personal companion. I mean, even if not perfect, I think that would be a good indication of AGI. I mean, by that standard, I don't think I'm an AGI. So, I mean, I'm pretty bad at that. So, so, but yeah, it, it, interesting. Certainly the emotional intelligence dimension is important, though challenging to, to measure too, but very interesting. Um, we've, got we've got two questions on the coming from our Zoom participants. No, the chaps whose names I can't say. Do we have a name? I'm, chaps, do you not have chaps? My, they're they're my, green what? chaps. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Or to Burning Man, I'm told. Uh, Samuel, did you have a question? If we put an AI robot into a standard obstacle course, then the robot will eventually be able to figure out the obstacle course using techniques from reinforcement learning or something. But imagine that we put the robot into an oracular obstacle course. And in this obstacle course, the obstacle course reacts to what the robot would hypothetically do in counterfactual scenarios, which aren't actually true. Like, for example, the robot walks into a room and there's no buttons anywhere in sight, but 
the obstacle course figures out by simulating the AI, would the AI push the button if there was a button here? And depending on the answer to that hypothetical question, make spikes appear or something like think that. Think of like adversarial two-player parkour as a sport, right? Like, <laughs> to an AI very that doesn't- Very popular on YouTube. <laughs> if an AI doesn't self-reflect and think about its own hypothetical behavior, then these patterns that the AI observes in this obstacle course will seem totally random and unpredictable. But if the AI, if the AI does self-reflect and think about its own hypothetical behavior, then it would eventually be able to figure out these patterns. So a condition which certainly wouldn't be sufficient but might be necessary is that an AGI should be able to figure out such obstacle courses. I, I, I like about that that it's sort of physical interaction. Mike, please. And, and we have we have four or five more people want to answer. Yeah, yeah. So I, I like the fact that that's phys physical inter interaction based. A lot of these things are interesting because a lot of humans I know would, would, would fail at them, but that, that doesn't mean they're bad as modes of evaluation. In, Thank you. Alexander, you have a question. Yeah, well, kind of a comment question, but be kind of curious to know from the general community, but Ben in particular, since he's there on the stage. So I don't know if you caught our talk. I'm one of the guys presenting a cognitive architecture and uh, Alec, my uh, collaborator, Alex Kelly, brought up one comment. I was curious to know your thoughts on continual learning because uh, uh, we're talking about building general AGI systems, and I think that's an interesting goal. Um, but oftentimes, maybe as a neuroscientist, cognitive scientist, researcher myself, I question the fundamental building blocks that we use to build it. For example, artificial neural networks tend to catastrophically forget quite easy, um, uh, even on just simple classification tasks, let alone more complex recognition activities. And so if we want to build complex systems, as I have done in earlier work and in this work, when you stitch things together and you have one thing help the other, it tends to forget, especially if it's neural. So I was curious to know your thoughts in the direction and if, if for example, continual learning is not as prominent as it should be, because uh, I haven't heard too much of that as a discussion. Is it just assumed by the architecture that that will be it, it, it's assumed. Yeah, I, I think for for... Most of us working from the cognitive architecture direction, say in OpenCog or, or, or NARS or say ERA from Christ, Kristen Thorsten, I mean, lifelong learning and continual learning are assumed. And if, if you have a sort of declarative memory or episodic memory no, no, knowledge store built in a knowledge graph or something, I mean, you're, you're not storing knowledge in a way that, that will experience catastrophic forgetting or, or decay. So that, that problem, that problem doesn't exist in neural symbolic architectures or in, in say, era slash re replica, which, would, which is a self-reinforcing rule system or something. I would add, as a side comment, in the neural net world, that problem was solved 20 years ago in the realm of attractor neural net. So like if you look at palimpsest models or reverse, le reverse heavy in learning, these solve the problem of catastrophic perception in Hopfield net variant associative memory networks, but then it it reappeared again in these mainly feed forward back propagation train networks. So I would say this is a problem that's particular to certain classes of combinations of neural architectures and learning algorithms, which happen to be ones that are highly effective at doing doing machine learning tasks, which is which is is interesting. And there's a question of is there some fundamental nature to that trade-off? Like, is, is there some fundamental reason why the architecture slash learning algorithm combinations that work most easily and cheaply on classification tasks also are ones that are really bad at long-term memory? Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe there's some interesting d duality there or something. Yeah. Perhaps a revisitation then to the older attractor networks might, might be overdue. Yeah, I mean, that, that's recurrent neural nets. The thing is back, back prop won't train these. So that the heavy in learning is a much slower learning algorithm. So this comes down to the problem of replaced backprop with a less shitty learning algorithm, which a lot of people are starting to think about now. Right? And hence our talk, because backprop yeah, free. Yeah, right, so right, right. that's worth yeah. looking into, right? <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Alexander. A couple of rapid fire uh, from the audience. 
Yes, to quickly repeat your original question, what would indicate to you that we are close to AGI? For me, that is when the AI we made helps us do AI research more quickly. Uh, and if that feeds back into developing the next generation, I think. Doesn't Google help us do AI research more quickly already or archive say? Yes, absolutely. And I think that's a that's a good indicator. That those I, are AGIs? Or no, that those are th th those are closer. Those are getting us closer. Yes, I do think so. Um, though I, the factor by which it speeds it up may not be sufficiently sufficiently so compared to its predecessors. But I, I think if we have an AI, if we make an AI system now that helps us, let's say, do our AI research 50% faster, then I do believe that's a significant step towards That's a big speed up, yeah. 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 Thank you. Did we have one more in the room? Well, I was going to answer the same question uh, with a few answers and thoughts, but I thought I might just make a, a just an interesting observation that I think we all might find to be a fun thought experiment, and that is just the pe peculiarity of waking up at this interesting point in time when AI is about to be born is so, I mean, it's so far from what you would expect. If you assume any Gaussian distribution of consciousness, um, of course you so have this, this proves that you're the protagonist in the singularity it, it, video game. You are the Messiah. That, yeah. I mean, <laughs> So, I mean, there's an observer selection effect, right, yeah. that you have, you can't escape because you're the subjective observer. But, you know, if you assume any Gaussian distribution and then you look at how much time there is, you know, 13.8 billion years and you wake up in the last nanosecond or picosecond of this simulation, I mean, a second in that. Uh, okay, so and then you find yourself working on AGI. <laughs> It's just a really fun, trippy thought experiment uh, that uh, it's fun to amuse yourself with, especially this if you're working. This is how on. Eliezer Yudkowsky convinced himself he was the Messiah. <laughs> I mean, it's, a, it's a familiar thought experiment. <laughs> But the ARC data set, I think, would be a, a fun challenge along that line if it could be solved in a way that didn't include a lot of domain specific knowledge. Um, and I think that in general, it'd be nice to, to take like a list of 100 solutions to your question that you posed earlier and then uh, basically sample when people estimate yeah. that would be solved. And that'd be an interesting thing. Well, I would say, as a, as a researcher, I kind of have evolved the view of not caring too much whether my intermediate results are, are compelling to, to random other people anyway, because people's views are so diverse and each come from their own, own perspective and, and paradigm that if you worry about that, you'll just, you'll, 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 just, you'll just never know what to do. So, I mean, it's, it's interesting to understand different ways of thinking about it. On, on the other hand, probably the end goal will be achieved by someone who just followed the vision of how to get there and didn't didn't worry too much about what intermediate results will, will impress other 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 people anyways and i mean i've I, I still gravitate toward developmental psychology as a sort of roadmap and that if if i had a system that wasn't narrowly engineered to act like a one-year-old or two-year-old kid but did the type of learning about the world that a one or two-year-old ki kid was doing even though that stuff isn't that sophisticated i would feel like that there I've cracked the problem. We just sort of need to need to do do more more and more teaching, right? But then again, this is quite fuzzy because what does it really mean to do learning like like a, a, a one year old? And what does it what does it really mean to not cheat, right? So when you try to pin it down, it becomes un, unrewarding. I think. Thank you, Ben. All right, I'm going to uh, two more, and then we're absolutely cutting rapid fire. Alexa, please, if you have a rapid question for or, yeah. or answer for Ben. Hi, Ben. Hi, Ben. Hey, oh wow, it's been a while, man. Yeah. yeah. So uh, here is an idea. Uh, just consider a Turing test, not the standard Turing test, but multimodal modern Turing test, full fledged with all possible capabilities, and uh, makes the task to beat the human makes that uh, the AI would be more frequently called human than human itself. I understand what your criticism would be that most humans would not pass it. That's okay, but 50% would pass it. So why, why is it wrong? 
Can, can we pick? Can we pick like Mark Zuckerberg for the human or something? I mean, it could be easier or harder depending on who the human is. Well, but no, I, 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 I think that there's 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 a point there that okay, thank you. I mean, the 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 concept of the Turing test may have more legs than than the precise definition, right? And so, so, so historical. Yeah, what, what I mean is a super super human test, uh, su super uh, super Turing test when. Uh, the task is to build AI that is more human than human themselves. For the Turing test itself, I mean, to fool an average person without AI education in a conversation for 10 minutes is one thing. Yeah. To fool yeah. a bunch of cognitive scientists and AI researchers in a conversation for two hours is a whole other thing and pro probably probably is is agi hard right so that there, there there there's different ways of quantifying e each of these things we're, we're talking about but well, let's consider the top one the difficult one and still it may not be sufficient so what i say would be sufficient is to make it superhuman not clear why that would be sufficient uh, actually i mean you, you might you might be able to make something that people would judge as human more often than an actual human. And it still was just inducing based on pattern recognition and 8 billion humans responses to various things. Oh, it's, it's not, it's yeah. not obvious to me why that's sufficient. Actually. It's, well, it's, it's trivial. It's trivial to do it in a simple paradigm. I know, but in, in the general paradigm, more complex. Well, I'm not, I'm not claiming that it is sufficient. Actually, your question is very difficult, and I believe nobody in the world knows the answer to it. Yeah, yeah, well, this, I, this, I, this next chap, Mike. I know, that's why it's a good question. Here's one more, here's one more attempt. Okay. Questions with answers are not the fun kind. Okay, thanks. Uh, I have one more uh, of them. Uh, if, we, if we, for one moment, uh, look at how Pei Wang sees intelligence as the ability to adapt under insufficient knowledge and resources. And we ask ourselves, when does a system need to adapt? Namely, when the previous knowledge it had was not sufficient to deal with this new case. So it had to extend the knowledge. And then if, if we for, for one moment consider this, and let's say we would build a robot which, which uh, can play with humans. It would be good if the robot at some point would find the game boring and wants to move on to something more complex. Like if we could somehow simulate like the playing of children, which give themselves increasingly more complex tasks like stacking blocks initially, then trying more difficult things like building bridges out of blocks. And if we could build a system which gets bored with tasks it's already able to handle and i like the idea of a boredom test when the ai can realize how boring people are then it's become truly generally <laughs> intelligent <laughs> yeah and we've got one more uh, to definitely wrap up from mike at the back which i think uh, it resonates with us all so i think i would be happy if we were able to develop any of the robot doctors or the uh 3d uh, image doctors from star trek so from Star Trek Voyager or Star Trek uh, Deep Space Nine or any of these holographic doctors that could actually help you, diagnose you, and cure you of whatever you have. Thank you. All right, yeah, well, thanks for all, all, all the thoughts on this. As Alexei says, I mean, I'm well aware there's a question we don't have an answer to, and maybe a question you can't pin down a highly certain answer to, but it's it's a highly worthwhile thing to be thinking about as, as, as we all progress on, on our own coupled paths toward AGI. So th thanks everyone for uh, attending day number two of the AGI conference. Thank you all. We'll see you uh, t tomorrow morning for the uh, introductory presentation by uh, Sophia the Robot. Sophia the Robot is opening us at 9 a.m. upstairs. And a reminder, everyone is going to, those who would like to hang out with other conference attendees, um, Navy Strength Bar would probably be a good place to go and find some to hang out with. Sorry, we're not out tonight. We're rehearsing, but we'll be out with you all tomorrow night for hours and hours. Thanks to everybody online. Thanks to the Zoom team. Thanks to the comms team. Thanks to Ben. Thanks to the audience. Thanks. See you all tomorrow.